Welcome to the Concerned student hall of Oslo Mest University. My name is Maria Hasselgaard and I'm coming from the Norwegian National Broadcast. And I'm Christopher Ronneberg. I work for the Norwegian newspaper Aftenposten. We will be uh, covering a lot of different topics today, a lot of different countries from all over the world. Uh, and I think we're going to start as an introduction with this video. concerned because it's a strain they haven't seen before. Falling into a class called a coronavirus, the illness can present symptoms of a common cold. Tonight, five major American airports are ramping up screenings of passengers coming in from Wuhan, China. That essentially they are putting Wuhan, the city limits, under a lockdown. We will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States. The people of this country will rise and we will come through it stronger than ever. They pretty much shut it down. They're fighting a war here and they're losing. A lot of people think that goes away in April. Overwhelming every hospital in northern Italy. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle. More than 3,000 have now died. 110,000. 200,000. 400,000 Americans. Half a million Americans. 700,000 COVID-19 deaths. I fucking don't need a Clashes broke out with police and multiple arrests were made. You literally cannot mandate somebody to wear a mask and every single one of you that are obeying the devil's laws are going to be arrested. 172 countries have signed up to a program to ensure doses are equitably distributed around the world. 90-year-old Margaret Keenan became the first person in the UK to receive the Pfizer jab today. It was fine. It was fine. It's the best thing that's ever happened. But there are real fears that lower-income nations will be left behind. We're seeing this gaping inequality in access to vaccines. Solidarity is missing in action just when we need it. Most. Rich countries hoard life-saving vaccines. On the one hand, we see the vaccines developed in record time. On the other hand, we see their triumph undone by the tragedy of lack of political will, selfishness and mistrust. A surplus in some countries, empty shelves in others. In this international masterclass, 13 prominent and highly qualified journalists from around the world will teach us the best tools within health journalism. How did they cover the pandemic we all suffer from, but also learn from? And it's strange, I mean, we're, we're doing this from Oslo, a place where the pandemic is more or less in the past, but we know, of course, that that is not the way it is around the world. We're going to uh, hear from uh, a lot of different, very, very qualified very good journalist. We'll go to Wuhan, where it all began. We're going to Brazil. We're going to the Middle East. We're going to Africa. Uh, we're, we're going to hear how this pandemic has been covered by, by investigative journalists all around the globe. Uh, and that's, uh, I've seen some of them, and it's going to be very, very uh, thrilling and uh, I think useful for, for, for all of us. But last week was a very special week to all investigative journalists as two of our colleagues were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Maria Ressa and uh, Dmitry uh, Muratov, uh, very qualified, uh, experienced journalists. Uh, and we'll see here uh, a little reminder. It's, it's only a week ago, but I think it will benefit from a little reminder about what happened in Oslo last Friday. Here's a video. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 2021 to Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. Shocked and uh, and I I didn't know how to react. Не опасно после этого приза. Я не знаю. 
Я не могу вам ответить на этот вопрос. Вы еще, вы сегодня через месяц. Nobel Peace Prize 2021 award will remind the authorities in the Philippines, Russia, around the world of the need to respect journalists and journalism. In a statement from the Nobel Committee, they also say, at the same time, they are representatives of all journalists who stand up for this ideal in a world in which democracy and freedom of the press face increasingly adverse conditions. And later, free, independent, and fact-based journalism serves to protect against the abuse of power, lies, and war propaganda. And what's interesting, Maria, is that uh, these topics that, uh, that were dealt with uh, when, uh, when the Nobel Peace Prize was announced, uh, especially dealing with, uh, uh, with governments, with disinformation, with false news, uh, th that's some of the topics that we will be dealing with today in this pandemic masterclass. Uh, how have journalists covering this pandemic be been uh, met by authorities trying to hide the real truth or uh, covering uh, uh, conspiracy theories uh, and uh, other obstacles to, uh, to bringing information out about what this pandemic is all about. And the first of uh, the presentations we'll, we'll hear today is from Serena Trinari. She is a Swiss journalist, used to work for the Swiss uh, national broadcaster for many years. Uh, for the last couple of years, she's been a freelancer working for ReCheck. Uh, it's a non-profit organization dealing with health issues. And she's been covering these things for 20 years. And interestingly, just before the pandemic struck, she, uh, she participated in branding, writing a handbook for how to cover the health industry and health-related issues. And that knowledge and that, uh, that information and, and experience came in as a very useful tool when covering the pandemic. And as we'll see, uh, this is something that a lot of journalists all around the world can learn from. So, uh, Serena, please uh, give us your presentation. Thanks, thanks a lot. It's great to be with you today. So, uh, this is ReCheck. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is the non-profit organization I co-founded together with Catherine Riva, which is also an investigative journalist. So, we work with the methods, tools, and the ethics that they are at the intersection between investigative journalism and evidence-based medicine, also called EBM. And they share many things, most importantly, a uh, hypothesis-driven approach, which I think sounds really familiar for investigative journalists. So EBM, uh, just to give you really a very short crash course in that, means that any course of action needs to be based on the best available up-to-date scientific evidence. When there is uncertainty, this needs to be communicated to the patient. And in, in our case, investigative journalists working with EBM means also communicated to the public. And EBM is a lot about what we know and what we don't know, and about being systematical. And there, I think, this marriage between investigative journalists and EBM is really very fruitful, potentially. So, uh, my presentation today, uh, this is a bit of a sum up. Um, I want to say that between 2020 and 2021, now, we see a lot of journalism, science, and public health out of control. We see a lot of numbers without a denominator. Uh, so, there is a chronical lack of context because any number makes sense only if you have a reference, a denominator. That's how our brain is wired. Uh, to say that something is abnormal, uh, you really need to know first what is normal. And scientific studies are not all the same, and we will go a bit into this today. Experts' opinion is per se no evidence, technically speaking. And conflicts of interest, so-called COI, not only financial, are key in the field of health and medicine and public health. So first things first, I'll show you my own conflicts of interest. 
So these are my disclosures. Uh, I am a co-director with Katrin Riva of the nonprofit ReCheck. I don't have direct or indirect pharmaceutical and medical devices industry funding. I am implicated in projects with academics in the States and in Canada, and I am a paid contributor with the British Medical Journal and with the Global Investigative Journalism Network at times. I am on Twitter with the hashtag Serena Tinari, and my full bio is on LinkedIn. So this is the guide that was just mentioned before uh, that we have been writing on commission uh, as recheck uh, of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Uh, the funny thing is that we wrote this guide before uh, this international crisis uh, began. And that is quite weird because we are in the field since many years and then came out this great project and then just we published it just uh, when this was starting. So this is a handbook and it's in open access and has been published in many different languages and has been really conceived as a, as a tool to learn the basics, how you can investigate health and medicine, even though you don't have probably a PhD in any uh, medical related discipline. It's possible and is also written in a relatively plain language. So today I, I will speak a little bit about what is normal and what is not normal, um, especially focusing on how normally a drug or a vaccine comes to the market. So in this slide, you see actually what is normal. This is how normally uh, a new product uh, is developed and then comes through a so-called approval process with the so-called regulatory agencies. As you can see here, we won't go now in many details, of course, uh, it's a very long process. It takes time and it takes many steps. The first one, as you can see up there, is so-called preclinic. So it's in vitro, so it's a, on a petri dish, on cells, and there is animal testing. This is a very important stage, and it's about four years, normally. And then we go through these so-called phases, and each of them has a, a very important meaning. And as you can see, it takes quite forever to develop and also to get the green light from the regulators. This used to be our normal life um, until a couple of years ago. In these two years, a lot have changed. And this is, uh, for people like me, it's a difficult time, I have to say, because we have seen a lot of science and also regulation by press release. This is how the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, mRNA vaccine was actually presented to the public. As you can see, um, I can say I have some problem with this kind of coverage because, I mean, um, he's, of course, having a major interest in picturing this vaccine as good as possible. I mean, he's the CEO and is one of the initiator of this. And this has, has become really normal in these two years. I have been reporting for the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, about the so-called EMA leaks which were not really leaks, actually. I mean, there was a lot of data that was kind of stolen from the European Medicine um, Agency. And it's quite interesting because, I mean, this is uh, all information about the mRNA vaccine, especially the Pfizer product. And in this material that actually is genuine, we know that, and has been confirmed to us by the agency, the agency said, Mm, has been some choices uh, have been made in what kind of material was uh, leaked to journalists like me, but the material is genuine. And there, for instance, we, we see that uh, there is a lot that we still don't know about these uh, biologics, because vaccines are, technically speaking, biologics. And for instance, we know that uh, because of the emergency, uh, we skipped, actually, animal studies. So we used what we had from previous research yeah. because the mRNA technology has been developed 
in the last 30 years. So we did have some studies on animals, but we don't have specific on this uh, biologic. And there is more, more in this article, so if you are interested, in, it's in open access on the bmj.com. This is the problem we have. Uh, restoring trials, uh, invisible and abandoned trials, uh, is keeping track of all the trials documents we have for these COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we don't have a lot, to cut a very long story short. And this, of course, is a problem. This is an article that was recently, recently published on the BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine, and I think the title speaks volumes. Uh, Transparency of COVID-19 Vaccine Trials, Decisions Without Data, because there is too much, we don't know. Transparency is not exactly paramount in this field, but in this case, we have especially not enough, considering that we are giving these products to billions of people worldwide. I show you another example uh, of weird things that are happening nowadays. In August 2021, the US government, President Biden, announces boosters, so more vaccines after the second dose, will begin on September 20. This was headline worldwide, but there is a problem because here uh, President Biden has uh, literally overruled the regulatory authority because at this time, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, didn't have anything about boosters. And this is what shortly after happened. This should have been a big headline worldwide, but wasn't. So. Just a couple of days after Biden announced this, uh, Marion Grubber and Philip Croce uh, quit the FDA. Uh, so these two guys, you might not know them, they were extremely important people in the US regulator because they were the director and deputy director of the Office of Vaccines Research and Review so the guys that really know this field they quit uh, media barely covered the story and then shortly after they published uh, an article on the lancet the very known biomedical journal actually which actually explains why they did that they definitely didn't agree about a biden announcement because of the lack of scientific evidence and then we can talk shortly about pandemic science out of control. This is a really good article that I recommend you to be reading. It was written by two medical investigative journalists. And this is a bit what is quite shocking for people like me, because I mean, science used to have really rules and traditions. I mean, now suddenly everything is upside down. It's quite confusing for people like me. I'll give you some examples. Unprecedented so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions like the lockdown, face masks in the general population, COVID certificates that in many nations are now introduced. There is an incredible lack of high quality studies. And also you need to know with this, we mean the so-called randomized controlled trials. So about this kind of interventions that are applied on billions of people, we have really not so much good solid science. And isn't this amazing? And this is another example of pandemic science out of control. This is a paper that was published in August, so it's quite recent. And this scientist is a preprint that everyone knows nowadays, but anyway, wasn't peer reviewed yet. Uh, so they made a bit the math. They went to check how many papers, so studies are being published on COVID-19. So in this um, time between January 2020 and August 2021, they found 200, over 210,000 COVID papers for about 720,000 individual orders and co-orders. This is what we normally call um, research waste, because 
you know, it's quite a lot. You can't believe it's how much good stuff is in there. We don't know. The interesting thing is that they went and checked how, uh, who, who are these others, who are these scientists, actually. So they come from all the 174 disciplines of science, including entomologists, ornithologists, paleontologists, and we have over 5,000 orders that belong normally to physics and astronomy. We have also solar panels expert publishing on COVID-19, and we have a cars engineer. So mm, I have a lot of respect for every academic, of course, but I'm not sure that we be really badly needed the solar panels expert, but also the entomologist. Maybe it's not exactly a contribution we need. And they made also a bit of, they went to check as a comparative how many had been publishing on H1N1, Zika, Ebola, tuberculosis. And this is less than one tenth. So one of the many questions I would have is, will the scientists go back to their field of expertise now or anytime soon? which I would find really important because on tuberculosis, for instance, we badly need experts because we know the estimation is that it killed already over a billion people. So we need TBC scientists to write about TBC. So why is this important? This we call the scary slide. Uh, so this is the big family of all the studies you have in medical research. And if you are a pandemic journalist, if you are covering this international crisis, you need to learn this. Because these are all different. They have different features. They can do different things. And this is for you very important to know what is what. Why is not a study is not just a study? Because some are more prone to bias, which are like systematic errors, uh, deviation from the truth. And this can influence or will influence the results. And another de definition, these are classical definitions, is there might be systematic errors. So finally, you can end up um, having a mistaken estimation of the true effect of whatever. So a very common bias, which I think rings a bell with journalists, is observed association. So you, ne you need always to think when you are, you know, say an expert tells you, hey, this is a good study. The first question you need to answer is, is there really a cause and effect association? Or could this association be due maybe to chance or distortions? And this is a classical example to keep in mind why correlation is not causation. You might easily find a correlation between ice cream sales and shark attacks, but it doesn't mean that ice cream cause shark attacks, right? And this is another example we often uh, at ReCheck use for the training we give to journalists or newsrooms, uh, which is you can be able, actually, if you know a little bit uh, the drill, this is a great study that showed that there is actually a, a causative link, probably, between storches and babies. So it depends what you do. You can do a lot if you know the, um, the techniques. This is um, a, a useful, uh, s very simplified, where you can see what is the level of evidence and what is the grade of recommendation. This is an international standard. So you see, when you are here, up here, you can call it evidence. The, the, the more you go down the pyramid, the less strong is the evidence. And here, in this blue part, you find experts' reports or opinions. And this is very important because journalists rely a lot on experts' opinion. So I give you just one example of regulation by press release, which is going on right now in this international crisis. This is remdesivir, is a drug that is uh, supposed to be useful for COVID-19 patients. It was first uh, published as a, um, as a study on the New England Journal of Medicine. 
and the conclusion was very positive. Clinical improvement was observed in 68% of the participants to the study. But actually, if you read the full paper, so if you go and read the study, you will see that there were altogether only 53 patients, four 56 others, and this is a red flag, and you see that was a court study. This is not the top level of evidence you can have. There was no control arm, so there was no placebo group, and it was actually funded by the, by the manufacturer of this drug. So what you see here is that this was actually hit the news also through a, a leak, a tiny leak that was published on STAT, which is a very known in my field, media, which provoked immediately a 11% surge in the stocks, in the market value of the company. So I think this is also a really good warning for us journalists, watch out what you publish because you might help the stock market. Interestingly, finally, remdesivir has been anyway authorized and approved and is recommended, even though we know from randomized controlled trials that actually was not really associated with a statistically significant clinical benefits. So that's why for you it's very important to know the basics. And this is the most simplified version. Uh, we always recommend our students to print it and hang it in, in your office. And this is what you need to know. Experts' opinion is the lowest level of evidence you have, actually, per se. And speaking about experts, who are the experts? Because, I mean, in this international crisis, everyone is talking every second day to an expert. And we have VIP uh, worldwide. So these are all the different experts you might be tempted to talk to. I would say the most famous at the moment are the virologists, right? But actually, these are the three experts in red that you would like to talk to, because they can really, really tell you something about epidemics and management of epidemics. I would like also to mention that pandemic journalism has been seen red for almost two years now, and the news is that the coronavirus is not red. Uh, although we know that on uh, human psychology, the use of the color red is warning. I mean, think about the street lights, right? Red, alert. So I think for many years we will discuss how come that actually pandemic journalists decided to use the red. Not only journalism, even the Johns Hopkins uh, coronavirus database that journalists worldwide use, it's using the color red. So this is our tip as ReCheck, where you should get maybe rather your data from. There is Our World in Data, uh, which is an alternative to Johns Hopkins database. We like it better. Uh, for Europe, there is Euromomo, which is a really good database, and you can use it also for other countries because it gives you a lot of hints. And then we recommend really using the data of the national agencies for statistics and the primary care monitoring databases, because these are guys dealing with such numbers all the time, not only when there is an international crisis. This is extremely important. If you are covering um, this crisis or, or the next one, you need to get your numbers straight. You need to learn a bit how you deal with these things. Because we know that in our head, so it's us, the journalists, but also the public, uh, we have cognitive shortcuts. So we have a limited rationality. So we tend to struggle with probabilities, especially in visualizing the percentages. And we prefer absolute values. So uh, this has especially emotions have a, a big impact on how we perceive numbers. There is a lot of science behind it. And we also know that it's especially powerful impact when it's about sickness and death. So we need really to watch out how we use numbers. We have seen it also in the video that was introducing today. Mm. Uh, to give you just an example, these are exactly the same numbers. This is a natural sampling, so-called, 
and this is expressed in probability. So as a journalist, if you want the people to understand you, you might be probably better off with using natural sampling. And I also recommend you the, to get on speed with risk literacy. Risk literacy means how do you perceive the risk? Do you understand the risk in health and medicine? And uh, I really recommend you to do the test. It's here. You can try it out. There are simple questions, and you can get a clue at what level are you with risk literacy. Because if you are not really on speed with that, it's going to be hard for you to, to be a good health journalist. And just to conclude, um, these are like a couple of tips. Uh, really be cautious about the models. Stick to the best available uh, scientific evidence, and you need to assess it yourself. Provide always context. Otherwise, people won't understand much and will be very scared. And hunt for the red flags. And you find a lot of this in our guide. We recommend you really to question every information and every source, regardless of their reputation, to assess yourself the evidence, and research and map also the big picture, because things in this field are much more complicated than what, what you can hear at the government presser. And beware of the hype. And this is a slide we have been using for years uh, to teach uh, investigating health and medicine techniques. And it's totally timely, because you will find these keywords in virtually every coverage about this international crisis. So for us, these are really red flags, because when you, when you read in a press release, revolutionary, spectacular, game changer, I would be very, very careful. Because in medicine, this is extremely rare. So I would be skeptical. And then we, yeah, we recommend you to use our, our guide on investigating health and medicine, because it has been really uh, prepared for people like you or us. Because I mean, what happens here is that when this international crisis has started, honestly, we were not so many worldwide uh, specializing at health and medicine, especially in the investigative journalism community. And at warp speed worldwide in every possible country, uh, journalists had to improvise and become pandemic journalists. This is not exactly a field uh, where you can really improvise. So the Global Investigative Journalism Network uh, gave us this commission. And the guide is really like built in a way that you can use it you can read it as a whole. It's 100 pages with over 400 links and resources. But you can also jump from one chapter to the next, uh, looking for something you might need. So if you want to report about vaccines or drugs, you want to first learn how they do come to the market normally, so that you can also ask more meaningful questions. And this is actually it if you want to join me. Thank you so much, uh, Serena. Uh, th this is quite eye-opening, because I think a lot of people who've been covering this pandemic for the past year and a half uh, think that they know what sources to use and how to use uh, information and statistics. Uh, and I think your, your example there of shark attacks uh, versus ice cream sales, it might be an exaggeration. I don't think many people would find that correlation. But still, it, it's an illustration of a, of a bigger point. When you look at um, the way this pandemic has been covered over these past one and a half years, taken into consideration your 20 years of expertise on this, uh, in this field, uh, what's your verdict? Uh, how do you think uh, uh, us colleagues have, have handled this, uh, this pandemic in terms of uh, the journalism that's been produced? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I want to say, first of all, that I'm really sorry for our fellows that had to jump into this cold water of becoming literally overnight uh, health and medicine reporters, because this is really a field you can't improvise. 
So I'm very sorry, really, for them. Really, I, I really feel for them. On the other hand, I have to say I find it extremely depressing, generally speaking, because of course there are exceptional cases. They are good, there is good coverage. I mean, imagine worldwide there must be. But I would say that most of it, um, unfortunately, is not good enough. Uh, I see a very, very concerning tendency in copy-pasting uh, government and pharmaceutical companies' uh, press releases. You can literally follow it. If you do a little bit of research, most of the time you see the same headline worldwide in every country. And very often, too often, the source of that headline is a press release of a company or also of a government. So the government pressers, for instance, uh, we have seen this again worldwide. So there were not so many uh, specialized journalists there. At the government presser in every country, you have seen a lot of uh, political correspondence. I think you have been one too, right? Mm -hmm. I also worked at the Swiss uh, parliament for a while, but I was an investigative journalist. But still, we know that uh, when you cover the news as a parliamentary correspondent or a government correspondent, you are normally not really specialized at health and medicine, right? So this was a, was a major problem, and it's still today, I believe. And then this copy-paste just doesn't make any sense, because I think we all agree that if I write a press release, I I underline my point, right? So I think we have to be, it's quite simple. I mean, pharmaceutical companies, uh, they do develop and sell drugs and vaccines. Mm. So to copy paste the messaging <coughs> of a company is never a good idea, I think. But if you now take a step back and, and try to, to uh, let's say, educate ourselves, even if it's uh, the pandemic is now, uh, I I we don't have those challenges as, as uh, journalists. Uh, where to start? Uh, is it what kind of sources we, we choose? Is it to educate ourselves in the science of health? Or where do you think we should start? OK, first of all, I think the guide that the Global Investigative Journalism Network uh, published, and we wrote it, it's exactly the good start because, I mean, we try to really give the overview because uh, it's a long way to really learn in this field, of course, but it's possible. In my experience, it's possible because, I mean, I don't have a PhD in medicine and you need to, to read a lot. You need to get on speed. I think the most important thing is that you get, you have to understand numbers and you have to understand the methodology, because if you don't know how the system works, what is evidence in science and medicine, what is not evidence, you will fall all the time for the same pit pitfalls. The experts, I think, is a great example, because we journalists, we rely a lot on experts' opinion. But before you give the floor to an expert, you need to be able to recheck his background because every, I mean, I can tell you I'm an expert, but you need to see, you would do that, right? As an investigative journalist, before you invite me here, you checked, who's Serena? Does she know the, this field or not? So we should do this all the time with the experts. I find it very important. And you should get on speed about these pyramids we have seen. I mean, you need to, to, to know the basics, absolutely. And there you can start a bit understanding how this works. And I think one very important thing in this field is to be extremely critical and skeptical. Mm. Watch out, always, because it's a field where there is a lot of money. And we have seen it now in this global crisis, right? I mean, it, can, it, it became literally the story for almost two years now. And many other stories, they went underground. Mm. So many. Also in health, in public health, there is a lot more than well, an epidemic. And what are the important stories now, you think, and further? Well, in public health, I think um, we have a lot to catch up right now. Mm. Uh, I think one important thing that is still now, because Norway is, is amazing. I mean, Oslo now, life is pretty normal. In many other countries, that's not the case. Mm. So I'm still waiting for strong investigative journalists 
to investigate what is the evidence, for instance, behind COVID uh, passports, how they are called. Because now in some countries, like I think tomorrow or today even, in Italy, every worker must be actually having a vaccine or a negative test in order to be working. So the level we are reaching is quite high. What is the evidence behind that? Do they work? Do they actually control an epidemic or not? So I think there is a lot of work to be done. And then I believe there is, of course, a lot of work to be done on the consequences of policies of these two years. There is a lot of, there are so many investigations out there waiting for people to do them. Uh, you've been talking a lot about the companies uh, involved in, uh, in the healthcare industry and, and how we should re relate to them. Uh, one thing that I think has been interesting during this pandemic is how we uh, relate to governments and government information. And in many countries we've seen uh, partisanship uh, as an element in the information that's being portrayed. Uh, and you see uh, uh, governments using, uh, using the pandemic to enhance their own power in a way that we maybe haven't seen before. Uh, how do we deal with this challenge moving forward? Because it seems like it's, it's uh, come up now as, as a new and, and stronger challenge than what we might have faced before. Absolutely. I totally agree and I find it extremely concerning. I think one big misunderstanding uh, there was in these two years, which again, in the very beginning, when you don't know things, you can do whatever, right? The most in public health. But when things get clearer, you should change. So what happened a lot is that apparently uh, media outlets felt like they were part of the government. Incredible. So this led also to a very concerning uh, phenomena, which is like censorship on social media, but also in the media. So even like a, extremely knowledgeable scientists, the real experts, have been silenced because maybe they were daring saying, Hang on a sec, where is the evidence? And I agree that a lot happened that actually, I'm not sure if it's justified. And I think we need to uh, tell to governments and companies that we woke up, that we are here, that we are, a that we are ready to recheck their statements. Because you know, when you give to governments and to companies the impression that it's enough that they issue a press release or they do a presser, a press conference, and media are going to just give the same message. We have a problem because they like it, probably. Hmm. Serena so, Tenari, thank you so much for participating in this masterclass. And I think what you just said there about governments is the perfect segue to our next uh, presentation. Yes, we are moving towards Brazil and uh, President Bolsonaro's regime with massive disinformation campaigns. One brilliant journalist, uh, Patricia Campos Mello, uh, you have interviewed her, uh, Christopher. Uh, she's an award-winning journalist uh, of uh, Brazil's biggest news outlet, Folha S. Paulo. And she has reported on this massive disinformation. And the big question is, uh, how do you get people to believe in a president who is carrying this disinformation, uh, when they see so many lives being lost, families, friends, when a parallel reality emerges, and uh, when independent journalists become even more important. Look at this video from uh, Brazil. Uh, it's pictures who I think sums up the pandemic and the COVID story in Brazil.
Patricia Campos Melo, welcome to this uh, pandemic masterclass. Thank you so much, Christopher. Thank you for having well, me. We're, we're very excited to, to have you. I mean, you, you've done such uh, important work for, for years and now also including uh, on on this pandemic. Uh, I figured we could start, I mean, since um, uh, since we now, we're now more than a year and a half into the pandemic, if you could just give us an outline of, of what it looks like in Brazil right now after all these waves you've gone through in, in Brazil, what's the situation like uh, now? Well, even though we have the Delta uh, variant here, uh, the situation is better than it was before. But still, Brazil has had one of the worst um, managements of the crisis, of the pandemic, of all countries. If you think of it, we've had the second or third highest death toll from COVID-19. Um, so it's really difficult because the government is uh, a COVID denier, so to say. Uh, and we've been dealing with all sorts of fake treatments and, and disinformation. So... Um, basically, many more people have died that it would be uh, unavoidable. We've had many unnecessary deaths. Mm. You mentioned the president, and of course he's, he's central here, and we'll, we'll spend some time talking about him. But uh, if you can sort of list some of the things that he's, some of the kinds of disinformation that he's spread and how, how he's gone about uh, handling this crisis. I mean, we I think most of us know that he's... Uh, He's anti-vaccine and he, he seems not to believe in the virus at all. But um, could, you, could you give us the specifics of, of how he has uh, handled this, uh, this crisis? Sure. Since March 2020, uh, President Bolsonaro said that people should not stop working. They should not do social distancing because if they did that, the economy would sink. And this uh, would damage a lot his presidency. So basically all his uh, thoughts, uh, his goal was basically to make people go out of the house and keep on working instead of you know, social isolation and taking care of them. So in the beginning, he really um, bet on hydroxychloroquine as a miracle drug against uh, COVID-19 and also ivermectin, which is a medication against lice, among other things, and worms. Uh, so basically, since day one, he has been um, doing a lot of propaganda that people should be taking this COVID kit, as he calls it, that this would be a um, prevention way to deal. You know, you should be taking it really early on with the symptoms. At the same time, saying, you know, uh, the policy, the social distancing policy of the governors and mayors is damaging the economy and people are getting employed because of the, man, uh, the mayors and the governors. So basically what we had is uh, a president who is sabotaging social distancing and blaming uh, governors and other local governments for high unemployment. And at the same time, he's investing all this money in propaganda, in this information about uh, supposed miracle drugs as hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin that have already been proved by science to be not effective against COVID. You know, some of this, I'm sure that uh, anyone who's been following the news in, in the U.S. would uh, would recognize as well some of these methods. Um, why do people <laughs> believe uh, what he says? Hmm. Um, that's very interesting. Um, the government in Brazil, and I think, I mean, the president here has been emulating former President Trump since day one. So in the same way as in the US, there's like a parallel reality and a parallel uh, news ecosystem uh, in the country. Uh, the government supporters basically get their information from uh, social media accounts of the president and his sons, who are also politicians, and his allies, and also social media accounts from the government, from the ministries, uh, Sorry, are you, I, I, I'm getting that noise again. Are you getting it? Yes, you are, right? Yeah, I can hear it. Try turning off your mic and, yeah. uh, and turning it on again. See if that, uh, if that helps. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so what, where did he stop again? Um, 
So, yeah. So the government in Brazil, um, pretty much like the, the former uh, Trump administration in the U.S., uh, the government uh, manages to keep his supporters in a parallel news ecosystem. Uh, the people are getting their information mainly from uh, social media accounts of the president, his sons and his allies, and social media accounts uh, of government instances or, or uh, ministries, and also right-wing, uh, extreme right-wing uh, bloggers, YouTubers. So, and, and these people, they do not believe mainstream media because the president and his allies say every day that, you know, you shouldn't trust the, the mainstream media because they're communists, blah, blah, blah. So basically, uh, a good uh, proportion of the population in Brazil uh, get all their information, including COVID-19 information, from these sources, from right, extreme right-wing bloggers or YouTubers or the president himself. And thus, they believe in a parallel reality. And in this parallel reality, uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, works, and, and people are not using it because, you know, the big pharma companies uh, are doing this conspiracy thing because they don't get uh, profits from hydroxychloroquine or whatever. I mean, so many uh, conspiracy theories. Um, so it gets to the point that um, we did a story recently that Brazil is the only country uh, in the world where you have, you still have a, a huge amount of disinformation uh, related to hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, uh, and, and it's still circulating. It's the only place in the world, not even in France, where you got the Didier Raoult, the researcher that first thought, you know, that it worked. Uh, not even there, it's, it's this amount of disinformation. So uh, people actually believe in this. The sales of these two drugs that are not effective against COVID, it's good to repeat. I'm sorry that I'm repeating it, but it's just a habit here. Uh, the sales have, uh, you know, increased many, many times here because of this. So someone is making uh, a lot of money out of this disinformation. Oh, yes. Hmm. But do, do you also see it as, as part of um, a, a political uh, game? I mean, the, the reasons why the president is doing this, obviously, he's not a stupid man. He knows what he's doing. Do you, do you see him uh, using disinformation like that as a way to, 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 uh, to, mo to, pro to promote his own strength? Oh, yes. Um, he's using this information basically to scapegoat local governments for uh, the really poor performance of the economy. So he's basically saying, you know, people did not need to do social distancing. They should go on with life as usual uh, because, after all, COVID-19, it's just like a regular flu. He said that many times. Um, so his disinformation campaign is essential so that he does not... Uh, He's not held accountable for the poor performance of the economy, high uh, unemployment, uh, political crisis. So basically, he uses this uh, network of uh, pro-government uh, media outlets or, or bloggers uh, to say that he's being um, persecuted by international media. It's not even only national media. It's international media that they don't, they, they really want to... Um, have the Amazon for them. They're not respecting Brazil's sovereignty over the Amazon, and they're not um, telling people that they should be taking this uh, simple drugs because the pharma companies want to profit. Mm. And vaccines don't work. Yeah, but how, how is the vac what's the vaccine situation like in Brazil now? Do, do you know how many percent uh, have gotten their doses? I think it's, well, we have something very peculiar in Brazil, which is the percentage of people who have taken the first dose. It's high. I think it's above, and I don't have this for sure here, the exact figure, but I would say like over 68%, something like that. But then people who have gotten their two doses is not that high, uh, basically because we don't have enough uh, vaccines. And that happens because Brazil was one of the last countries that realized that it would be important to procure vaccines, you know, to try to uh, uh, assure that you would have a supply uh, of vaccines. Because basically the government did not believe this was a serious disease. And uh, the president only decided to um, try to purchase vaccines. He only decided to do this for real after uh, the Sao Paulo governor 
announced he was going to start vaccinating people uh, in January. So at this point, it became a political uh, dispute. And that's the only reason we actually have vaccines today. Mm. And we have this. I mean, this has been proved in diplomatic cables. We've been doing stories about this. Yeah, yeah. Now, your, your mic seems uh, like it's it's uh, picking up a lot of cicadas uh, again. Can you try turning it on and yes. uh, turning it off and on? Oh. Why is it happening? <laughs> it's weird. Oh. But, uh, you talked about disinformation and how that erodes uh, uh, trust in, in the established uh, news media. I mean, you, you work for one of the newspapers of record, uh, one of the big newspapers in, in Brazil. How do you how do you notice that yourself that uh, the trust in the big media institutions uh, is being eroded? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, we have our Independence Day is September seventh. Uh, I was in a state in the Amazon region covering some other story, but then I went because the president. Uh, basically um, urged people to show up in uh, September 7 uh, to defend his government and basically to uh, ask for the closure of the Supreme Court and Congress, a coup d'etat, basically. So I was covering this in this uh, state in the Amazon region, Roraima, and while I was covering, you know, uh, many people, tens of thousands of people, uh, protesting uh, in favor of the president, and then someone heard that I was working for Folia, this newspaper. And immediately you had people, and one person in particular, saying, the communist media, like, yelling at me and trying to prevent the governor to speaking to me, saying, you know, this is the communist media, you can't speak to them, they're distorting everything, um, they're communist, uh, which, by the way, in Brazil, it's a very interesting thing because we've never we've never had communism mm. ever in in the country so the ghost of communism you can understand this in you know eastern europe but in, in brazil it's just uh, very odd but anyway so uh people are basically hostile towards media one uh photographer who was covering one of those protests in favor of the president last year he was uh, uh actually punched and and kicked uh, and shoved by uh, supporters of the president, because that's that's how high the hostility is uh, uh, towards journalists. Mm. And I mean, you've you've been noticing this for for many years, and it's uh, being a, a profile journalist yourself. You've, uh, I guess, you, you've seen more than uh, more than your fair share of uh, of that kind of uh, of attacks. But do you feel it's it's increasing now in, in recent years? Uh, now that Bolsonaro seems to be fine tuning his uh, his attacks on the media. Um, I, I think that there's always um, sort of um, animosity between governments and journalists. That, that's part of the game, right? I mean, we are the ones who are investigating. We're basically annoying uh, powerful people. That's what our job is about, right? But this, the current government, and I think that happens in many other um, populist governments, either extreme left or extreme right uh, populist governments, um, it's very much, uh, the hostility is much stronger and the, also, I mean, it's more personal. They're targeting specific journalists, specific uh, media outlets and, and doing, you know, character assassination, online sexual harassment campaigns, uh, and even like personal threats. In Brazil, this was not common since, I don't know, like 40 years ago when we uh, when the military dictatorship uh, finished. So it is very new to us to be personally targeted by the president himself, by his supporters, be it like physical threats on the streets or, you know, online. Um, and it's sort of a new kind of censorship because, you know, when you're working on a, a piece uh, that is an investigative piece and this is going to bother the government somehow, you're already expecting a backlash, and, and, and not a normal backlash. You know, it's not criticism. It's it's way beyond that. It's like attacks against, you know, threats against son, my son or, you know, many, many people here in Brazil. I'm, I'm far from being the only one, and mainly women journalists. Mm -hmm. well, does that lead to a, a kind of self-censorship? Does the, 
the, the sphere that uh, that you might be attacked personally and you might receive threats. Uh, do you see people around you who who then think again before they write stories that might be critical of the government? Um, I think we definitely are thinking again in terms of pausing before publishing something or before going ahead with uh, with investigations. I don't think we're getting to the point of self-censoring because one of the few good things at this point is that uh, civil society is very strong and it's reacting. So the media outlets that are still independent are really, uh, you know, not self-censoring. Uh, but I guess together with the online uh, harassment and, and physical threats, there's also um, judicial harassment. So I'm sure many independent journalists uh, who don't have a company behind them, you know, with the legal uh, team, they are self-censoring because you have uh, government supporters who are just, you know, uh, suing uh, in series, like so many journalists, just, you know, to make a point to, to try to intimidate. So uh, I'm not personally self-censoring, and I think most of the people were really, you know, uh, trying not to self-censor. But in many cases, if you don't have a strong uh, structure, a legal team behind you, I think you are self-censoring. Yeah. Mm. At Scoop, uh, earlier this year, we, we interviewed Maria Ressa in the Philippines. And uh, I mean, it's, it seems a bit similar there and in many other places as well, that, that when the people in power see this way of threatening, especially women journalists, uh, uh, that, that must lead to fear, as you say, amongst those who don't have the, uh, an established uh, media house in, in uh, covering their backs. Uh, but also, I mean, young people coming into the profession. Uh, do you do you sort of have to give pep talks to to younger colleagues to get them to to be brave like uh, like you? Well, I'm not brave. Uh, I have the legal team behind me, so it's a very <laughs> privileged situation. Uh, but before, I just wanted to say that I met Maria Reza in 2018, right after the election of Bolsonaro. We met in a conference. Uh, it was so interesting because she started talking about Duterte and everything that was happening. And she said to me, uh, you know, pay attention that in a bit, uh, the government is going to start uh, putting pressure on private advertisers to stop advertising on unpatriotic media outlets. Mm. And that is exactly what happened. And this is where it gets really complicated, financially speaking, because, you know, all the media outlets are already suffering from the business model, from the pandemic. And then you have the government putting pressure. And, and it's just uh, so uh, interesting and sad how everything that Maria Ressa was saying that was happening in, in, in the Philippines is happening in Brazil uh, with, let's say, two-year delay in Brazil. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I think young journalists, on the one hand, yes, they are a bit more scared because it's not like we learn at journalism school or at university that, you know, on top of checking your sources, the documents, you have to just check if you have any vulnerabilities, if, you know, uh, you're going to, because people are basically doing opposition research on journalists to say, you know, if you said something on social media 10 years ago, or if your mom is X, Y, Z, or if your son. So this is something that young journalists, um, it's, it's hard to understand that they're going to be targeted, right? It's not something that we had been learning. Uh, it's not part of the curriculum uh, at university. On the other hand, there's a really, um, uh, journalism is valued again. I mean, people were really thinking, uh, okay, so this is what we're doing. It's important because if it were not for journalists, who would be, you know, going to hospitals, to ICUs to say, you know, there's lack of oxygen, there's lack of drugs, there's lack of intubation drugs, or getting all the, the budget of the government. So for many years, we were questioning ourselves and also young journalists, like, are we really doing useful work? And then at this point, even though it's more difficult than ever because we have the power of the government against journalism, uh, at the same time, we um, really feel that it's something that, you know, we have to do this. There, there's, there's a point in doing journalism at this point. So you get your idealism back up uh, <laughs> when, you when you're faced with that uh, clear and present danger. 
basically. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Uh, I mean, you shouldn't need this to get your <laughs> idealism back. But um, I think we're trying to, we as media, trying to redeem ourselves from many mistakes we've made. And at the same time, there's a, a healthy um, humility lesson, uh, I think, from what's happening now, not, not only in, in countries that are governed by populist leaders, but also in general with the empowerment of social media, which is, um, it's not enough to be a journalist for people to believe what you're writing or what you're doing, right? You have to be transparent. You have to prove why should people trust what you're writing? Uh, so this um, backlash against experts, against uh, science, it's very bad, it is, but for journalism itself, it's good to make us humble, you know, to make us understand that we have to be very transparent uh, regarding how we get our information, where we get it from, why should people believe in us and not on some WhatsApp group. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned WhatsApp. Uh, you, you've written a book about uh, using WhatsApp and, and a lot of very, very prominent journalism on on the use of WhatsApp. Bolsonaro used that to uh, to reach out and uh, and uh, and make sure that he uh, he won the election. Um, but the problem with with all these platforms is that all the information looks the same. So an article you write will look similar to a piece of propaganda or a piece of misinformation. Uh, how do we? I mean, that's a, that's a global problem. We see it everywhere. How, how do we get beyond that? Have you found any tricks, any ways to to uh, to establish that trust that we can't get when all news looks the same? That's the one billion dollar question, hmm. <clears throat> but it's a really good question. Um, I think that that is exactly uh, the problem that you diagnosed. I mean, on top of um, you have in WhatsApp groups where all kinds of disinformation circulate. You have websites that emulate uh, actual media outlets, but their news is either biased or basically false. And it looks like real news. It, they look like real uh, newspapers online or, you know, uh, websites, but they're actually propaganda. And these are these uh, kinds of uh, um, information or, or um, pieces of propaganda, they go viral, unlike actual information. Like the big struggle is how do you make quality information go viral at the same speed or to having the same reach as this information or as distorted information? And the answer is we don't know that. We're trying to figure out how to make um, news more attractive, not compromising, uh, you know, basic values of journalism. But it's really sad when you think of it, um, for instance, with fact-checking. How many people read fact-checking uh, pieces? And how many people read the, you know, the false uh, statement or the, the false news that, that uh, was in the first place? Um, we're trying. Uh, I haven't found a way yet, you know, to be to have the same reach as this information, but we try. And uh, in Brazil, from what I understand, y your information led to some changes in, in how uh, politicians like Bolsonaro were able to use these WhatsApp groups. And I, I guess we've also seen during the pandemic that Facebook and other big social media have, have made it more difficult or more challenging to spread disinformation. Do you think the pandemic was uh, important in that respect, that once people started dying in thousands and hundreds of thousands and even more, that that was the, the thing that actually led these uh, social media companies to finally take this problem seriously? Definitely, because they know they would have, and they actually have, blood on their hands. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, before... Since 2016, since the Trump election and since the Brexit uh, referendum, it became clear that social media had a very negative impact on democracy. Um, but with the pandemic, it became a huge public relations problem for the platforms, internet platforms, because how can you reason, how can you defend freedom of speech, as Mark Zuckerberg had been doing, uh, if speech is actually lethal? It's, it's really lethal, right? Um, so in Brazil, after our 2018 election, um, actually 2018, there were two, um, two things that led WhatsApp to change uh, its uh, structure. 
um, first lynchings in India in, in July 2018, and then the 2018 Brazilian election, which was like an avalanche of fake news. So they uh, included what they call friction um, mechanisms, which is it's harder for you to forward messages, and it becomes harder if there's a message that is going viral. So, I mean, that's an attempt. Does it solve the problem? No, but it helps somehow. You know, it's like they're trying to do something. But then again, our new problem here is Telegram. And I'm sure you have Telegram. And Telegram is like, you don't even have a legal representative in the country. Like the, the electoral court, we have elections next year. And we have the same narrative of fraudulent elections here in Brazil. It's the same thing the president is saying there's going to be uh, rigged elections. So how do you reach out to Telegram to say, you know, you have groups with thousands, millions of people that are receiving false information? You don't, because mm -hmm. they don't even speak to the electoral court here. They don't have a legal representative. They, they're not, they're non-entity. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Most definitely. And also, I mean, as journalists, we're supposed to try to not be the news and not and to cover other things in a neutral way and as objectively as we can. But here we're suddenly, uh, if not uh, apart, we're we're in the middle of this big battle of uh, that has to do with the, the saving democracy and saving the, the notion of truth and all of that. Um, I, I guess you've been thinking about this as well. I mean, how, how to avoid becoming an activist when you're just trying to do your job as a journalist? Um, I think this is one of the main problems we're facing um, because it became a struggle for democracy. Uh, some people just figured, you know, it's okay to be an activist. And if you are um, partisan on uh, social media or if you're openly defending some issues, particular issues, um, I think it undermines even further the credibility of journalism. Um, I know there's people who think differently. There's people who say, you know, you, you should be an activist because we're trying to uh, fight for democracy or, for instance, in that famous case, the New York Times, that uh, there was an op-ed by uh, Senator Tom Cotton that basically incited violence uh, during the protest, the Black Lives Matter protests. And mm -hmm. then people said, yeah, you can't, I mean, I do understand, but I think that as a reporter, as a journalist, there are other ways for you to stand up for what you think is right. If you think um, there are human rights abuses, or if you think the platforms are not doing enough, just do a story, investigate, you know, just show, show the facts. You don't need to go online and say, I am against President XYZ or Facebook or whatever. This is not our job. We're not activists. But we can do, we can, it's not like we're going to uh, be, um, how do you say this in English, that we're not going to be, we're going to be passive. We're not going to do what we have to do. No, we can do this, investigate and, and not letting uh, activism undermine our credibility. Hmm. Hmm. So a sound piece of advice. Um, I'm, I'm going to end with, uh, with this, just sort of try to sum some things up. Uh, do you think this pandemic, we will see how disinformation has been used during the pandemic, but we also see how journalism has uh, taken on a new, as you said, a new kind of energy, uh, uh, people discovering uh, the importance of good journalism. Do you think the pandemic has been good for journalism or has it been bad for journalism? Um, I would say that we can't say anything good about the pandemic uh, <laughs> in that sense, of course, because you have millions of people uh, dead. But um, I think that in the middle of this avalanche of information, um, let me go back. Um, we had this very healthy thing of democratization of information, right? You didn't need uh, media, traditional media, to be gatekeepers or curators or however you name it. Uh, you just had this freedom to get your information from original sources and to you know, uh, produce your own information. But when you have a pandemic and you're being bombarded by information from all sides, it's really hard to understand what is true and what is not. And people start looking for parameters, for standards, for something, right? 
And, and I think that if you develop a, a professional journalism, credible journalism, uh, this is important. People started to look for professional journalism more uh, during the pandemic because they were lost. We are all lost in the middle of this flood of this information, right? And, and, and that, you know, uh, that, as we said, can lead to uh, behavior that kills you. So in that sense, I think there's been, um, people started to uh, give journalism value again. Uh, or understand its importance again. Uh, although it's very sad that we had to have millions of deaths for that to happen. We could have done this in, in some other uh, situation, but still, I think it's even more, even greater the responsibility on us not to compromise, uh, not to lose our credibility, you know, to be even more, um, how do you say this, strict, when you're reporting, when you're investigating, and not be an activist. I know this is controversial. Some, some people, like, the new generations think, you know, it's part of you as a person to be an activist. Uh, but I guess for reporters, I'm, I'm still of the opinion that we should not be directly uh, involved in activism. Mm. Patricia Campos Mello. Thank you so much for uh, for taking part in this uh, masterclass and, and sharing these uh, these uh, wise thoughts uh, thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Sorry if I spoke too much. It's just like these uh, issues just get out. It's very uh, passionate. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. A brave journalist. Uh, she herself was uh, assaulted by. Uh, the president's son and uh, President Bolsonaro himself and made actually, um, she went to court and she won twice after being assaulted. Mm. I think it was actually that um, they said she had sex to gain information and interfere the president's election of 2018, but she won. Yeah, she sued the president and his son, and uh, she won. And that <laughs> goes to show that uh, even in Brazil, where there were many challenges for journalism, uh, the uh, the system still still works uh, at least uh, sometimes. And uh, I think for Patricia, that uh, uh, that goes to show that uh, she is not only a, a very good journalist, she's also a very brave journalist. Yeah. And now, another brave journalist. Yes, in Sao Paulo, uh, as in many other places, when the pandemic hit. Uh, of course, there were many practical challenges when you had lockdowns, you had quarantines, everyone had to stay inside. So how to conduct journalism uh, in a city that was full of underprivileged people? Uh, and uh, our next uh, speaker, Wagner Dalanjar, he uh, manages to find ways of using the pandemic for innovation, to find new ways of communicating with his core audience. Uh, and we've uh, pre-recorded this, uh, this interview and uh, take a look at this uh, presentation from Wagner. Hi, everyone. First of all, I would like to apologize for my bad English, <laughs> but I hope you can understand me well. So uh, my name is Wagner Jalenka. I'm a Brazilian journalist. I have been dedicating myself to the coverage of the uh, underprivileged areas in Sao Paulo for the past uh, eight years. I am a co-founder and a director of journalism at Agência Mural. Agência Mural is the first agency of journalism, communication and intelligence made by and for the low-income regions here in the Greater Sao Paulo. Um, this is the map of the region where I live, uh, where there are 39 cities including the capital, Sao Paulo. 21 million residents live here, 11 million of them only in the city of Sao Paulo. So our mission is to minimize the existing gap of information and to contribute to the deconstruction of stereotypes in and about the outskirts of the whole metropolitan area of Sao Paulo. Since 2010, more than 
300 local correspondents who live in their, their own neighborhoods were trained by us and almost 5,000 stories were published. We currently have a network of almost 100 active local correspondents. Our stories are distributed through our own channels and by our, our uh, media partners as in Folha de São Paulo, uh, the largest newspaper here in Brazil, and on, uh, and on Spotify, for example. And our audience is mostly young. So, uh, as the majority of the small local outlets across the globe, since the COVID-19 crisis struck the world, we had to adapt and face the new work and reporting conditions. So, uh, the question, uh, what has changed? In the beginning, we have chosen to focus our reporting on covering the stories that uh, that were part of the survival kit of information to keep our audiences as safe and sound as possible. Our challenge was how to keep them, uh, how to keep them with us informed and not tired by the subject and also delivering them something useful. So information that can help them make it daily decisions. So we started uh, experiencing uh, social media formats and distribution. In an effort to reach more readers, we have also increased the potential, the production of uh, graphic content, illustrations and audios. The podcast in quarantine is the fruit of this effort in quarantine, in quarantine. Uh, and it was in daily contact with several residents of the peripheries that we were summoned by our audience to go further. Um, as we advanced with the experience of distributing the podcast through our uh, WhatsApp business lists, we realized that when the audio was followed by some illustration or in, in, an infographic, the engagement um, rate increased considerably. But how to identify more uh, assertively the type of image that should accompany the message? And more, what are the ways to transform an originally textual content into images. So, uh, in order to to answer these questions, uh, we spent a month analyzing the visual experimentations already published, researched consumer behavior trends on the internet, and interviewed some young people between 20 and 33 years old. Regarding distribution potential and innovation, we believe that there's a huge horizon to be explored in working the WhatsApp networks of each one of the local correspondents uh, at Agência Mural. Uh, this not only amplifies the work impact of each reporter and therefore each story published by Mural, but it's also a basis to strengthen their link with the territory uh, itself. So, uh, more examples of formats distributed on social networks and by WhatsApp. Uh, comic strips, for example. Uh, this is a comic strip with uh, care instructions to the students who were going to take the exam for the national high uh, high school exam, um, another comic uh, comic strip uh, uh, about with uh, different cards that explain the function of a councilman, distributed throughout the throughout our uh, social media during the elections campaign last year, 
infographics uh, about elections results and the second round of voting for the mayor and councilmen videos uh, here uh, we did uh, we produced uh, humorous uh, videos about the daily life with masks uh, and we also have local correspondents from our network experimenting a uh, new video formats um, whatsapp lists uh, examples of messages distributed with informative comics and uh, or personalized personalized stickers uh, and about uh, our daily coverage so uh, Within the context of our COVID-19 coverage, uh, the daily podcast uh, in quarantena uh, became a fundamental piece. We decided uh, in the second season uh, to address different themes that impact the lives of the residents of the peripheries Each day of the week, we explored a subject with a focus on maintaining our uh, awareness about the pandemic, refuting fake news, and deepening the discussion about public policies in the in the city and the rights of the population to access uh, healthcare. So, and uh, in the last experience. Uh, was distributing audio news with a carro in Portuguese, a sound car. Uh, the episodes uh, about politics circulated through uh, the streets in a sound car in some neighborhoods. It was amazing. So, uh, although ex experimental, the proposal to, to take the podcast to the streets also shows that it's possible to, to think of uh, strategies, language, and the formats to make the mural content reach the peripheries. And that uh, the audio format already explored by the agency can also gain uh, new contours. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Uh, I invite you all to access our website uh, and this is my contact thank you again bye bye from brazil so that was uh, wagner dalinjar uh, talking about how to use this pandemic to find innovative new ways of communicating with an audience And uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating story, and I, I'm sure that there are similar stories many places around the world. But Brazil is special. It is one of the places with the highest rates of uh, COVID deaths, and that has a lot to do with the way the government handled it. Like we heard from Patricia uh, uh, de Melo Campos earlier, uh, how the government has actively uh, led to the spread of this disease by denying uh, The, the virus by denying the vaccine. Uh, but as we also heard in that interview uh, with Patricia, there are many similarities between how Bolsonaro has handled the pandemic in Brazil and how Trump handled the pandemic in the early stages of, uh, of the outbreak in, in the United States. And that's where we're heading now. We're going from Brazil to the United States, Maria. Yes, and Andrew Liren, he is a senior editor at NBC News investigating team and has covered the pandemic in the United States under uh, previous President Donald Trump. But I think we should just look at uh, a sum up of what happened under Trump's uh, regime. Corona 19, the China virus, the news, the CNN, all they talk about, COVID. You know, it's, it's a little tough and you have a temperature and you don't feel good. See the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute. Looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. I hope that's true. We have done an incredible job. We're going to continue 
it's going to disappear. It gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So you know you're a fake. You know that your whole network, the way you cover it, is fake. And one of the things we've done a really good job on is COVID. The WHO failed in this basic duty and must be held accountable. I think it's a great thing to wear a mask. I've never been against masks. I mean, I have a mask right here. I put a mask on it, you know, when I think I need it. We did everything right. But we're doing so much testing, 25 million tests. In numerous categories, we're lower than the world. But we must hold accountable the nation which unleashed this plague onto the world, China. But we're not entering a dark winter. We're entering the final turn and approaching the light at the end of the tunnel. That's the way I look at it. Why did you lie to the American people, and why should we trust what you have to say Such now? That's a terrible question. If this were another administration, you wouldn't have vaccines for three years. I'm going to Walter Reed Hospital. Do you think you might be a super spreader, Mr. President? I learned so much about coronavirus. And one thing that's for certain, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. Great. Uh, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending what time you're at. My name's Andy Laren. I'm an investigative reporter at NBC News. And I wanted to talk a, a little bit about how we did investigative work during the pandemic. And keep in mind, we're a large news organization. So we have many other reporters who were involved in all kinds of day-to-day -day reporting. So by no means what I'm describing will be everyone's experience. Um, I was part of a team. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how we tried to add value to our coverage to bring what we thought would be important information to our, our readers and viewers. And um, you know, if I could just roll back to March of 2020, you know, when we're starting all of this, particularly those of us on the investigative team, we were engaged in other projects. At, at that time, I was working on the FinCEN files and another investigation. So it's not like we were planning about how we were gonna be covering a pandemic. And while I do have some experience covering public health issues, you know, it required us to be switching gears. So just to give you uh, a, a quick rundown, you know, when the pandemic was real in early March, and our editors were saying, how are we gonna be covering this? What we applied to it at this early stage is really a lot of the tried and true measures we talk about here at Scoop, GIJN in the United States, IRE. And what, what I mean by that is like applying a document frame of mind. How are we gonna go about examining things and measuring things? And, and digging up things that perhaps others are missing while our colleagues are doing the day-to-day -day coverage. So that may sound conceptual. Let me try to give some examples. So one of the things that we know covering the United States, covering Washington, is there's a lot of lobbying going on. And one of the things that I thought would be interesting as I was developing my lists of the documents and records I would be examining are, um, how are foreign governments reacting to this in the early weeks of the pandemic? What are they doing? And sure enough, um, by checking uh, records that every foreign government is required to file in Washington, we could see all kinds of foreign government lobbying was beginning in the United States as countries were trying to burnish their reputations, as company, countries were trying to uh, curry favor, um, as uh, countries were trying to do things like prevent travel restrictions, uh, we could see the lobbying beginning. And, and I believe we were the first news organization to begin to show how foreign governments were trying to pressure the Trump administration um, through lobbying efforts. And this was one of our stories documenting that effort. Um, for the journalists in the audience who are wondering how to do this. Um, so in the United States, uh, there's what we call the Foreign Agent uh, Registration uh, Act. Uh, it's, it's, 
it's a pretty accessible database. Here's what it looks like. Here's the location. You search the records, and you will literally find hundreds and hundreds of records dealing with foreign countries lobbying the United States these days uh, regarding the pandemic. And here's just a few examples of the documents that you get. Now, just because you have the documents doesn't mean you have the story quite yet. You have to read through them carefully. You have to talk with experts, analyze them, make sure you understand what it is uh, that you are reading. Um, and this was just one of the stories that we were able to do. And of course, in these early weeks of the pandemic, again, it's early March, and we're, we're running on multiple tracks. Another thing that we were hearing at this early stage is, uh, is how our health system was being overrun, how doctors and nurses were being overwhelmed as patients were coming in, sick with COVID, they didn't know what to do, they're going into their supply closets, they're seeing that they do not have protective masks, they do not have protective gears. Hospitals are suddenly finding their staff around the country, uh, particularly on the coasts, working overtime, and so we're seeing anecdotal versions of that. And what we decided to do as one of our stories was to say like, okay, we're seeing an anecdotal story here, a story out of New York, a story out of Washington State. How do we go bigger on this? How do we show that this really is a national issue and not just one hospital or another hospital? And so um, I think this might have been one of the first stories that really tried to go across the country talking with doctors and nurses about the plight of what, was, what they were seeing. Um, as you can see the headline here, the system is doomed. This is some of the many remarks we got from doctors and nurses. How did we do this story so quickly? Well, one of the things we did is we pushed out a survey. Um, in this case, we used SurveyMonkey. We have other tools available, but we used SurveyMonkey because it was really quick and easy to push out on social media platforms, to push out on our own news platforms. Um, when you're, for those of you who ever thinking of surveying either on pandemic story or other stories, generally uh, for these kinds of surveys where you're searching for voices, searching for characters, searching for people who could describe things, um, it's good to keep your survey short. Um, and in this case, we kept our survey, I believe this one was about eight or nine questions. Um, starts off with some basic demographic information, but then you could see we get to the heart of the matter around questions five or six. You know, do you feel like your medical setting has taken proper precautions? You know, um, have you been asked to work with coronavirus patients without proper protective equipment? Um, describe your experiences. These are the questions that we really focused on um, to begin to do our interview. So in the course of the interview, uh, in the course of the survey, we ask people, you know, can we reach out to you? And this gave our team of reporters literally lists of doctors and nurses around the country that we could interview. So along with traditional reporting techniques you might use elsewhere, like calling doctors and nurses you know, calling doctors and nurses that seem to be uh, available, public, um, you know, this survey allowed us to get a wider range of voices. Um, you get the results like this uh, in an Excel spreadsheet. You can quickly analyze it and start reaching out to people. Um, of course, at the same time, again, all these stories in March and April are really going on simultaneously. Um, uh, people are dying. And to begin to cover that tragedy, myself and others who are familiar with doing this kind of work um, uh, began uh, hoovering up all sorts of data that allowed us to, to track the deaths that were happening in America. And one of the, you know, we have on, like, like other news organizations, we have ongoing apps that you can regularly see, infection rates and death rates around the country. Uh, one of our first stories that we did, we called it 60 Lives in 60 Days, where we tried to humanize the numbers and really make sure that our audience can realize that it's not just people in New York or people in Washington State or people in nursing homes, that it's a wide range of Americans that this disease is affecting um, and that's causing uh, people to die. And so we, it's a story that uses numbers and, and 
you know, real life stories with speaking to family members. So this was one of our early efforts of, of trying to breathe life into those numbers and really bring home the story. Um, and, and tragically, you know, this includes, for those of us working on the story, keep in mind, you know, this includes people we know. Um, so, you know, many of us working on this story knew people who contracted COVID, people who died, um, and, uh, and that's how we went about reporting all this. So there was a lot that we were all going through, both personally and professionally. Um, as we're reporting on, the, on this, of course, for those of us who are familiar with public health, health issues, we all knew that there really was a pandemic playbook that uh, administrations were supposed to be using. Um, and uh, we decided to do a deep dive on this pandemic playbook. You know, where did it come from? How long it had been around? How well it had, had it been adhered to? And uh, the answer was not uh, heartwarming. Um, there, was, there were funding cuts. There were, uh, and we could, we could track the funding and see how preparedness was being cut over the previous decade. And we could also see um, how, talking to people who had worked on the playbook, how in previous administrations, you know, it waxed and waned as far as uh, the attention that it got. Um, but we wanted to give our audience a wider look at, you know, why is the, why does the administration appear to be stumbling? You know, why are we not reacting to this quicker? And part of it had to do with how well, uh, you know, we were following the pandemic playbook. Um, again, keeping in mind, like, what are the things that we can track? What are the things that we can document? Um, one of the things that we also started taking a look at were, were federal rules and regulations. And for those who are not familiar with the United States, you know, we have laws that, you know, say we're going to have clean air or we're going to monitor campaign spending or we're going to set jail sentences or things like that. So we have laws, but then we also have regulations and regulations are then put forward by each agency. And those regulations basically say like, well, here's how we're going to interpret laws. Here's how we're, we're going to make these laws become reality. And in America, we grant agencies a lot of latitude on how to interpret laws. Um, and you can track, as a journalist, you can track uh, how regulations are being interpreted through a, a daily government uh, document called the Federal Register. Um, and we started looking at, well, how is the federal government changing in the during the coronavirus pandemic? And it was doing some rule changes that appeared to make a lot of sense that had to do with things like sick leave or, uh, you know, um, how to prevent hoarding of, of consumer products. So there were, there were federal regulations that, that, you know, were related to the pandemic. But then what we noticed were that there were a series of rule changes that were being put forward in the name of the pandemic that seemingly had nothing to do with the coronavirus pandemic. And examples of that included changing immigration rules and it included changing environmental regulations. And in both, ca in both cases, it was doing what you might have imagined under the, previ under the previous administration. It was, it was tightening immigration and it was loosening environmental oversight. Those were just some of the many examples we found in the early weeks. We're talking like the first two, three, four weeks of the pandemic. Hundreds of rule changes were occurring at the federal level that many people were not looking at because they were so busy worried about the virus itself that they didn't realize there was a branch of, federal, of the federal government that was actively working to change the way regulatory oversight was happening in our country. So again, one of the classic things we do as investigative journalists is we look at what the government says. You know, if the president makes promises about things, we want to check those out. If laws are enacted and they promise to do certain things, we want to check those out. We had several things in the early weeks of the pandemic that, um, that afforded us the opportunity to begin to check just that. So the president promised uh, 
made promises about medical coverage that if you were suffering from coronavirus, you didn't need to worry about excessive medical bills. Um, and also, uh, Congress very quickly passed the CARES Act, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, so uh, the president promised that, uh, that uh, medical bills would be taken care of, uh, and guess what? In the early weeks, it was very apparent that that was not going to be the case. Um, and we were able to see that. And how were we able to track it so quickly? Well, well, we did like what we do often in investigative reporting. We follow the documents. In this case, to learn about medical bills, you're really checking uh, the insurance industry. And to follow the insurance industry in America, unlike uh, countries in Europe where there's national health care, um, insurance is regulated state by state. So we could begin to go to different states around the country and start tracking complaints, start tracking actions being taken by insurance commissions. Um, and we could start seeing that medical bills, in fact, were not being taken care of. And then we could do things like track uh, legal uh, efforts that were occurring. So for instance, in several states, there were uh, insurance companies that were banding together with uh, attorney groups to, uh, to uh, fight efforts like these so that they could uh, get fuller payment um, uh, and get more money during the pandemic. So we could actually track things like that. And, and the bottom line then is then we could find people who thought they would be paying a very minimal medical bill and instead were being faced with thousands of dollars of, of medical bills. And there was a great fear in America that if if it was clear that you'd have to pay thousands of dollars if you, got a, if you got COVID, then you wouldn't be going to the hospital. You'd be afraid that you couldn't afford the bill. So this is a very important issue. The president promised medical uh, coverage, and it was re really clear that that was not happening on the ground. So uh, again, look for things you can measure. Um, and then there was the CARES Act. Um, the CARES Act was close to 150,000 words. And I got to tell you, I spent days reading it. And as I was reading the act, what I was trying to figure out is what are the document trails? What are the things that we can follow? How can we follow the money? How can we follow how these agencies say they're going to be working? And how can we measure how they're really working? So, uh, so this was a lengthy law. I'm not sure how many journalists read it. I know that we read it intensely. Um, on the investigative team. And we literally started building out our own scorecard. What are the agencies that will be handling the money? How will they be handling it? Um, and there's money that was going for education. It was going for colleges. It was going for hospitals. It was going to airlines. Um, so how are we going to follow this money? So we read through the law. That was the first thing. Um, and. Uh, in the United States, you can read any law very easily. Um, this is the, the site where you can read the CARES Act. Um, so when you're covering pandemic economic relief efforts, you know, first make sure you really understand the law. So when I'm talking about the CARES Act, I'm talking about the first one uh, that came through in the country, although we have followed the, the, the subsequent iterations of pandemic relief efforts. Um, and the main kinds of stories we wanted to focus on were, you know, we wanted to look at the fairness of the law. We wanted to look at, look at whether fraud was occurring, whether the money was doing what it was in seemingly intended to do. Um, and there was a lot of rhetoric happening in Congress about how the law was supposed to be working, a lot of rhetoric coming out of the administration about how the law was supposed to be working. So we were reading the law and also listening to what everyone was saying about it. So let me give you one, for exa one example. So um, in the CARES Act was money tucked away for education. And how was the money going to be handled? Well, a big chunk of it was going to go through the US Department of Education. And it was going to go to colleges. Um, in this case, we did not need to file a FOIA. But the data came to us in a horrible way. Um, it came to us through, you know, of, you know, a PDF that looked like a dog had eaten it before, uh, you know, before it had been made public. So it was difficult to read. And uh, it didn't connect to other education data. And that's important to consider because education is an area in the country where there's a lot of data, a lot of information. And we needed to build a bridge from this 
PDF that looked terribly ugly to uh, a database that told us a lot about the colleges that were receiving this money. And once we could make that connection, what we could see uh, as we looked at like we're public colleges getting this money, we're private colleges getting this money, we're for-profit colleges getting this money. What we could see was that much of the money um, uh, was, in fact, instead of going to public institutions like you might imagine it would, instead of going to community colleges, which are a bedrock of, Americans, of America's education system, actually proportionally more money was going to for-profit schools which are highly controversial. Um, they charge more money. They often have a poorer record of graduating students. And we were seeing that, um, that instead of money going to community colleges, it in fact was going to for-profit schools. And we could document that. Um, we tracked money going to hospitals. That was going through another federal agency. We tracked money going to, through the Department of Transportation to airports and airlines. Um, we also needed to file a FOIA to track how money was going to farmers in America through the Department of, Edu of Agriculture. And what we could see there um, was a little bit like what we were seeing in, in education spending, which was that money was going to agribusinesses, it was not going to small farmers. Um, and we could document that. Um, we needed to file a FOIA for that. I think we were the only news organizations to seek it, but it, it ended up with a story that I think was important to talk about what was happening in farms in America. Okay, this is a long preamble to say then we got to what was perhaps the, you know, the key part, the most well-known part of the CARES Act. In America, it's called the Paycheck Protection Program. And again, we applied classic journalistic techniques of following the money. The problem was the Trump administration was making it hard for us to do it. It wasn't telling us how this money was flowing, even though in previous government programs designed to help businesses, you could easily follow the money. They were saying, oh, we can't do it, it's too difficult. But they had clear templates because all other government lending to businesses are public record and are easy to follow. So, um, so they made it difficult, um, and they were handing out all this money. So we're saying like, okay, they're not giving us the documents easily. What other documents are available that can help us track this kind of money? And it turns out uh, one document that's really easy to check are Securities and Exchange Commission filings. These are required to be filed by every publicly traded company. And whenever they have a significant business event, they're supposed to immediately make a public filing. So we check those filings. And that allowed us to do stories about how billionaires were getting paycheck, protect, paycheck protection program loans while businesses, other businesses in America were going bankrupt. Um, we were able to also track, track how businesses connected to the Trump administration were getting $100 million worth of small business loans through this program. So we began to follow the money by checking uh, SEC filings. But we really wanted the data, and we really believed it was public. So uh, there were about a dozen news organizations in the United States, the Washington Post, the New York Times, NBC News. We all got together, we all banded together, and we went to federal court and we sued because we were, our FOIAs were not being processed in a timely manner. And, uh, and so we sued, and uh, we thought we would prevail, and indeed by uh, November, of uh, 2020, we did win. And, uh, and uh, a judge said there was no reason at all why, why journalists and the public should not be getting this information. Uh, it became public, we started going through it, and sure enough, we were finding troubling patterns once you could actually see the records. We found that there were tenants in properties owned by the Trump, Trump organization and Jared Kushner's uh, family real estate business. You know, they were getting Paycheck Protection Program loans. And that was interesting because if they were getting the Paycheck Protection Program loans, that meant that they were paying their rent to the real estate companies. And we thought that was noteworthy, but one of many things that were noteworthy. So to begin to really follow the money, we didn't just look at documents, we talked with experts. And there were a variety of experts, 
uh, auditors, uh, the, the uh, inspector general for the SBA. These, all, these people were incredibly valuable for us to begin to understand how to track the money. And one of the things that was really interesting was that when the federal government set this up, when the, uh, the Treasury Department, the Small Business Administration set this up, they, um, they created a very short loan application uh, that was not certified by a bank so much as certified by the borrower, which means you can put down what you want. And one of the first questions that they had on the loan application is, have you ever been debarred, or are you currently debarred by the federal government for getting a contract? And obviously most honest people would say, no, I've never been debarred. Debarred means you're prevented from getting a federal contract because you did something wrong. Um, so most honest players would say, no, I didn't do anything wrong. But of course the people who probably did something wrong in the past, they're being asked to swear themselves that they, you know, that they're good actors. And of course we found that, well, what we found was that people who were bad actors beforehand, guess what, they lied on their loan application and they were in fact debarred. So they started getting money and because the application process was set up in a way where there were no cross checks, there was really no way for the SBA themselves to to check and we were finding millions of dollars in paycheck protection program loans were given to companies apparently illegally and we could begin to name those companies. But it wasn't just illegalities that were happening, there were other things that seemed to run counter to the spirit of the program. We found accused hate groups getting uh, pandemic aid, white supremacist groups um, and the like. Uh, we found uh, some of the biggest churches in America, which were clearly well healed and had deep pockets. They were getting paycheck protection program loans. And remember, this program was designed to help small businesses in need, the businesses that were having trouble making a go of it. Not people with deep pockets that they could just borrow from their own reserves to get by on. Uh, we found giant companies uh, getting these loans, and some of them were essentially publicly shamed to returning the loans once their names became public. Um, and we were among the news organizations naming names and then finding the money returned back days or weeks later. Um, and then we found ways that large corporations were getting around these limits, and the most common way that we saw was using subsidiaries. So if you were a company and you let's say you were a giant umbrella company and you had seven subsidiaries, we'd find that the umbrella company would apply for a loan and so would each of the subsidiaries. And it raised questions about fairness. And then of course, there were questions about economic disparities, whether the money was going to minority owned businesses and female owned businesses um, and businesses that operated in the poor sections of towns across America. And we were seeing questions raising from that by looking at the data. So there's more and more work that's being done on this. We're currently still working on stories involving how this money was doled out. Um, so uh, again, uh, following the money, filing FOIAs, not being afraid to sue, getting the information was really crucial for us to be able to do these stories. Um, and then in addition to that, um, again, we're looking at how the federal government was working, um, and we looked at the promises that were being made. The, the other thing that we had in the United States is uh, under the Trump administration, they had uh, an effort called Operation Warp Speed. And essentially what they were promising to do was do everything they needed to address the pandemic, you know, um, reduce regulation, do what needs to get done, um, and it did some good things, that's really clear, but uh, it, there were a lot of contracts that were quickly signed because there were fears of shortages. Um, and we began to track those contracts that were done very quickly, seemingly in haste, seemingly with very little oversight, checking with the professionals, checking whether you know, the recipients are, um, you know, have a good track record. We began tracking all the different spending that was occurring. Um, 
perhaps the most famous of, of these efforts that, uh, that went south was a loan to Kodak, the company that was famous for photography and uh, cameras and film. Um, Kodak got a big loan and uh, immediately uh, the executives within Kodak, they were promised a big federal loan. And then immediately uh, there were questions whether uh, the executives within Kodak began uh, selling stock and profiting on the announcement of the news of, of that loan. There were questions about that. And then there were questions about whether Kodak was even capable of producing the chemicals that it was promising to produce um, as part of the COVID response. So was the company even able to do so? That, there were a lot of news organizations on that one. So while everyone else was covering Kodak, we decided to look at some of the other loans. And one of the ones that struck us was a company that promised to make injection needles. And for a brief moment in time, there was a concern whether the United States would have enough injection needles. Turns out we're, we ended up being perfectly fine on injection needles, but there was a clear concern at one point. And there were contracts being meted out. And one contract went to this company called Apoject, which is a really interesting company and has kind of an interesting history. But in the United States, here's the thing you need to know. Their injection needle was so different that it was not approved by the federal government for use. So this is a needle that no doctor and no hospital could use on any patient because it was not approved by our regulators, the Food and Drug Administration. Yet even though it did not have an approved needle at that time, and I believe it still does not, I don't, I don't know about at this moment, but even though it did not have an approved needle, the federal government created for this company a series of loans and contracts that if you added it all up, the upside of those contracts could conceivably reach more than a billion dollars. And that was really interesting um, to find out why and how this happened. And so, uh, so we started checking this company as yet another example about you know, raising questions about how the government was spending its money uh, during this pandemic. So that's an example of some of the ways we did our investigative coverage um, at NBC News. And again, we continue to do so. So um, I hope that's helpful to you all out there. Indeed it was, Andy. Thank you so much for, for that. Uh, that's some impressive work you've, <laughs> you've done over, this, uh, over the course of this, this pandemic. Now, uh, one thing I was thinking about uh, listening to you um, is how much the landscape has changed during the course of uh, well, what it was like before and the, the things you faced uh, having to cover this. Uh, and one that we also touched upon earlier today is this uh, notion of partisanship in news coverage of, right. uh, of a general health crisis that affects everyone. And while you were doing this work and following the money, digging up these documents, uh, all journalists in the US covering these issues were facing pushback from the Trump government. How did you experience that pushback? Because I w I'm assuming that that's quite different from, from the kind of government pushback that you had experienced before. Uh, it is different. We've certainly gotten pushback from administrations of both parties in the past on you know, previous investigations, but we did get a lot of pushback. Um, partisanship in America, though, runs more than just like, say, a Republican operative who you may be calling at a particular agency like Department of Education. You know, they may you know, th those people may get your requests and just ignore you, not respond to you, not give you information, not answer your questions. Um, but the partisanship also was running in other ways across America. So that if you're, you know, if you're interviewing doctors and nurses, people, you know, seemingly what would be medical questions could all of a sudden take on political overtones. You know, why are you asking these questions about whether there's enough protective equipment? You're, you know, you're part of, you know, the mainstream media and all that evil that they perceive that to entail. So even asking simple questions that seem relatively neutral, you know, do you as a doctor or nurse have all you need? That can take on all kinds of political freight as well. And a lot of nasty words are said. I mean, you can get cursed at, you can get yelled at, you can 
get people calling you everything under the sun. Mm. Yeah. But that, that must be frustrating because you're, you're dealing with facts and you're dealing with numbers and you're dealing with something as close to, to reality as you can find. And then uh, the whole country, and I guess many other countries as well, have been moving into this post-truth world where you can choose your own reality, choose your own facts. Uh, what is it like to work in that kind of environment where, where, where the truth doesn't really have the same place as it used to? Yeah, difficult. Can I give a one-word <laughs> answer? <laughs> yeah, you just keep trying to do your job. You know, you just keep trying to, to do what you're doing, but there's no doubt it gets harder and harder. And, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, at the same time we're doing all these stories, you know, pre-pandemic, we would be in the office. We would be able to talk to our colleagues, kick around ideas, figure out what we're missing. We're all now scattered, you know, into our homes around, you know, around the city, around the country. So even our workflow became really hard. And then, you know, I personally knew people who died. You're worried about family members and their health and their mental health. And you're worried about friends and how they're dealing with all this. So there were a lot of stresses that we were all dealing with. Um, and it's really hard to diminish all of that while you're getting yelled at, you know, while you're being called all sorts of names. So it ran on multiple levels. Mm. In the initial phase of the pandemic, how did you organize yourself and the investigative team? You were sitting in different offices in your homes. Yeah, so we would, we would do the classic things that I guess now we're used to, but back then we were not terribly used to, which is, you know, okay, we're having a Zoom meeting. Okay, and like, what is, what's going to be our, essentially our shopping list? What are the things we're going to work on and how are we going to split up? So, you know, myself and several people, we were the ones going through all these kinds of federal records that I was describing and how we'd be tracking it. But we had like a different team that was like looking at the effects of the pandemic. So you would have to like sometimes drop what you're doing. It's like, great, I'm meeting with that team. This is the team tracking deaths and infections and hospitalizations. And so we would break into teams and then have like a priority list that we would sort through. And would we sometimes disagree what that priority list would look like? Absolutely. But we were all trying to figure out what are the best stories, the most important stories, and particularly on the investigative team, what are the value added stories? You have to have faith in your colleagues that they're doing the day by day stories. So what are the things that you can bring that are not being discussed, that are not being examined? But now looking back uh, in, the, in the initial phase, uh, was there something you would have done differently? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. And I got to tell you, it, it went by in such a blur that when I was preparing this PowerPoint for you, there literally were stories that I'd forgotten I had done <laughs> because you were just running on no sleep, running on multiple tracks. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's like, oh, we did do that story. And look, we did it like three weeks after the pandemic began. So um, were there things that we wish we had done? You know, sometimes I you know, knowing how we were going to win, I really felt we were going to win the lawsuit on the Paycheck Protection Program. I wish we had su sued quicker, you know, but our lawyers were like, no, let's give the administration a few more weeks to respond. And I just felt like every week that was ticking by was another week where we were not getting valuable information for the American public. Because um, I thought the law was clearly on our side. So there are things I probably felt we, we might have been doing quicker. But we were all doing so much. And by the way, during everything I described to you, we were still working. I was working. I was our lead reporter on the FinCEN files. So we had other investigations that we still were deciding to keep going forward on. So there were a lot of things that we were juggling. Andy, thank you so much for, for this presentation and for giving us an insight into uh, what it's been like for you to, for co to cover this pandemic. And, and one thing you, 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 uh, you talked about was how there have been actors operating in, say, the gray zone of legality, uh, taking advantage of this pandemic. And that's, uh, that's the next topic we're going to deal with in uh, this masterclass as well, Maria. Yes, and now there is a Norwegian journalist coming uh, up on the stage. Um, I, I will just read you the opening uh, of the article. It is 3rd March 2021, and the moment of truth for Minister of Health Kwaku Algren Manu. 
A flight from the Emirates is taxiing to the terminal in Accra, capital of Ghana, where the Minister of Health is waiting. Out step two men. One is a sheikh and second cousin of the ruler of Dubai. The other has been on the run from the Norwegian police for years. Boxes containing a total of 16,000 doses of Russian Sputnik vaccines are unloaded from the plane and places in front and placed in front of the Minister of Health. This is the opening of the article, as I said, but... Uh, it's a good opening. It's a good opening. Mm. And of course, you have to read the rest of it <laughs> after such an opening. But uh, here, we have more of the story in uh, this video from VG. De har reist rundt til fattige land i privatfly og solgt koronavaksiner til overpris. En er sjeik, den andre er etterlyst av norsk politi. Om jeg har tjent penger på det, jeg har gitt tjent penger på de avtaler. Det er ingen ting som jeg skjønner ut i noe døde. Det avslørte VG i mai 2021. Pandemien skapte en kamp om vaksiner. Verdens rike og mektige land fikk først, mens andre fortsatt venter. Det har skapt et gråmarked der lysige aktører har kunnet forlange opp mot dobbel pris for vaksinene. Vaksinene kommer fra Russland via de arabiske emirater. De er solgt til land som Ghana, Kenya, Libanon, Pakistan og Guyana. De har blitt lagt behind by the rest of the world. Verdens helseorganisasjon er bekymret for at vi får en todel pandemi. En del av verden har fått vaksiner og avsluttet smittetiltak. Den andre delen jakter desperat på vaksiner og drives inn i gråmarkedet. Hvis jeg forteller deg hvor mange som tjente penger på det, så er det så galt rundt i det som er galt. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Marcus uh, Tobiasen. I'm a reporter with uh, VG, which is uh, the largest Norwegian newspaper, uh, which has had a sizable team covering the pandemic, uh, which has done a lot of good work. And the truth is, I've not been part of that. Uh, but I have been part of this one story, which at the core of it is about how middlemen have been selling uh, COVID vaccines at inflated prices. Um, this story starts in April of this year, but to make sense of it, I'll start with a short detour just to uh, make you acquainted with some of the characters uh, which will ex to make sense uh, of what kind of people have been involved in international vaccine sales. And I'll skip repeating the video. Um, so this man is Umar Farouk Sahar. Uh, he is a Pakistani national who grew up in Norway, and he's had quite a career. In 2003, he was convicted of embezzlement, but he didn't serve a day's time because he skipped the country before he went to jail. In 2004, he was charged with making a fake bank in Switzerland, but once again, uh, he eluded the authorities, and the case was later dropped because it re reached the statute of limitations. Then, uh, in 2010, a woman dressed as the widow of a rich uh, heiress to uh, a large company in Norway walks into a bank, making away with uh, money equivalent to about 10 million US dollars. Um, the money end up here in Dubai, which has become the uh, hub of Umar Farouk Sahor, which, where he has been staying for a number of years. He is named as the, uh, he is indicted as the, or charged as the main man because behind this, uh, one of the largest uh, fraud cases uh, in Norwegian history, where he has been living ever since. In Dubai, uh, he met this man, Sheikh Ahmed Al Muk Al Maktoum, uh, who is a junior member of the ruling family of Dubai, the Al Maktoum family. The two of them went into business together. Um, focusing mainly on deals they could make in Africa, Southeast Asia, and South America. And in uh, 2016, no, sorry, 2015, uh, Ghana in Africa was facing an energy crisis. And at the time, the Sheikh and Umar Farouk Sahor, through a company named Ameri, they made an energy deal where they sold the country hugely inflated uh, or rented them hugely uh, gas turbines at enormously inflated prices. 
Then fast forward to 2019 and 2020, or sorry, 2020, and Ghana found itself in a new crisis, a pandemic crisis. Um, like almost, or like all African countries and a num number of other countries, Ghana had no vaccine uh, production themselves, and they essentially had three ways to get corona vaccines. They had the international uh, alliance programs, the COVAX distribution program. Uh, they had their cooperation through the African Union. And other than that, they were left to make uh, direct bilateral deals. The two first alternatives were almost exclusively dependent on the uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. And through the COVAX program, Ghana was able to get almost uh, 1 million vaccines in early 2021. But then a uh, disaster hit in India, which basically uh, crippled the distribution and production of AstraZeneca vaccines. And uh, the people of Ghana who had gotten their first dosage, they were not able to get their second shot. And there were still 29 million people who hadn't gotten their first shot. And in this new crisis in Ghana, the same Sheikh reappears in April. This is Sheikh Ahmed al uh, Al Maktoum, together with the health minister of uh, Ghana, um, where he showed up with a lot or a, with a small sample of Russian Sputnik vaccine, promising that he could supply them this and a lot more. And this brings us to the first event that sparked our interest in this. Uh, my colleague uh, Rolf Vidra, he has been tracking Umar Farouk Sahor for a number of years, ever since uh, his first crimes. And there was a short opinion piece published in Ghana that received very little attention, but that mentioned that Umar Farouk Sahor had been present for uh, the negotiations of this deal. And that was the first, uh, first event that sparked our interest. Then, almost at the same time, a second event happened. We were given an audio recording. And, uh, it is in Norwegian, but I'll play it briefly for you. And there seems to be no audio on it. So I'll skip it and I'll go to the text. This is a short summary of the audio recording we were given in which a man says, I have arranged for vaccines. I was a go-between and conveyed vaccines to Ghana. I routed them, I had Stephen route them, bought five million doses, and if I were to tell you how many people made money from it, you wouldn't believe it was true. This conversation happened at a time uh, when no details of this deal was made public. And who was the man making these statements? It was this guy. This is Per Morten Hansen. Uh, he's a Norwegian businessman of dubious renown. Uh, he worked in restaurants, he worked in uh, nightlife, where he went back bankrupt several times. He was convicted uh, of um, handling stolen goods amongst this famous uh, litigraphy of uh, Edward Munch. And later he left the country, uh, he situated himself in London, where he's acted as a deal broker uh, for a number of wealthy people, um, most notably a number of wealthy Russian oligarchs. For example, when the son of Roman Abramovich, Arkady Abramovich, tried to buy the football club of uh, FC Copenhagen, he was the point man for uh, Abramovich's son. Today, as I mentioned, he lives in uh, London. He has an ongoing uh, feud with the Norwegian tax authorities. And just this morning, actually, we broke the news that he is now charged with money laundering related to uh, a case where a Belgian uh, business CEO was defrauded. And this man had somehow intimate knowledge of the vaccine deal. He claimed to have been a part of it. And more than that, he mentioned another people, um, um, another name, a man named Stephen. Uh, who is this Stephen? Um, it's this guy, Stephen Segal, uh, who you might have seen in uh, a number of uh, somewhat well-received action films from the 90s. 
who since 2018 has been a special envoy uh, of Russia, where he now also holds uh, citizenship. Um, he is a longtime friend of Per Morten Hansen. Um, and he also knows Sheikh Ahmed al Mukal Maktoum. As early as 2019, he was invited to the office of the Sheikh to discuss business opportunities, according to a letter we obtained sent from the Sheikh himself. Uh, and here is also a picture of him together with uh, Umar Farouk Sahor. So these two events, uh, quite short in time, in April of this year, sparked our interest in this. Uh, and we set about discovering whether or not it was true that Umar Farouk Sahor had been a part of this deal in Ghana. And if so, what was the price that the Ghanaian government had paid for these vaccines? So our first step was to go to Ghana, uh, which was currently uh, experiencing another wave of uh, coronavirus. Um, one of the first things we came across there was that there had been very little publicity about these vaccines. Whereas the COVAX deal and the COVAX deliveries received huge national press, there had been almost no press regarding the sale of these Sputnik vaccines. But we were able through sources to find employees at the airport who had pictures from the event. And this is the small uh, first shipment that was delivered. Um, and in the picture, we can see the health minister of Ghana again. And we can see uh, what looks like Umar Farouk Sahor. And later, through, uh, through conversation with security personnel at the airport, we were able to confirm that Umar Farouk Sahor was present as this delivery. In Ghana, and I'll talk a bit about this as we go on, that I said, it's me and my colleague Wolf has been doing this story, but we've received tremendous help from journalists around the globe. In Ghana, we worked uh, with Frederick Aziyama, as you can see on, uh, sitting on the left here, um, which we didn't know uh, beforehand, uh, but he has been a tremendous help while we were in Ghana. He was able to help us secure an appointment with the health minister of Ghana. Uh, we went to his office and we were left there until it was dark. They would not speak to us after all. Uh, and this was a recurring theme while we were there. There were very few people who had any information about this. And normally, uh, any international agreement would have to go through the parliament. That is the law. Uh, that is uh, uh, a part of the constitution of Ghana. In this case, it had not happened, uh, which later caused a huge debacle, but the excuse that was made were emergency protocol granted by the pandemic, that that gave them some leeway in not informing the greater government about this. But we were, uh, in the end, able to meet with uh, bureaucrats in the finance ministry, your finance minister, Ken Oforiata, um, after a long wait, uh, where we were able to get numbers on the price. And then I should also say that the Russians, they have been very clear on the prices that they've been selling their Sputnik vaccines for in direct deals. Some of them have also been made public, and we had, which meant we had access to them. These are the deals for the countries of Hungary and Slovakia, Slovakia, where we knew that when the Russians were making direct deals, they were selling at just below $10 per dose, meaning $20 for a full two-set dose. And we discovered that in Ghana, the resellers had been selling for $20 per shot, meaning uh, a double price for a full vaccine. So this was the initial offset of our story. Uh, but our next question, of course, was, um, was this only happening in Ghana? Probably not. And from there on, we worked from two, uh, two sets uh, or like two trajectories. One was that we went through areas and countries we knew that Sheikh Al Maktoum and uh, Umar Farouk Sahor had had previous dealings. Secondly, we started working with the international vaccine networks, uh, in which we had an, uh, a lucky advantage in that Norway had a leading role in, amongst other Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, Act A, the accelerator dealing with the pandemic, and also the COVAX program, the International Vaccine Distribution Program. So one of the first countries we looked at was Pakistan, where we discovered that early on that, yeah, someone was selling, in, selling a Russian Sputnik vaccine here in private clinics at a huge influx in, in pricing. And uh, we discovered that Transparency International had raised red flags with the prices that these local national distributors were asking 
to be allowed to sell at. They were asking to be allowed to sell at a price of $54 per dose. That didn't mean that whoever was supplying them was charging that, but that was what they were asking regulators to be allowed to uh, sell for when they were selling to private clinics in Pakistan. But to the uh, regulatory authorities, uh, drug, drug regulatory authorities in Pakistan, we were able to obtain meetings of their board meetings in which the process of who was reselling here was also explained. And once again, it turned out it was Sheikh Ahmed Al Maktoum who had supplied these vaccines as well. And there was also a mention that he was an appointed sales agent of another company called Orogolf. And I'll just mention the name because I'll be coming back to that, this company named Orogolf. And uh, through court documents uh, filed in Karachi, where there was a dispute about whether or not these local resellers were, be, were to be allowed to charge so much for the vaccines, we were able to obtain details on what the Sheikh was selling for to these local resellers in Pakistan. And once again, it was $45 per total unit, meaning $22.5 per single shot, more than double the price of what they would have gotten if they were doing direct deals with the Russians. In uh, Iraq, uh, you have the National Procurement Office of Kemadia. Uh, we were also able to obtain sales list. Once again, it was the same company coming up, Oragolf, and once again at double the price. Another country we knew that, uh, yeah, or sorry, a short detail here. Through the vaccine networks, we were able to get in contact with uh, procurement officers in South Africa. And while they hadn't been buying, they had been approached by a number of people claiming to have vaccines. Uh, none of them were the shake, but when we started looking at the paper trail of who were behind them again, once again, we came across the company Eurogolf acting to Sheikh Ahmed Abdal Maktoum as a reseller. We knew the Sheikh and Umar had been, uh, Umar Farouk Zahor had been to Guyana in South uh, America um, in late 2020, because we had seen pictures and press releases of the two of them arriving in a private jet, being greeted by a government delegation, and later visiting with the uh, president of uh, Guyana. Um, what we did in Guyana is that we teamed up with a local journalist called Kurt Campbell, uh, and he went to confront the, uh, the vice president of Guyana, asking both about the procurement process, but also about the price. Um, and I'll, pl I'll play the clip from a, from a press conference he went to, because I think it, it illustrates why governments would go into negotiations and actually do agreements with these kind of characters. And hopefully we have sound now. I just wanted clarity on whether you were part of the negotiations to purchase the Sputnik V vaccine. And if you were, can you name the company in the UEA that the government has purchased the vaccines? Uh, the thing is that the first set of vaccine, um, from what I got, it was, was $20 per dose. We, the key issue is we're not, we're not, we looked around the United States. We couldn't get any vaccine. We could, um, we asked Europe, we tried to COVAX, nowhere. So then the, there's a company associated with the prince from du Dubai who came here. I don't know the, the exact name of the company. Is, is but it Golf? I don't know the exact name of the company because the permanent secretary can give you that. They did the transaction, but I know that they were supplying Africa so, and some other countries, and, and they had limited supplies too. So we were pressing them to sell us some vaccine. Well, at that stage, we probably would have paid anything if we had just to get some vaccines to our people because we're not getting from anyone else. This is a recurring uh, theme in, in the deals we investigated, that these were countries and governments that found themselves in a desperate situation, 
where they were not getting any assurances from any Western countries, they were not getting deliveries to vaccine alliances, and they had trouble making direct deals themselves because uh, their requests were not, uh, they didn't get a response. And I would also mention another special thing that, that occurred to journalists who helped us. Just for asking these questions, he was sent ho home on leave for a week just for asking critical questions uh, of the pandemic handling. It did not go well with his uh, workplace, which was a, uh, what I would call a government-friendly uh, press institution, um, which gave us some perspective of what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, lux luxurious and privileged po position we found ourselves in, in when we were covering this pandemic. Um, at this point, we had uh, published uh, our first articles, um, and at the time, uh, the Moscow Times uh, reached out to us, uh, the journalist Pyotr Sauer. Uh, they were able to identify uh, another couple of deals that we had not been able to, uh, to find, amongst other one in uh, Lebanon, in which um, a wealthy businessman uh, with uh, ties to the, the Russian Business Council uh, had he been able to make a deal, but once again then he had also been directed to the company of Orogulf. Uh, so he wasn't, even though he had Russian connections, he was told that he had to go to this company Orogulf. Uh, they also found a deal in uh, Kenya that ended up not going through, but where there had been uh, negotiations and signed, but where there were red flags raised around the deal, which was then later cancelled. But the common theme to all of this was you had the, the Russians, they've been selling their vaccines to their uh, money fund, the Russian Direct Investment Fund, which has a subsidiary company called Human Vaccine LLC, which is the, uh, the signatory on all direct deals they've been making. And it was clear from the document trails that we saw that the Russian Direct Investment Fund had made some sort of exclusive agreement with this company called Oragulf, which in turn had appointed the Sheikh, working together with Umar Farouk Sahor as sort of a sales agent making these individual deals with country A, B, and C. So, what was this company, Oragulf? Um, just from open research, we were able to tell it was, it was quite a, a newly incorporated com company only in October of uh, last year. Uh, other than then, there was very little available information. They had a short website that mentioned that they uh, operated three vaccine distribution centers in uh, Abu Dhabi, off the Emirates, where they were also incorporated. Uh, we sent someone to those vaccine centers. It didn't help us much. Uh, we also had help from through the Global Investigative Journalist uh, Network, uh, where Mohammed Kmani of Jordan helped us. Uh, but truth be told, we were not able to get my, uh, anywhere on the ownership of this company. And um, while this information is sort of public in uh, the Emirates, it is based on having relations uh, and going to the ministries there. So what we had to do here was, uh, um, was to uh, hire the help of uh, a private firm specializing in both mapping up uh, royal family connections, but also ownership structures in the Gulf states. And then we were able to get uh, a piece of paper taking us one step further, saying that the company of Oragolf was wholly owned by another subsidiary in the Emirates called Vadi Al Cida Commercial, which didn't tell us much. But what we also know is that, uh, what we at least learned was that there are announcements made in local public newspapers in the Emirates uh, dealing with uh, changes in company structures. So we were able to find one such uh, announcement which told us that that company again, Vadi Al Cedar, was owned by two other companies, 50-50, uh, Infinity Wave Holding and Chimera Investment. Now, Infinity Wave Holding ended up pointing to ownership in what is known as a free zone in the United Arab Emirates, which is basically tax havens uh, with uh, very limited to no, no uh, uh, transparency. So that's a dead end. The truth is we still don't know who owns 50% of Oragolf indirectly. But Chimera Investment was a company we'd come across before. We had freight documents from Pakistan for a delivery of Sputnik vaccines. 
And they actually mentioned the a company Chimera Investment, and they mentioned that this company was located in the building of something called the Royal Group. And later, we were also able to establish that Chimera Investment was jointly owned by two companies, Royal Group Holding LLC and Group Companies Management LLC. And then, uh, of course, the question becomes, who is the sole or the main benefactor of these two companies? Um, and the truth is, it's that guy, the guy you can see in the main picture here. His name is, and uh, this is a story we're actually planning to publish in the near future, but I'll, I'll share some of it. This is uh, Tanun uh, bin Sayyid Al Nayan. He is the national security advisor of the Emirates. He is the brother of the crown, crown prince and de facto ruler of the Emirates, uh, Mohammed bin Sayyid Al Nayan. Uh, you might have heard of his other younger brother who owns the club uh, Manchester City, the football club. He is uh, essentially part of a leading triumvirate controlling, governing much of the Emirates. Um, and this realization made us, uh, made us understand that what we were looking at was not only a, a for-profit uh, enterprise, um, but it was likely also vaccine diplomacy. Uh, we were dealing with, uh, with uh, I would say that the Emirates operates in a, in a way that is uh, where, where private companies governed by the ruling family and the government itself, there were some very, very blurred lines there. Uh, Tanun Al Nayan, for example, he operates the, sorry, <laughs> operates uh, the main uh, weapon supplier of the United Emirates. He, is, he sits on the National Security Councils. Uh, companies that he control privately are closely linked to the security forces, their signal intelligence, and so on. Um, and where we are now, we can basically establish that the Russian Direct Investment Fund has given some sort of uh, some sort of exclusive license to Tanun and by effect the Emirates for reselling their vaccines in large part of the country, in a large part of the world, sorry. Um, the exact motives for these deals, we cannot, uh, we cannot conclude on because none of these people are willing to speak with us. Um, but, but it seems clear that there is an element here of gaining influence, of gaining political soft power. But it should be noted that if that was the plan, it has so far failed because the Russians have not been able to supply the vaccine at an appropriate time. So a lot of these deals have later on fallen through because the, the initial deliveries that I mentioned, for example, the 20,000 vaccines in Ghana, they were not, never followed up by the millions of vaccines they promised. And so when these deals, uh, when we broke the news of the, the, these deals, for example, in Ghana, uh, it created a huge backlash in which the government later now has rescinded the deal and clawed back the money that they paid the sheikh. Um, I think I'll stop there. I'm almost out of time, if that's right. Thank you so much, Marcus, and, and congratulations on, uh, on a thrilling and fascinating and, uh, and a bit disturbing story when you see how this uh, international system of, uh, of vaccine distribution actually happens on the ground. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a massively impressive piece of journalism. Now, um, y you talk a lot about this network of, uh, of journalists around the world that you, you had to lean on and to receive help from. And some of that is through the big organizations. But could you talk a bit more about that? How do you build up a network of, of people who can help you out in a story like that? And, and, uh, and how, do they, uh, how do they go about actually helping you? Yeah. Um, I'll say that we have almost, uh, even in the case I mentioned, Mohammed Kamani, who is a part of a, a large network, uh, we didn't go to any networks at all. And we only knew a few of these people. Uh, I mentioned Frederick Aziyama in uh, Ghana, him we did not know, we knew uh, Manasseh Asore, who we also worked with there. But the truth is we only knew a few, we went by reference. I mean, we spoke with people who knew people, who uh, recommended people, 
and our initial instinct was to be open and trusting, and uh, as open as we could be. Um, and I would say that we tried to sort of move fast in that we were willing to cooperate with anyone who would be willing to cooperate with us. And if it worked well, we got the feeling of that. Sometimes it didn't work as well, or it didn't, it didn't uh, progress enough. And then we sort of dropped it. So it was sort of, uh, I would say it was an on-the-go thing. Uh, but where our initial like uh, frame of mind was to always be seeking these cooperations and also be welcoming them when later on when we published and people were contacting us. Uh, we also had help in, uh, I didn't mention that, but we had help in Pakistan as well from, uh, uh, oh, um, from, um, I'm forgetting the name, but uh, I have it from here. Local journalist in Yeah, in Ariba Shaid was one of the journalists who helped us there. Uh, also another person, I'm not sure if I should mention that. That's an interesting thing in Pakistan as well. I mentioned what happened in Guyana, but we had, uh, in Pakistan, we had a, the, the question that the, uh, the military was involved in some of these procurement, which is uh, sort of a, a large security issue for journalists working in Pakistan. It's something that is incredibly hard for them to write on. And that was a recurring theme that we found that we found ourselves in a position where we were much more free to write about these issues, even though they didn't face our country, but where it was often a political hotbed or at least uh, something that you would risk facing repercussions for if you were to write about it locally. Yeah, what happened to, you mentioned this one journalist in, in Guyana who, uh, who, who, who had to uh, take a, a weeks on, of uh, involuntary uh, free from his uh, job. What happened to him afterwards? Well, luckily it wasn't worse than that. Um, and as he said, he would much rather be part of such a story than, than not. But, uh, but it was an eye opener for someone who rarely risks very much or who rarely risks very little doing journalism. That, that is not the case uh, when we were working with these other colleagues of us internationally. Hmm. And, and you and your team, you were, uh, you were threatened with a lawsuit from this Norwegian businessman uh, yes. for publishing uh, uh, this audio tape. Uh, did that lawsuit happen? No, I should mention, and that is important, uh, both Per Morten Hansen, the businessman mentioned here, and Steven Zagal, they deny any involvement in this trade. Uh, per Morten Hansen also denied making any of those comments that you heard, or that you didn't hear, but would have heard if you played the <laughs> tape, uh, up until the point where he was confronted with the, with the fact that it was on tape. And then he made the explanation that this was some sort of clever ruse to uh, out the source. Uh, but of course, he had intimate knowledge uh, of the deal, but the exact nature of his involvement is still unclear. We can't conclude on that. And it is true that uh, the, they have uh, the same lawyer, Steven Segal and Per Morten Hansen, they threatened with a lawsuit. Uh, it has not uh, come to pass. Mm. It's an unbelievable story, uh, literally speaking. And so uh, how does a story like this come about? Uh, where, where did you start? Well, as I steps? mentioned, there were these two, these two starting events. And to be fair, it is, that, is not my, uh, that is not my work. It is my colleague, Rolf Wiedro, who isn't here today. He has been covering uh, Umar Froxtohor for a decade. And it is the fact that he hasn't let that story go, who, through a Google alert, uh, he was alerted to that blog piece in uh, Ghana. Uh, and it was his work that brought us this uh, audio recording as well, which was a lot about a lot of other things as well, but where we were able to then connect these two details. Mm. So I would say it is, uh, it is that is uh, his his work, and and the only thing I could be say to explain why explain it is uh, twenty years of of work that he has done on uh, on crime, both nationally and internationally. One thing that I find fa fascinating in, in your story is this perspective from the countries that are receiving the vaccines and that you, you, you clearly sort of bring to attention their, uh, their perspective that they just need vaccines because they're not getting them from anywhere else. So it's understandable that they're doing whatever they can to, to get them. Uh, but then on the other hand, you have these, these countries and these businessmen who are operating in, uh, uh, shall we say, the, the, the shady sides of, uh, of how things are, are, are done. Uh, we have, uh, and, and you have now exposed a lot of this. Uh, have you 
gotten any reactions from any of these big sort of state or, or non-state actors? No. Uh, truth be told, no. Um, <laughs> I think we are... Uh, I mean, um, we mainly publish in Norwegian. Uh, we did publish an, an English version of this article mainly to reach out to international journalists. I think some of the stories uh, they have put out afterwards has gotten a lot more international attention. Uh, and they are bigger, bigger publishing houses. Uh, so I don't, and I don't know what kind of uh, response they've been getting, but uh, truth be told, no, we haven't gotten any. Hmm. Well, Marcus, thank you so much for, for participating in this uh, masterclass and for, for uh, giving us some of the background for how this story came about and, and how, how you worked. It's been, uh, it's fascinating. And uh, as we'll see now, um, uh, this is not the only place in the world where uh, things have been happening on the, on the shadier side of things. We're, we're going to Romania now, where uh, there has been a lot of different ways of distributing. We're not talking about vaccines now, but health equipment. And uh, we're, we're going to have a presentation from two of the journalists who have helped expose uh, corruption and, uh, and things that weren't supposed to happen in, in this system. Because where there is great demand for health equ equipment, there is also um, uh, usually a criminal market growing. And we have two great journalists with us from Romania, uh, Andre Ciurcano uh, <laughs> and Anna Pernario. You have gone uh, undercover to to uh, investigate how, how uh, organized crime uh, evolved during the pandemic. And uh, you are from the RISE project, OCCRP, have also collaborated. This is an organized crime and corruption reporting project, collaborating uh, around the world, actually. So uh, we'll first have a video of their uh, reporting and uh, undercover work. Let's take a look. Radu, primul intermediar, are afaceri în domeniul echipamentelor medicale și de protecție. Eu am vorbit cu cineva care la rândul lui îl cunoaște pe vânzător. Vă duc la fața locului, dumneavoastră o vedeți, alegeți dacă este ok. okay. Cineva cu care am mai colaborat ah, okay, și, mă rog, e un intermediar care cunoaște mai mulți vânzători. Trebuie să ajungem la benzinaria Moldă, pe șoseaua Colentina. Ah, ok. Ok. Pretindem că suntem oameni de afaceri, nu jurnaliști. Vrem chipurile să cumpărăm 2,5 milioane de măști și ne trezim rapid în mijlocul unei rețele subterane. Mai multe grupări aduc și distribuie în România măști chinezești cu certificate contrafăcute. Ai vorbit? Da, am sunat pe ăsta care e Marius, care vine cu măști și pe un 7 minute ajunge. Și pe când ajunge aici, ce spune? La prima oprire, intermediarii apar unul după altul. Aflăm că există mai multe locații și că sunt grupați în echipe. Fiecare trage la comisionul lui. Marius Hrescu, al doilea intermediar, locuiește în București și a absolvit facultatea. Um, hello, um, before, before going to uh, this operation, this undercover operation, Uh, we had a different, uh, with a, f a different uh, material published, um, which started from a doctor, uh, which was working in a hospital, and basically the person was saying to us that the masks are breaking, and that they cannot use them. So what we did is that um, the the doctor sent me a picture with the boxes of masks. Uh, and we did the story in a different way than we used to do it before, meaning that first we searched for the producers who were based in Turkey, 
Then we found uh, custom documents showing the prices of the masks, who bought them, and then we discovered that there was an intermediary, uh, a company based in Romania who was reactivated during the pandemics. Um, and this company state the, uh, sold the masks to, to uh, the Romanian state. Um, we found that behind the company there was a woman called Simona, she used to work uh, before uh, in uh, institutions where uh, the, the prime minister at that time used to work. Um, she was also uh, related to organized crime, also convicted, and she was actually the beneficiary of the, of the uh, state contracts. Um, after we published this, uh, this story, what happened is that the authorities, the Romanian authorities, uh, opened an investigation and they discovered the bribe uh, of uh, around $800,000. Uh, um, after we published this story, something else happened, and this uh, is uh, Andre's time. <laughs> so what I would like to add is that when we started the, the, the investigation and in going undercover, we basically uh, came to the conclusion that the Romanian state was, not, was in a, a chaotic situation. We did not have the necessary and the needed equipments in the hospitals and also the, the state uh, institutions, and we were receiving loads of information from different, uh, different uh, individuals working either in the health sector or in the, in the business, uh, business one. So while we were receiving information from the health sector with, with doctors being worried not only about their security but also the, the security of, the, of their patients, we were approached also by uh, businessmen who basically invested in factories, in masks and medical equipment factories in, in Romania. And they've, they've pointed out that instead uh, instead of being supported by the Romanian state in producing good, uh, certified, quality products, um, unfortunately, Romania opened the, the, uh, um, uh, the frontiers to products made in China. And that was the point when we came to the conclusion that much of the uh, masks that were imported by Romania were imported with fake certificates we discovered, uh, I think there were around 15 or 20 certificates that we received when we basically started uh, the investigation and doing the uh, pre-documentation. It was most important to discuss with the experts because also the, the previous speakers, they've, they've pointed out the importance of having a, a, a direct and uh, non-stop communication with the specialists because also the doctors and the businessmen explained us how the, the, the sector works what we need to understand when we want to go and uh, negotiate with the, with the criminals who are uh, uh, placing uh, in the market this kind, of, uh, this kind of, uh, of products. So it was not only fake certificates, but also certificates that were issued by uh, authorities in Italy who were not allowed to do it because they were, not, uh, they were not credited. And according to the information that we have, there is a, an investigation ongoing um, concerning the, uh, the certificate of, of compliance of the guys from the uh, ASM. Okay. So what we did next, after we talked with a lot of businessmen from the market uh, for hours, uh, what did we did next is that we prepared the undercover mission, let's say, uh, meaning that first we rented a car, an expensive car, uh, in order to look like real businessmen. Um, then um, we, f me for example, I got different kind of clothes uh, in, in order to look rich, you know, exp as an expensive purse and so on. Um, and um, then we had another team with us, which was uh, following uh, us each step in order to get protected and also to, um, to film the uh, car plate number in order to identify the people we were meeting. Because before starting the undercover, the undercover mission, we didn't know who we meet. Yeah. Okay. What I would like to add to this is that why did we felt the need to go undercover? 
the the big problem is and it's it's not only a romanian problem but it's also uh, uh, it's a problem when we discuss about you know corruption in in different states where the democracy failed uh, the 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 issue is that when the state of emergency was uh, launched in Romania. All the access to public information was blocked. So basically, they used the COVID pandemic as a as a as a as a door. So they they just shut the door to uh, uh, journalists in, in in asking information about who uh, is organizing the auction for the mask. Why can't what kind of medical and protective equipment are uh, are bought? Uh, who is buying them? With what price? Uh, who are the bidders? So basically, we had the information that the market is flooded with, you know, secondhand cheap equipments, but we didn't we did not have the capacity to understand who's doing it, and with with what costs. So um, to go back to what uh, to what uh, Anna said, we 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 thought, okay, so we need to pretend that we are buyers because it's a bit more difficult to pretend that we are sellers. When you are a seller, you, you really need to know the market. You really need to define uh, what, what the, the, the masks are and all the legislation. So we, we took the, the it's, I, I wouldn't say it's the easiest path because it, it was really, really difficult. But when we decided to play the businessman role, we really thought that we are businessmen because we needed to, you know, to, to fool the guys. So back to you, Anna. Yeah, so what happened next is that we met different kind of people in different kind of uh, gas station. Um, you can see in the image uh, one of them. Then we were taken to a house uh, in, in a sector in Bucharest. Uh, and we... Uh, one second. And we enter uh, um, um, a building, a villa owned by some Chinese people. Um, and there we actually negotiated uh, uh, the mass and the conditions of the delivery and so on. Uh, what I want also to mention is that um, the people we met never recommended themselves, never said their names, not even the first names. So it was clear that something bad is happening while we're, we were doing the, the undercover. Um, and inside the house, um, there were boxes of masks, right? Um, yeah, we, we, when basically we, we, we discovered that we were, we were prepared to meet and negotiate with someone, but we met one intermediary, another intermediary, another intermediary, and we were like just like Alice going down to the rabbit hole, as in understanding that each and every one wanted a, a piece of the cake. So we that that meeting in the in the first gas station was one. It was the fourth intermediary, and when we entered, because we had no idea with whom we are going to negotiate, the the, the last intermediaries came with a really really luxurious car, and they were just like you know like thugs, and we were wondering, okay, so if we have, if we are going to do it, then we really need to do it, so we we came um, to this address where the the Chinese were located, and it looked like. It, it was not a house. It was a house from the outside. It looked like a depot. It was like you know the, the, the geese with the golden golden eggs, all all around on the boxes with certificates. And we were invited, like, okay, what kind of color do you want? What kind of certificate do you want? And we were like, oh my God! As in, this is this is one of the the streams of the of the the, the mask that are flooding Bucharest, because you know we are not talking about some thousands of masks, as in we are talking about millions of masks that these people were bringing from China with fake or counterfeit uh, uh, certificates. So yeah, like, like, like Anna said, it was really, really difficult to identify the guys because you know, when you go undercover, you cannot, you know, hi, my name is, this is my ID, can we exchange some you know, Facebook profiles, da, da, da. So uh, it was, it was impo most important for us to, to, be, to pay attention to the, uh, the gear, as in you know, to have the, the undercover, the hidden cameras working, and the, the recording, but in the same time to pay attention to all the details, as in remember the, the, uh, the plate numbers, uh, to have the address of the, the house, and also try to 
touch the base with some people as in asking, what do you do? What kind of business do you have? So that we can approach him more and more and more in trying to identify after the, the in the cover to identify the, the guys. Um, yeah, what, what really helped us uh, on, on doing this is uh, the team who was beha behind us and actually uh, was also keeping us safe. Yeah. Um, and moreover, um, the fact that they had a live location um, uh, permitted us to later uh, find out who is the owner of the house. We, we went inside and, and this is how we discovered the, the Chinese people yeah. that were behind uh, behind this house um, moreover uh, during uh, during the undercover um, one of the guys was really bragging about how good he is in his life meaning that he's a really really great businessman and he's a part of a, of a club of businessmen and this detail uh, helped us later to discover who were all the people involved um, the guy I'm talking about is the one um, the the bigger one with the glasses mm. yeah uh, so we found his uh, first we found his Facebook profile through the pictures uh, posted by the businessman club on Facebook. Uh, and this is how we identify one of his partner, uh, you, is the other guy in this picture. Um, and we actually discovered that his friend is a member of an organized crime group, a really, really big one from, uh, from Bucharest, internationally actually uh, involved in everything bad that can happen in this world, uh, starting with human trafficking. Money laundering. Exactly. Bribes and extortion. and Exactly. And, you know. uh, so we are talking about this guy called Manu the Bomber. Uh, <laughs> um, he, um, I remember that while we were documenting the story, we found the news about him that he beat it uh, Secret a service. secret service agent, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah he beat it a secret service agent with a chair in a club. Um, so we were basically f uh, in front of an organized crime group who is selling masks on the Romanian market. Uh, what I want also want to mention is that our story was that we were businessmen in connections with hospitals and state institutions, and we might need more masks to, to uh, provide them. Um, um, so they, uh, the, the group we met became really, really uh, interested. Um, and um, of course, we later tried to, to speak with every person that we met. Um, everybody was uh, first denying that they did anything wrong. And then one of the guys called us for, I don't know, seven or eight times, yes, telling to us that we are trying to destroy his life and he's a good businessman and so on. Um, what, I, what I would like to add is that these, these people, they are not ordinary thugs, as in they are not ordinary criminals, as in they are connected to the political, and they are also connected to the really, really rich businessmen, because it was not with a surprise to discover that one of the guys with whom we negotiated the, the, the masks with face certificates, he was in, in contact with one big businessman in Romania, who basically bought uh, around 120 million masks and uh, that's almost half of the, all the masks that are, were imported in 2020 by Romania. So it's, it's, it's a, a really complicated uh, organized crime group. And the, the biggest problem that we had is that, you know, it's really difficult to identify these, these, these people because you don't have auctions, you don't have documents, you don't have, as in, papers that you can obtain officially or using the sources. So that's why we had to go undercover and to, uh, to identify and to, uh, you know, understand the, 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 the patterns. Yeah. yeah. Um, what happened next after, after our, our second story on, uh, on, on the masks um, is that um, we realized we could have buy more masks than one oh, million. Definitely. Yeah. We were we were offered ten million at one yeah. point. When they yeah. started to clash, 
because they were interested about you know making a huge profits. They were like, okay, if you're interested in 10 million, I can get you. Just you know pay something in advance, and we will deliver it. Yeah. Um, moreover, they were working only with certain banks, right? Um, cash yeah. included. And cash. And yeah. Cash, yeah. 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 Um, our sources are saying that uh, there were several investigations started regarding uh, regarding uh, after we published the the, the second story. Um, other authorities were um, uh, investigating also the authority for uh, pr consumers' protections. Also, yeah. uh, opened a lot of investigations on the on the market. Um, some of uh, some of the people involved in uh, in in this mass business in Romania were sent to prison, n not to prison, were sent to trial after admitting their uh, their wrongdoings. But as we know, there are other investigations ongoing, uh, and prosecutors are still working. Um, this was not a phenomenon happening only in, in Europe. This was uh, not only in Romania, Romania, it was happening all over Europe. And Olaf also opened several investigations regarding the, 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 the market. Um, we didn't stop and we went uh, further and, and uh, investigated also all other businesses related to, to acquisitions for, for, for the COVID uh, issue. Uh, you, can, you can find out more on, on our websites. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's everything there and thank you. Well, thank you guys so much for, for that important work and for giving that presentation. Uh, first and foremost, I think, uh, why aren't you more afraid when you're doing this? I, I understand you had security when you went on, undercover, but you're dealing with some very dangerous people. Uh, how did you take care of your own safety, both during this, how could you communicate with security and, and afterwards? Um, how did you take care of yourself? Well, I think it's, I wouldn't call it security, as in there were our colleagues, so, but it's always important to share the location and to, you know, to be sure that someone knows where, where you are. But, you know, to be honest, I think uh, we, we really don't think about the, the, the threats. And on the other hand, to be honest, we were not aware that we are going to meet these kind of people. As in, we were prepared to meet some businessmen, but we were not prepared to meet you know, middlemen with connection, with connection so deep into the into the organized crimes. But on the other hand, you know, it's also dangerous to be a truck driver. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, me personally, I don't think at, at that moment we, I was so focused in, in doing the job that was that was the most important thing to to do and to extract the information mm -hmm. because you you cannot go twice there. So in, you need to squeeze the lemon as as as, as much as possible. But you know. Yeah, I, I believed at the beginning that we are going to meet some people connected to the politics. This was my belief, because ev the the signs on the on on uh, given by the people I, I knew by, by my sources was that politicians were involved. But then again, we met organized crime. What that's happening? <laughs> yeah, and in the same time, is is it was it was not only that we focused, but it was, a, a, and I think also Anna shares this this kind of feeling with me. I felt disappointed by the by the way the authorities dealt with the problem with the COVID, because you know when we were in negotiation, I was just thinking, you know, back in my mind, I was like, this is this is incredible. As in, we had two two journalists without the proper means. Uh, to, to investigate this kind of phenomenon. And it was so easy for us to identify fake certificates and to negotiate with organized crime groups. As in, why is not the, the, you know, the, the Secret Service doing it? As in, where is the police? Where is the health investigators? As in, wh wh where is the state? Because you know, it's, it's not enough to say, we need masks. As in, I can, I can take a handkerchief and put it in, in front of my nose. I, I, I can have the impression that I'm I'm protected, but it's 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 not the same. It's not the same thing. So basically, I consider that you know that the state authority, the Romanian state authority, you know, failed the Romanian society in protecting itself. And it, now it's no wonder 
that Romania is first country as a death rate in, in Europe, as in we, we are next Lombardia, an example mm. in, yeah. in Italy, and this is not only because of the vaccination. My question is, is this an effect of the you know, second-hand, low-grade equipment that was sold to the public and also to the specialists in the health sector? It might be, yeah? Mm. I want to follow up exactly that point, because did you um, try to find out if they actually functioned? Was it fake masks also, or was it just a fake certificate? Well, we tested the masks, um, and we discovered that the first one we wrote about, the, the ones with the woman who sold the masks directly to the state, well, masks which were produced in Turkey weren't good at all, like they weren't offering any protection. But the second one we went while going undercover, they were actually working, they were good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but then again, you, you cannot be sure that if you buy a lot of 20 million of masks, all the masks are going to be uh, in, in good condition and offering you protection. Because when you meet those kind of guys, they give you some samples that not, might not be in the boxes you receive after you sign the contract. So it's a shady market. The, the, um, the, the problem with the, with the certificate was a European pro problem, as I told before. It, was, it, it is a, a still an issue uh, investigated by the, the OLAF. So it, it, it was a chaos, not only in Romania. It was a chaos in Europe also, all over the world, you know. Mm. Going back to the method of going out on the cover, I'm yeah. sure you have to work on the roles because uh, to gain trust as businessmen. Uh, could you tell more about how you work on that role? Not to, you know... We pay some, as in we spend some, some weeks with the whistleblowers from the business sector and also from the health sector. But, you know, to be honest, it wasn't really that hard to penetrate because they were so hungry for the money. And they were having such a, such a big volume of masks being imported from China. As in Romania was is the country in top 10 uh, EU members that imported uh, masks from, from, from China. And they were, the, the flow was that big that they were not capable nor interested uh, nor scared to negotiate with, with, uh, with people like, uh, like us. But one thing I can tell you is that it was, a, it was a bit difficult to know where to stop with the questions, you know, because when you are meeting with the criminals, you need to understand that there is a borderline that you cannot cross, as in asking details on how to react. As in, yeah, we were like more passive aggressive, going from one extreme to another, because at one point there was, uh, there was this guy, uh, um, um, the more, uh, uh, you know, bling bling guy, who basically asked, what, but what do you do? And we would like, it, it, it's really not your concern, as in we are here to, 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 to buy the masks. And he was like, oh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, sure, sure, <laughs> sure. So it's, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's difficult. We, we love doing it undercover, so I think me and Anna, we just blend in. How much uh, money was actually involved in this business? Involved, like how much did we for, spend for? The for? No, for the business. The negotiations. Men. Yes. Yeah. Around 1 million euro. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. For mm -hmm. how many masks? I think it there was 2 million. 2 million? Yeah. With the yeah. promise that if we pay in advance, we might be sure that we get a really big transport of 10 million. After we finish this, this uh, negotiation in the gas station and in the, the Chinese owned house, we met some other guys and they were, uh, they were more aggressive than these ones. As in, we ask for proof, we ask for the certificates, and they were like, again, really, really aggressive in saying that if you are going to, uh, you know, mess up with us, we will find you. As in, we have the the the, the mask. We're, we're if you have the money, you. we will come after you if you if you don't obey the as in the the contract that we we negotiated. Hmm. So yeah. Uh, the kind of work that you've done will be difficult for many uh, smaller newspapers or media organizations. Uh, but uh, you've been able to do this through the network of OCCRP. Could you uh, tell us more about how that works, how this network of journalists operates, and how 
you're able to, to, to get these stories done? Well, well, OCCRP uh, provides um, security trainings for journalists, for the member center, first of all. Uh, we are talking here about um, digital security on, and also physical security because they are interconnected. Of course, I, we didn't use our phone number while we talked with the, the members of the organized crime group. We used a, a, a burner phone. Um, but um, this was not only the only help that OCCRP gave us, because OCCRP has a platform where you can ask the researchers to help you. For example, when we were looking for the company in China, the provider, or for, or for the Turkish provider, we were able to get information about those companies from the uh, OCCRP network, from the researchers of OCCRP. Um, it's, I know it's difficult for, for a small newsroom, but the idea is to ask for help all the time, because if you just say you cannot do it, then you'll not do it, you know. And the help is there. As in. And another thing that the OCCRP provides is trust. As in, I, I think also this is, this is important for any kind of, of journalist, as in having trust and also doing a partnership, understanding I know the objective is to discover the, 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 the organized crime groups. While, you know, the authorities is a bit more complicated with, uh, uh, you know, partnerships between authorities, um, it comes, in, you know, the, the idea of the competition, why would I work with the Romanians when I have my own problems? But when it comes to OCCRP, we are colleagues, we are uh, trust friends, and we share all, all this information, and having supporting uh, 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 support from the OCCRP, as in from the tech perspective, yeah. and also from the digital one, it's it's massive. Mm -hmm. how, how did um, uh, what kind of advantage did the other journalists in the OCCRP network have from your work? What kind of uh, advantages, or you know, uh, from how, your how, findings? How we yes. cooperate? Yeah. Um, for uh, uh, for example, if there are journalists, I don't know, in Brazil and they found a Romanian connection, then they are going to contact us and we are going to provide them with documents, with all the details. Uh, we are going to contact sources in order to make a transnational story. This is, this is OCCRP, it's, it's transnational uh, journalism. It's, it's, it's like a rogatory commission made yeah. by the prosecutors, but we are journalists. Mm. Corruption, as an organized crime group, goes global. You need to go global with the investigative platforms. So it's the exchange is that rapid. So. Are you? Can you do more undercover stories now, or are your faces too known? We are not going for undercovers just for the sake of going of to under, to do an undercover. We are doing the undercover only when it's needed. When, when it's the last solution to uncover the truth, to, to, to open the truth to the public. It's, it's, you don't do daily undercovers, it's crazy, you cannot do that. Um, and it's, 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 it's easier to do it when you realize that's the only way you can, you can say, the, say the story. Of course we are going to do yeah. other undercovers. But you have, uh, you have um, published your byline, and uh, I'm sure you are easy to find. So is it possible it's to easy use, use the method many times, actually? Yeah, because I think it, it we are not so present on the national televisions. Yeah. Our faces are not on the daily uh, news, you know. Uh, moreover, for example, there are not uh, uh, so many pictures with us in the online medium. So, and moreover, when, when doing stories on organized crimes, they have a different bubble than us, yeah. than the journalists. They will not know uh, investigative journalists that did undercover stories on different issues. They are not interested on, on that. They are interested of doing their dirty business mm -hmm. and their friends will know people from that area, from that bubble.
Anna and Andre, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, leave it there because our time is running out. But thank you so much for, for sharing this story with us. And uh, it's impressive work that you've done that's clearly had consequences. And I just want to pick up on something you said about this uh, the, the collaborating and having safety in numbers, because the next person we're going to hear from, she is standing quite alone now. She, uh, she's a Bangladeshi journalist. She, her name is uh, Rosina Islam. Uh, she uh, exposed uh, corruption and uh, misgivings in, in the Bangladeshi government, and she was punished for that uh, to a, a very, very extreme degree. Uh, she is still awaiting her trial, and in the worst uh, case, she might uh, get the death penalty for her reporting. And um, I just want to read from an email I received from her today, where she says, uh, she says, please help me, support me, cooperate as you can. I need more courage. Don't forget my situation. And to hear more about Rosina, uh, we're going to play this, this video of a conversation that I had with her, with her uh, a bit previously. Rosina Islam, uh, thank you so much for joining us in this masterclass and for participating at this, uh, this event. Now, you are based in, in Dhaka, and that's where you're uh, situated right now and where you've had your career and, and uh, lived your whole uh, life. Uh, I figured we could start with, um, with uh, describing what, what it has been like to live in Dhaka during this pandemic since, since it started. How, how did daily life change when, uh, when the virus uh, came to Bangladesh? Uh, as a journalist, I have to go out every day and uh, at home at my little daughter and husband also sick. So it's a, a challenge. It was a challenge for me. Now it's fine. But uh, when March, in March 2020, the virus was confirmed to have spread to Bangladesh. Uh, first, the first three known cases were reported on 8 March. Uh, after that, uh, this we are suffering with this virus. Mm. And I mean, you have you have a long and distinguished career behind you, um, and uh, and you you work for for the major newspaper in Dhaka. How did you become involved in in working with COVID related uh, stories? How how did that begin for you? How did I begin the story? Right. Okay. Actually, I was asked by my editor to investigate it of uh, over health service as. Uh, there were allegations of poor management towards COVID response. And uh, what kind of poor management uh, are we talking about? What, what was the uh, what was the issue that you you had to do, to look into? My major findings. Uh, I found an unholy nexus involved in the recruitment process of hundreds of disqualified applicants for the medical services. How expensive medical equipment means for COVID-19 treatment are left abandoned for months, politi political dilemma, or bargaining to collect COVID-19 vaccine from foreign friends. Hmm. And you discovered uh, a corruption. Um, it, it, how, how, how did you... Could you could you say something about your methods? How you went about finding the source, uh, uh, the sources, and the story for for such a sensitive topic like this? Okay, I focus on collecting government document, interviewing the government official and suspects, and visiting the sites. In any cases, I talked over phone. I went there. I visited there. That's the way we. I have many sources because I uh, covered. Uh, Secretary uh, last 17 years, so they helped me a lot. So your previous sources, uh, they, they helped you find this material. Um, yeah. Was was there a, a moment when you um, when you sort of understood that you had to, that you had a big story that you had to tell? What was the big break in in your uh, your pandemic reporting? Uh, it's not easy, you know. I was not so easy. I, I was confined, tortured, and arrested after me, I met a source and was on my way to get a formal comment from the authorities in health ministry. I was monitored every time I visited any office. Mm. So, we, how early did that? Uh, we'll get back to to 
your your arrest and your your mistreatment uh, in a little while. But um, if we can focus on on the stories that you 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 wrote and the information that you gathered, um, how how difficult? How early in the process did you start getting pushback from the authorities? How how early uh, did they start uh, uh, responding in a negative way to to your reporting? Actually, the government had responded positively until I exposed the unholy recruitment syndicates involving the government officials. The minister and other senior officials stopped talking to me and did not respond even when I called or sent any text seeking explanation or any comment. Hmm. But in terms of uh, gathering information, um... In Norway and in many other countries, we we it's there's a system in place where you can you can ask for for uh, public uh, official documents. Uh, if they say no, you can complain in several uh, rounds, uh, and th there is a system in place to get those documents. And if you don't get them, you, you can you can take it a step further and uh, uh, until you hopefully you get them somehow. How, how does that work in, in Bangladesh? How do you get a hold of documents in the public domain? Public domain, they have no documents. Uh, they sometimes they send a press release, something like that. And nothing special or uh, how many people infected. Uh, we have doubt also uh, in this case. They, uh, they are giving us the real data or not. Right, so everything is hidden. You have to uh, you have to dig everything out from from the ground. Yeah. Hmm. So, could you explain to me in in detail how this corruption worked? Uh, who who was getting paid, and for for what services were they uh, being bribed? Actually, uh, you want to know the my story, what I what I have written. Yes, please. Uh, okay, it was about the holy nexus of government recruitment where I exposed how disqualified people were being recruited and how bribes were offered to the official, choose to the minister, ministry himself. Like uh, one of their offi officer, uh, who is a uh, deputy secretary, he also uh, sent a letter to the secretary. He said the, the recruitment way is not good. Also, another uh, another officials from health um, uh, health uh, ministry. He also he also retained. Uh, some people want to give me the uh, given me the want to the give me the bribe. So they also uh, confined that uh, the, the process is not good. So I got that two letters, and I checked everything, and I talked, and then I I write the uh, uh, story. After that, after the, uh, the uh, like uh, Tuesday, I did it, and after Wednesday, the minister stopped to talking with me, and then mm. never he talked with me. It was happened like uh, April, and uh, the incident happened with me in Mar uh, May. Yeah, you were you were arrested in in May, and you were charged with um, with stealing state documents. Um, how did they justify that when you were? only during your, your journalistic uh, duty? They didn't say whatever, what have they done with me, like me rather they started framing me as a criminal and uh, tried to say what happened actually triggered me by, by me. They took no action against any of the official who were involved me in torturing and physically and mentally for five hours in the health ministry custody. But they uh, like share the news of confinement to all the so uh, all the sooner if it possible. Uh, uh, everywhere the same uh, spread rumor. Uh, I was a thief. I stolen their <laughs> document and I took the photo like this. Hmm. Now, how did you respond when they when they arrested you and accused you of stealing state documents? Uh. In my country, journalists and all walks of people raised their voice for me. Media outlets across the country were supported me. International organizations hmm. also sent the statement for me because everybody knows about my reporting in my country. But were you expecting this kind of uh, reprisal and uh, and this reaction from from the government when you when you wrote your stories? 
before they didn't say anything uh, they have done with me rather they started framing me as a criminal <laughs> Uh, after this, they framing me like uh, I'm not good. I did it. I I I write against them. Uh, but uh, before I was a very good reporter. <laughs> also, the information minister recommendation me. Uh, he also given me a, a award for good reporting. Right, well, that was before the pandemic. Yeah. Hmm. The incident also. So, right, but I mean you're you're. Uh, issue seems to be with the health department, and, and they were the one who who took you in. Uh, have there been other other parts of the government that have uh, that have come to your defence and who have tried to 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 help you in this situation? I, uh, that time, three or four minister they wanted to help me. Like home minister, he called health minister, information minister. He called uh, the minister, also law minister. But you know, the health minister uh, informed everything. To the prime minister and prime minister, uh, uh, they uh, they said wrongly. Like uh, one of the journalists stole in our um, um, secret documents. So uh, prime minister said, "Okay, file a case uh, against her." So when our prime minister said, "Make a file, uh, make a case," so every everybody stopped. Nobody um, want to talk about it. Also, minister was afraid to talk. Others ministers who knows me very well, uh, they some some secretary also tried, but nobody, you know, no one responds. Hmm. And how about y your newspaper? I mean, you work for the biggest newspaper in uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, how have your editors uh, reacted to to the way the government has treated you? Uh, at first, the uh, my editor was waiting. Okay, it will be solved. Um, because lots of journalists uh, came to me, they saw me, and lots of uh, like union leaders, journalist leaders, they went me. They were they were waiting until at night p.m. It, it happened like three p uh, three p.m. and until night p.m. Up after that, they started reporting. Uh, they gave the online report and and they came to me at a uh, police station and they were with me all the time. Right, so you have the support you need from. Also, they are supporting me, um, because, but hmm. uh, you know, it's uh, about government. Right, now, um, could you, uh, to to the extent that you're you're comfortable yourself, uh, could you exp uh, describe what happened when when you were arrested in May, and you were taken into custody? Uh, what happened? Actually, <laughs> I didn't want to recall the nightmare but uh, the police and the official at the ministry confined me they started uh, stated away my phones retained me from the un uh, university for hours i got fainted and my journalist colleague found me unconscious on the floor so later the ministry website published various edited and doctorate video of the confinement and tried to frame me as a criminal. The fictional social media platform is starting spreading rumors about me. After three months, some days ago, they also asked my bank statement. Hmm. So this is ongoing. I mean, you were arrested in May, they, they released you and you, you're awaiting uh, the next move from the government if, if, they, if they want to press charges. But they've also yeah. gone after your finances. Yeah, they uh, they they are uh, still they are uh, doubting me and they're checking lots of things. You know, this uh, official secret act they don't allow to uh, asking my uh, financial uh, thing, but they asked with other crimin criminals uh, my my document. So it's har it's a harassment and uh, like I I feel bad when they ask this type of actions. Also, uh, hmm. also you know the Facebook and the everywhere they leak some video. They say it like my my picture, and they say, look, okay, he she's a, she's a billionaire. She has lots of money. She right against government. Uh, she's not good. Uh, lots of things. Lots of bad. You know, online criticizing. Hmm. Why do you think they do that? Uh, is it because uh, what do you think they're afraid of, and uh, how does it affect you that they that they have this campaign against you? 
actually uh, i wrote lots I, I have written huge story about pandemic uh, time uh, like april uh, i make I, I i have written nine lady story you know lady story and all all of the story like uh, recruitment not good uh, like uh, there is a uh, lots of thing i i have written uh, so they are uh, they were angry they were angry with you, but do you think they're trying to send a signal to to other journalists as well to to yes, to stop yes. uh, doing investigative work? Yeah, because I I, I work for sec I work in the secretariat, and you know the all the journalists went to the secretariat, and now they're suffering because uh, everybody every uh, bureaucrats afraid. Uh, they are just um, they said okay. Uh, if I give you the information, my minister will uh, uh, not support it like this. Uh, and it's a signal, you know, in Bangladesh, it's a signal, I, I, I must say. Hmm. How about you? Uh, how did you respond when, first of all, when, when you were arrested and, and then afterwards when this campaign w went on? Uh, you must be afraid yourself. Yes, I am, I'm afraid, depressed and... Uh, my full family was uh, so like uh, we have nothing. We don't know anybody. Nobody, uh, nobody take their calls. Everybody is afraid to talk with me with, uh, through mobile. Uh, some, uh, some my uh, relatives uh, also government official. They, they are afraid to come at my home. So the whole situation like I started from. Uh, I have to start if I work for now uh, from now. I have to start from the beginning because uh, nobody will help me. The bureaucrats uh, didn't receive my phone. The minister didn't receive my phone. So it will be horrible for me if I again start my work. Hmm. But you're not in hiding and you're telling your story. Uh, how do how do you find the courage to do that, to, to be this open and to, to, um, to tell the world about what happened to you? Uh, sorry, pardon, again the question. How, how do you find the courage to to tell your story openly and uh, and to not go into hiding? Okay, because I know what I am. Yeah, if you are honest, if you are honest with your works, I think uh, it's it's easy to say anything because my everything is open, nothing to hide. Uh, you know, I got so many awards from Bangladesh uh, from, from my organization, and everybody knows my story. I'm clean, so I I, I am not afraid and. Uh, now I think if uh, my uh, fellow colleagues also know about my situation, they can also help me to get out from this the dilemma. Hmm. And you, you have received uh, support also in the form of uh, demonstrations in, in Dhaka from fellow journalists and from international uh, journalist uh, organizations. Yeah, that, every, that in everyone said within 50 years in Bangladesh, never like a demonstration happen like this way everyone standing for me uh, like uh, the, uh, some uh, some singer song sing a song for me actors they also uh, with, with me the teachers everyone everyone with me they supported me how, really. how does that make you feel that that make feel me um, feel good but when uh, again i think my reporting career i just got like depressed but do you still, uh, even though your your access to sources has dried out, um, do do you still do you still work? Are you still able to to produce uh, stories uh, um, for your newspaper? After, uh, back from the um, jail, I have written a story. It was also exclusive. So many people uh, have uh, many people uh, cheer up with me, and they. Uh, does journalists also feel good? Okay, I'm writing. But after that, I don't know. Uh, some people say to me, okay, go slow, not write anything now, because your case will be more dangerous if you write it, anything. Uh, when I feel good, uh, like May, June, July, July month, I feel good. Okay, tick, everything is okay. Now I, I can start my work. Then they again asked my bank statement and my, my related statement. So again, I afraid, what are they doing? They are all. Uh, they are not stop. They didn't stop. They are well, well, mm. They are working, and they 
they want to do something like that. So I again I I pray. Hmm. Well, and uh, and obviously for for good reason. Uh, but also in terms of uh, seeing the support in the streets and and uh, among your your colleagues, do you do you see that um, or or do you find that there is a level of inspiration there that uh, that what you're doing and and the fact that you're you're holding your head up high, that that might inspire your colleagues to to con continue that work? Yes, uh, I think good journalism. If you if you do good journalism, people will stay with you. In Bangladesh, you know. Uh, nobody thought it will happen. Lots of people will stand by me. It never happened. But uh, this time it's happened. So I think it's courage and I should respect them. And for them I have to write. Whatever happened, I have to do my work. I have to continue my journalism. Hmm. Rosina Islam, thank you, thank you so much for for participating and for for telling your story to us here. Thank you so much. So that was uh, Rosina Islam from from Dhaka, Bangladesh. I think uh, illustrating that uh, reporting on the pandemic can be uh, dangerous uh, when you're dealing with authorities that don't like what what you're writing. But I, I think it also showcases the importance of on the ground reporting, Maria. Yes, and our next guest is Hoda Osman. She is executive editor at the, the Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. And following up the reporters on ground, her role is coaching them and following them through their entire process. Um, the stage is yours, Hoda Osman. Welcome to Norway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm happy to be here to be speaking about the incredible work that the reporters have done in covering the pandemic in the Arab countries. So I'm going to start by just uh, briefly speaking about my organization, Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism, known as ARIJ. It's an organization that supports investigative journalism in the Arab world. It's existed for 15 years. And we offer comprehensive support to journalists. It starts with uh, giving them all the trainings that they need if they wanted to get into the field of investigative journalism. We also, if, if a reporter wants to work on a story, we offer all sorts of, some, of support from coaching the story from the first step, the first day, until publication. And this includes also offering fact-checking, research, uh, legal reviews, digital security training, and personal security training uh, as well. So this is what Arish does. And over the past 15 years, it's really helped push and develop and improve investigative journalism in Arab uh, countries. Um, I want to also show you our uh, website. We have an English section to our website, so all of our investigations are translated into English, so it's easy for anyone to read them. We also do collaborations with other media organizations. So recently, for example, we had two collaborations, one with France 24. We did a story on oil companies uh, working in West Kordofan in Sudan and how they're polluting uh, the water and polluting the, the polluting things there, and we did some testing and shown the effects on the local population. We also just recently, a couple of days ago, published a report with Middle East Eye uh, about unnecessary amputations that were carried out in three hospitals in south of Yemen. Uh, when COVID hit, when the lockdowns started. Uh, in February, end of February and early March of 2020, we had planned an in-person training workshop on what we call IJ Basic Investigate. It's basics of investigative journalism. And we were going to invite journalists to come to uh, Jordan, which is where Arij is based, to take this five-day uh, workshop. We quickly realized this wasn't going to be possible. We had to move remotely. And I have to say that the silver lining with everything that's happened in the, fa in the past two years is that we've discovered the power of doing these trainings online. Suddenly, it opened the doors to a lot more journalists, to journalists from countries and places where it was very difficult for them to attend these uh, trainings, which we did every year uh, to participate. We especially have troubles with journalists from Gaza, from Yemen and from Syria. Um, 
a lot of the journalists financially, you know, might not be able to afford uh, traveling. Sometimes we do uh, finance the travel, but uh, we can't fund everyone. And at the same time, also restrictions on travel. They need special permissions to be able to come. So suddenly we were able to have journalists from anywhere, as long as they had internet connections, and that's a challenge that I'm going to speak about. Uh, they were able to attend this uh, workshop. So we were ready to go. We did our workshop. We thought it was very successful. But then quickly we also realized what is happening? You know, how are these journalists going to do their stories without getting out of their houses? And the pandemic, we realized this pandemic is going to be all we're working about. All stories are somehow one way or another connected to the pandemic. So at the editorial committee, uh, the committee that I'm a member of, we decided that we have to have a project, a big project, to cover pandemic stories in Arab countries. So we ended up uh, doing this project that was led by my colleague, Bissane al and uh, in the end, we published 16 stories from eight Arab uh, countries. And I'm going to talk about a few of those stories today. But I want to point out that the reason why I chose the stories, I wish I had time to speak about all of them. The reason why I'm going to speak about the stories I'm talking about today is not because they were necessarily the best ones out of the 16, but because I felt that they offer um, a, a comprehensive picture of the kind of stories that we did. But before I start, I just wanted to give credit to the reporters who worked on these stories. They worked in incredible uh, conditions under a lot of challenges, and all credit really goes to them. Uh, some of the challenges, I feel like journalists face challenges all over the world. And I don't want to say that Arab countries are a special case. But as you all know, there's you know, there's particular restrictions and, and problems with access to information in many Arab countries. And I'm always careful not to lump all Arab countries and speak to them as, uh, uh, speak about them as uh, one. But I, I can say that there were some trends that we were noticing. We were noticing that the pandemic was being used as an excuse to crack down on a freedom of expression. We were, uh, we, there was a trend, it was widespread, that the governments were becoming more secretive. They were not releasing as much uh, information. And it was extremely difficult and risky for journalists to do their work. In addition, the government offices were also closed. The reports that would have regularly been issued were not being issued. And whenever someone asked to get access to, in to information, there was no response or no one uh, you know, would care. I also want to take this opportunity to talk about some uh, other challenges that maybe are not given as much attention. Power cuts in many Arab countries are a common and very normal thing throughout the day power cuts, if you're charging your laptop, you want to work. Imagine as an investigative journalist, you need to sit down for hours sometimes to just dig and dig and research and research. And some journalists, I worked with a Sudanese journalist, and her laptop would charge for an hour and 20 minutes. So she had to work an hour and 20 minutes until the power is back and she can charge it again. She, ca she couldn't sit down and, and work on investigation or on research for a long time. Uh, uh, internet speeds were already quite horrible, but with the pandemic and everyone using the internet more often and all these Zoom calls, it, it became even more of a problem. And this was all uh, the reporters, they had to face these in addition to the government restrictions and everything else. So we're going to start in Tunisia and a report that was done by reporter Khawla Bukarim, and it was done about the government's deals uh, during COVID-19 with specific focus on a deal that had to do with purchasing rapid COVID-19 tests. I have to mention also that Khawla won the ICFJ's uh, award for coverage uh, of uh, pandemic stories as with, with a special uh, focus on corruption and uh, transparency. The report focused on this deal. The government issued the, the what's called the central pharmacy issued uh, a procurement uh, details that they wanted to purchase 400,000 uh, rapid COVID-19 uh, tests. Uh, it revealed through her reporting, she revealed that there was lack of transparency and there was a violation of, of uh, Tunisian laws. Because at the beginning of the pandemic, the Tunisian government said, okay, we're going to have some exceptions to expedite the process and for us to get the medical supplies and protective gear that we need. 
some exceptions, but you are still required to publish all the details about the contracts, about the bids that were awarded, and this was not happening. There was also mystery shrouding some of these deals, and there were conflicts of interest that we, she was able to uh, show through her uh, reporting. Um, she uh, started with following where these rapid tests were and what happened with this deal. So. After the procurement details were published, there was an announcement by the government that a French-Swiss company, along with a South Korean company, had won this bid. But there were no details, not even the names of those companies. The health ministry refused to uh, speak to Khawla for this report. It's important to mention that Tunisia is one of only four Arab countries that have access of information laws. Uh, so, report, so the reporter, she filed an access of information request she did not get a response within the time that is where she's supposed to get a response. So she filed a lawsuit against the government, the two government entities where she had put this uh, access of information uh, request. What did the reporter do to get information about this? She visited government hospitals. She tried to look, okay, which tests are being used? She finds these PCR tests. Okay, so where are the rapid tests? And then she finds Chinese-made tests being used in some uh, places. Where are these Chinese uh, 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 tests coming from? She asks the government who tell her, oh, the Chinese tests, they were just a donation. They, they did not come through the purchase or the procurement uh, request. So where are the French-made tests? Finally, there was a TV report, um, some government footage, someone had shot a report, which showed the French rapid test. So she was able, through this TV report, to get the name of the company and was able to make advances in her reporting after that. Uh, she examined government and uh, company statements. She found a representative who was representing this French company in um, uh, Tunisia, and she found that on the radio, three days before this procurement request was even published by the, the central pharmacy, this person said that he had met with the government and that they had said they like the test and they were likely to use it. So already a deal was being made be before even the request was being published. She also found out from this person after she went and she spoke to him that his company was company number 108 that bid uh, to, to get this deal. And when she spoke to the central pharmacy, they said that there were 107 bidders. So something was definitely going on and it was uh, fishy here. The uh, person, uh, he claimed there was no prior deal with the government. Uh, the government refused to speak to her, so she had no further information about this deal. But he later on also said in a statement that the government had contacted the headquarters in France and asked them uh, to get ready, because there was another request uh, coming up, and it was going to be for 500,000 uh, rapid tests. In addition to all of this, she also discovered that those tests that were being used in Tunisia had not been approved for use in France at the time. And these are some pictures of the tests that uh, she was investigating. And finally, just quickly, she also uh, uh, investigated masks, and the government had promised that uh, they were going to uh, uh, produce 30 million masks. She visited pharmacies, hospitals, nowhere were these masks to be found. So there was a lot. She did a timeline of statements and compared them with statements by the company and by the government and showed that there was a lock, lack of transparency. A lot of uh, statements were being made and nothing was being uh, implemented on the ground. So this is the uh, uh, Tunisia story by Khawla Boukarim. Moving on to Bahrain. Uh, Bahrain, uh, the report was done by Mohammed al Jad Hafsi, and he did a story on migrant housing during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and how it was uh, affected. Just quickly, Bahrain is a small Gulf country. It has a 1.7 million uh, population. The most interesting thing about the population count is that over 50% of uh, people in Bahrain are foreigners. They're non-Bahrainis. And this number, this statistic is closely related to the topic of this uh, report. I want to start with some pictures. Uh, these are pictures of housing for workers. So in addition to, of course, seeing like, you know, the poor condition, the, how everything, like the, it's, that it's not clean, that it's really poor, look at also how small those places 
are. And I'm going to tell you in a bit how many people we're actually using. So this is a, a, a good example of something that's happened a lot in many countries. A problem already existed, but with the pandemic, it just became more uh, clear. It became more urgent to deal with. And this is a problem that's, that had already existed in uh, Bahrain. I want to start with the story of the Bengali man who was interviewed for the story. He was a Bengali worker. His name is Jagan. I hope I'm pronouncing his name uh, correctly. And he lived in a three-bedroom house with 36 other workers. There were 12 uh, workers sleeping in every room, and they were all, the th all 36 were using one bathroom. Uh, his friend, Banja, he's the one who said this quote, COVID-19 does not infect the poor. They were... They had no money. They weren't following any of the rules that the Bahraini government had put in place. And because of COVID, they were making even less money. So it was even more difficult for them to buy like cleaning supplies and to uh, follow these uh, uh, directives. The Bahraini government had uh, awareness campaigns. They were in English and Arabic. And many of these workers don't speak either language. And out of the workers, the so quote unquote unregulated workers in Bahrain, the reporter was able to find out that uh, they're usually an average of 15 per room, and they rent a bed. They don't rent the room. They rent the bed for eight hours a day, and then this bed is used by someone else for <laughs> the other eight hours, and so on, for $53 a month. So they were all using the same beds, small spaces, very crowded. The landlords were abusing the situation. They were making a lot more money than if they were to rent this tr the traditional way. And it was easy for them to kick them out once uh, they didn't uh, pay. There were some temporary solutions that the, the, the Bahraini uh, government and the companies came up with. Uh, it's important to mention that the government did not have the authority to inspect the housing of the workers who were working for the private companies. Uh, but some of the temporary solutions that they came up with was moving them to some schools. But again, this was temporary. And the companies, some of the companies created some uh, other options for the workers to uh, go to. Uh, the result was also like rising, skyrocketing infection rates amongst the workers, which led in turn to xenophobia and bullying of the workers online and otherwise. After the story was published, the Bahraini Ministerial Council um, ratify the proposal that was proposed by parliament to disinfect the, uh, those areas and to raise awareness. But I have to say that the problem still exists. And there was no comprehensive solution uh, to it. Moving on from Bahrain, next we're going to go to Palestine. Uh, Linda Meher worked on this story. Linda is a reporter who works in the West Bank in Hebron. And she is particularly interested in human rights and legal uh, reporting. Uh, and she did a story investigating the violations and abuses by the security uh, forces and the police during the lockdown and during the state of emergency that was announced uh, after the first case of uh, uh, COVID was uh, found in uh, Palestine. Uh, unfortunately, this kind of behavior the, the authority is using the pandemic as an excuse to connect it to national. It became not a health issue, but uh, a national security issue. And it makes it very difficult, because then journalists, they have to tread very carefully, because they can be accused any uh, moment of you know, uh, harming the national security or endangering the, nat uh, the national uh, security. Uh, so they were using it to become more restrictive, to uh, you know, uh, uh, put pressure on freedom of expression. And I want to move on here to this person. I want to speak about a, a, a man who was affected by this problem. His name is Asad Kabaja, and I'm going to play a clip, a video of him telling you his own story in his own words. It has English subtitles, so you'll be able to uh, see that. على الباب وبطلب اذن يزول يعني فحكيت له شوف مين هم يعني اللي بحكي طبعا طلعوا شافهم حكوا له احنا من الصحه يعني احنا من الصحه جايين بدنا نشوف الوالد طبعا انا كنت يعني جهزت حالي بدي اطلع اشوف تفاجات انهم افراد من امن وقائي من جهاز الامن الوقائي طبعا هو كلهم مركزون في ترقومي عندنا يعني أه 
طبعا طلع يعني حكوا له صحافه تفاجات طلعت شفتهم من الوقايه فحكيت لهم ايش الموضوع؟ حكوا لي بدنا اياك تيجي معنا. قلت لهم ماشي الحال بس بدي مذكره اعتقال او يعني امر من المحكمه او من القاضي الى اخره. المستند القانوني المعروف يعني في اي استدعاء الاصل يكون يعني مسند قانونيا. حكوا لي ما فيش. حكيت لهم ما بمشي معكم، مش بعرف انه انتم، ممكن تكون عصابه، انا ما بعرف، انا حقيقه بدي مسند قانوني اتاكد مين انتم، مين الجهه تبعوا له يعني. فاصروا انه امشي معهم وبدون هذا الورق، قلت ما بمشي. فحينها صار يدفعوني دفع وبقوه، يعني استخدموا القوه معي لجرني الى سيارتهم يعني. طبعا اولادي الصغار على صار الموقف يعني المسكية يعني يخافوا هيك وصار يغوشوا ويصيحوا ومسكوا فيي انه يعني هم هذول بدي فالهم نزلونا بالقوة تحت واحدهم يعني للاسف تشاف سياح ابنائي وشاف البصير يعني طال مسدس واطلق رصاص بديرهب اطفالي طبعا اثناء الطريق ايضا استخدموا يعني العنف اللفظي معاه يعني صار يغلط ويسب الى اخره مع اني ما طلبت منهم الا ورقه قانونيه مين انتم ليش يعني جايين شو بدفعوا الموضوع يعني ما فهموا الموضوع بالمطلق انه يجروا له جرب اسلوب العصابات للاسف واخذوا لحدهم حتى وصلت مركز الامن والوقايه اثناء الاعتقال بس في المركز طبعا اجاني واحد احد المحققين يعني طبعا هم جروا في يعني يعني من ضمن اتهاماتهم انت بدك تنشر الكورونا انت مش عارف شو فكاني فهمت بلورت شو بدهم بالضبط فوصلت الاعتقال بحكي لي انت يوم جمعه وانت اقامت صلاه الجمعه في الناس وصليت الجمعه فيهم وهذا مخالف لبروتوكولات الصحه والى اخره طبعا للاسف فهمت انه ما كان في صلاه جمعه وما حكى يعني وما في ناس شهد انه شافهم هناك ولكن يبدو انه كان تقرير كيد واحقاد موجود عنده Okay, so you get the idea. I hope that you were able to read the subtitles, but just quickly what happened to this man, someone knocked on his door, said they were, were from the health ministry, and then they drag him into the car, they arrest him and they take him and they accuse him of spreading the coronavirus because he held Friday prayers in his house with too many people and broke the rules that were set at the time. This had not happened. He did not hold Friday prayers and there, there were no people, no witnesses, and no proof of this happening. But I mean, sometimes we, we forget to also question, even if he did do this, is it okay to knock on his door, pretend that they're from the health ministry when they're not, drag him to the car, abuse him on the way? So what the reporter here did is that she was able to document uh, 16 cases, 16 cases that she personally interviewed where there were different sorts of violations happening. There was definitely an increase in violations and abuse during uh, this time. In addition to that, there were also, uh, le oh, let me first tell you about the state of emergency. So following the first case of COVID-19, the pre president announced a, a state of emergency for 30 days, and he's allowed to do this according to Palestinian law. But to renew it for another 30 days, he would have had to get two thirds of the legislative council to approve that. Palestine right now, no legislative council. It hasn't been working since 2007, yet they still extended it, you know, and said that this is like an uh, urgent situation. The reporter documented the 16 cases. In addition to that, other organization, two organizations that she worked with, one documented 38 arrests, the other documented 60 violations, including 30 of them that were in Gaza. Uh, the detention areas, they were super crowded. There were no social distancing, no one was wearing the masks, and they were arresting the people for spreading the coronavirus, and yet the coronavirus was spreading in the detention centers. A room that's supposed to hold four people had 10 people. There was one incident where uh, uh, one of the people interviewed by the reporter told her that we were inside, someone came in that's clearly symptomatic. Even the person himself, the man himself said, stay away from me because I, I feel sick. And for six hours, everyone in there complained and asked that he be removed, and they didn't remove him until six hours uh, later. These are, this is a table that she created that showed like the different kinds of violations that were happening, right to fair trial, freedom of expression, humane treatment in detention, peaceful gathering, and the right to uh, privacy. Uh, there was also one thing before we, <laughs> I tell you about this quote, there's also one protest where 19 uh, people were arrested. They were protesting uh, corruption and uh, under the slogan, enough is enough. A lawyer who was interviewed said she was at the protest. They were uh, uh, practicing social distancing and everything else. And yet they were arrested on that uh, day. 
And ironically, this is a, a quote by the Palestinian Prime Minister, Mohammed Ishtiya. He says, the state of emergency exists for us to fight COVID-19. It's not there to fight freedom of opinion and expression, but unfortunately, the facts on the ground uh, showed otherwise. So this was Palestine. We're moving on to Yemen. Uh, Mohammed Al Hassani, a Yemeni reporter, did uh, this investigation about people escaping the quarantine sentence. I want to mention that he won the Arij Award last year for best COVID-19 uh, investigation. Also, his uh, story was translated to French and published in uh, Liberation, the French uh, newspaper. Quickly about Yemen. Yemen has a population of around 30 million people. There's been a civil war going on for the past six years. And right now, different parts of the country are controlled by different authorities. And it was described as the largest humanitarian, the situation there was described as the largest humanitarian crisis in uh, the world. So I'm going to start this one also with some pictures. These are pictures of the quarantine areas. When COVID like hit March 2020, Different countries started scrambling to come up with different measures. So this is what Yemen came up with, which is like anyone entering the country is going to quarantine in these centers that they set up in response to the uh, pandemic. So these are some of the pictures. This is a bathroom. There's some women in a hallway. And I want to talk to you about uh, one of the cases that uh, uh, Muhammad spoke to, a man named Abdurrahman. He worked as a waiter in Saudi Arabia. And with the pandemic, the restaurant wasn't having any customers. They didn't need as many people. They fired him. So he crossed the border to go back to his province in Yemen. As he crossed, he was surprised uh, that he had to quarantine. So they took him to a school where he quarantined. And in three days, there were already 100 people there. And conditions were not very good. They then moved him to another uh, place, but it was even worse. They were putting 20 people in a small room. They were sleeping on the floor. The bathrooms were dirty. There was one bathroom for 150 people in that second location that he uh, moved to. In addition to that, the medical staff was not wearing any protective gear when dealing with people at the quarantine sentence, no sanitizers. Uh, people who were quarantining were allowed to go to the local markets to get food because there was no food. And people who were coming in as newcomers were mingling with people who were already there. So it was pretty horrible conditions. This is them taking a shower. This is how they showered. So people started saying, like, you know, we don't want to stay here. We're going to get COVID by being here. And they started escaping. So the, the reporter documented 16 cases of people who escaped the quarantine areas. And he did this by, we were very careful working on this. He had actually more than 16. He had over 25. But we wanted to make sure each case we document was well documented. So when they enter, there's, a, there's an entry date on the, on the paper that they get when they enter the uh, center. And then when they leave, there's the exit date. So what they were doing, the medical staff that helped some of these people escape in return for money, was that they would change the entry date to make it look like they, were, they had entered earlier and therefore they would be allowed to uh, leave. In addition to documenting the escapes, he also, in his report, uh, uh, tackled something uh, else, which is the isolation centers. So uh, in contrast to the quarantine centers, those are for supposedly healthy people just to quarantine to make sure they don't have COVID. The isolation centers were for people with symptoms who uh, uh, could have COVID or likely probably do have uh, COVID. In one center, in one month, there were 279 patients. Out of 279, 143 had died. The uh, uh, doctor who uh, is a government official who worked at one of these isolation centers said, said this. He said, most of the patients come walking on their feet and they leave dead. So this was another factor that uh, 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 Yemenis were scared to go to the isolation centers or the quarantine centers. And there was a widespread negligence in this organization. So, uh, Abdul Rahman, the man who had crossed the border and went to his family, he was feeling uncomfortable being with his family. He's like, what if I do have COVID-19? What if I g give them? He was feeling a bit guilty about it. But then in the end, he would say this, no one will die before his time. It's like a saying in Arabic to make himself feel uh, a bit more comfortable about the whole situation. And then finally, I'm going to speak about this report out of Egypt. There's no picture because sadly, uh, the reporter 
uh, out of fear for reprisal, published this under a fake name. The name is Sayed Sayed. Uh, it's one of the other challenges. Imagine like an investigative reporter spending months on a report, and they don't even get credit. They, no one even recognizes that this was all uh, their work. But he was worried that if his name was published, you know, there would be uh, repercussions. Uh, Egypt is the Arab uh, world's most populous country with over 100 million, uh, 100 million people. They had high numbers of deaths amongst government health workers. Uh, and there were lots of videos on Facebook of like health workers saying, help us, we don't have protective gear. So his story very quickly is about masks. This is uh, um, uh, El Sayed Muhammad Mohsenawi. Uh, a nurse, he's wearing a mask. He died in April uh, of COVID-19, and he's wearing the mask that is the heart and the focus of this investigation. The uh, reporter was able to document that the masks that were uh, sold as N, were uh, promoted as being like N95 masks were not actually NIOSH approved, and they were not N95 masks, and the Ministry of Health Protocols had required that they use N95 masks. Uh, he was able to track by looking at the numbers, where the masks came from. They came to Egypt in 2007. They were 13 years old. But they were also, like, he contacted the company that made the masks, contact, contacted NIOSH, contacted, like, a lot of different uh, uh, places. What we realized uh, doing this is that you need to get, not just he had the mask, but he also needed to get the box where the mask came in, because it had a bit more information. And then he needed to get the bigger box that had the smaller boxes in, and then it had even more information. And by doing all of this, he was able to show, as you see here, you know, the mask did not have all the required information that Nayash would request. This is the box. And that's it. Hoda, thank you so much for, for this. And I, I, I guess it shows that some of the issues that we've been dealing with in the pandemic are, they can be hyper-local, but we can recognize them from country to country and from region to region as well. And uh, some of these challenges that the journalists that you uh, presented here, uh, I think we, we, can, we can recognize some of that from what we've heard previously and what we'll hear later in this, pand in this pandemic masterclass as well. So, so thank, you. thank you very much for that, uh, that presentation. Thank you, thank you for allowing me to be here. And I did like when my colleagues from Romania, they were talking about the mask. I'm like, there's a lot to work together on. Like, you know, there's a lot to learn from each other. It's uh, a dangerous virus for uh, many people. And uh, just imagine when it uh, arrives to the, um, the country of 1.38 billion people. It also came to India. And um, which is the second most populous country after China. There we have a very brave journalist that you also interviewed, Christopher Rukmini S. Tell about her. Yeah, she's based in uh, Chennai, and uh, she's a, uh, an investigative data journalist, uh, independent. And she manages uh, to, to find information that's not publicly available out in the open. Uh, the government uh, has an official figure of uh, the number of dead in India is around 500,000. Rukmini, when she went through the data uh, from just three different Indian states, she found out that the number was much, much higher. And uh, she's going to talk more about that in this presentation that you can see right here. Rukmini, welcome to this uh, master uh, class uh, on, the, on how we do pandemic journalism. Welcome from Chennai. Thank you, you for having me. A lot of data journalism and uh, figuring out figuring out how to look at the big numbers to to discover what's actually happening in, in India during the COVID pandemic, and we're very excited to to hear you talk more about that. So so please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So um, the COVID situation in India and India's handling of it in some ways defies easy narratives. Uh, there have been incredible successes but also catastrophic failures and while some on the front lines in particular have uh, demonstrated great heroism, 
there has also been a great lack of transparency that has endangered indian citizens and prevented us from fully understanding where we stand so um just for a quick recap here's what happened on january 30th 2020 india detected its first covid-19 case when a medical student who had returned from wuhan in chennai in Ch- china excuse me to her village in the southern indian state of kerala got a sore throat um she contacted the local authorities and was put in the isolation ward of a government hospital for 25 days uh from there on cases began to be reported um you know from various states usually from international travelers returning home but uh, even by that early the writing on the wall from the rest of the world was quite clear and even though india had just 500 confirmed covid cases at the time on the night of Uh, March the 24th 2020 with just 4 hours notice prime minister narendra modi put the entire country into one of the world's most uh, stringent lockdowns uh, numbers stayed relatively low in india through india summer april and may of 2020 but once restrictions started to ease and mobility increased um the numbers began to go up and india's first wave as such peaked in uh, september 2020 at around 100000 confirmed uh, new cases every day from there on there was um, a sharp decline uh, from the middle of september 2020 um, and we don't really know why the first wave subsided at that point but what set in after that was a sort of dangerous complacency Uh, during most of 2020 when the official numbers were especially low uh, particularly on a population basis um, and the officially certified death rates death rates were uh, particularly low comparisons began to be made in india with the developed world so with italy for instance uh, in the early part of 2020 which had one of the uh, first and most visible surges and the narrative was certainly a bit smug um, it was look at these developed countries having to take decisions about who gets a ventilator and who doesn't while while we're doing okay and our hospitals are not overrun uh, of course there were at least two issues here one is that as we now know with the pandemic uh, particularly before vaccinations it's always too soon to call it over uh, and the second and most crucial part is that we now know that there were massive problems with india's genomic surveillance which uh, had an impact on the uh, ability to capture the delta variant that fueled most countries second waves including india's as well as india's ability to accurately capture data uh, from what we now know the question we should have been asking ourselves in 2020 was not what was what was so exceptional about india but the question we should have been asking ourselves was what was so exceptional about the indian data um unfortunately the second wave made it brutally clear that uh, what was exceptional was was the data so what happened is that from the beginning of the pandemic india applied a uh, narrow and stringent definitions that artificially kept numbers low in the early days testing was limited and that kept uh, official counts low healthcare is also heavily uh, rationed in india and who gets good treatment can often depend on who you are and how much money you make which part of the country you live in your social background uh, so getting tested and diagnosed was a was a relative privilege uh, which not everyone had equal access to then there is the question of what makes a definition of a covid death in india despite clear guidelines right from the beginning from the who which technically india adopted uh india continued to attribute you know these guidelines said that india should uh, that all countries should attribute deaths to covid even in the absence of a positive test prior to death this guideline was essentially ignored in india so the result is a very narrow definition of a covid death one that has seen many face the trauma of seeing their loved ones die of clearly from covid but with no official acknowledgement that it's the virus that took their lives this lack of official acknowledgement of difficult truths has in fact been one of the defining features of india's pandemic response for the most part i believe that the indian government took the pandemic seriously this was not a, a bolsonaro or a trump situation in india and responded uh, as best as the government knew and in good faith for the most part this is what i believe 
uh, there is much to debate about the hardships that were caused by India's extremely stringent lockdowns and health infrastructure could not or, or was not ramped up uh, during the lockdowns and during the years subsequently to you know uh, meet the surges. But for the most part, steps were taken broadly in accordance with science and with uh, prevailing wisdom. For me, the problem is the lack of transparency. Journalists in India have struggled from the beginning of the pandemic to get responses to hard questions around data, around approval for drugs and around vaccine trials and approvals. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about Indian journalism here, which I really think came into its own during the pandemic. Hundreds of journalists, uh, many of them who, who don't work in Indian languages and work in uh, you know more difficult parts of the country, most of them women and many of them very young, fanned out across the country at great personal risk to cover this story. In the early days of the lockdown, journalists began to capture the humanitarian crisis that was unfolding as millions of migrants with very little in savings began to set off on home for foot, uh, set off for home on foot because they simply had no money to keep them going through the lockdown. And I believe this journalism truly did turn the tide of public opinion and create an outpouring of support for these uh, returning migrants. Subsequently, the important story was capturing the pandemic as it was playing out in big cities, uh, sorry, outside big cities, in rural areas and in marginalized communities. And then ultimately in uh, 2021 in particular, the story that was essential was to uncover the story around deaths. In some ways, the pursuit of accurate data around COVID mortality exemplified both the worst impulses of the Indian state and the best of Indian journalism and academia, as well as public-spirited citizens. While it had been apparent right from the beginning, right from 2020, that India's co official COVID death count was a severe underestimate, it was in the second wave that it really became undeniable. In April and May 2021, if you went on Indian Twitter, it would have looked like one massive helpline trying to get someone's father or someone's wife a hospital bed. New cases rose at an astonishing pace and for well over a month, India reported over 3,000 deaths every day, officially counted deaths. Now, journalists who knew their cities well, their cities and communities, began to push back against this official death toll because they could see uh, the devastation that they were seeing on the, on the ground from, from crematoria, from burial grounds, they reported how several times the official number of uh, dead persons were being given funerals every day in their own towns and cities. So one way of approaching the true toll uh, from COVID is to look at deaths from all causes during the pandemic and see if there's an increase, um, excess mortality as it's come to be called. Uh, this could point to missed or uncounted COVID deaths. And this is a system that has also been used in the UK, in South Africa, in Peru, in many other countries to gain a better understanding of missed COVID deaths. The only trouble is that India does not make this data publicly available. The last data that we have on uh, all-cause mortality is from 2018. So uh, once I realized that this, this would be a valuable way to figure out the number of missed COVID deaths, potentially missed COVID deaths, I uh, developed sources in three Indian states, Madhya Pradesh, which is a large, uh, poor state in central India, Andhra Pradesh, which is a state uh, with re relatively middling income in southern India, and Tamil Nadu, uh, where I am from, which is a relatively prosperous state also in the south. So I was able to access official all-cause mortality uh, data for these states. The numbers for Madhya Pradesh in particular, the poorest state, were particularly shocking. Uh, they showed that as the second wave surged through the state, deaths from all causes went to five times their usual value in the state in May 2021. The state's excess mortality in 2021, up till May when I looked at it, was 40 times the official COVID death toll for the same period. The undercounting for Andhra Pradesh, the other southern Indian state, was also as bad, but it was substantially lower in Tamil Nadu. Uh, subsequently, there has been a sort of domino effect and a wave of reporting on excess mortality by uh, journalists across the country. They have found that there is significant undercounting across the country as well, but it varies significantly. So uh, poorer states, especially in the north and central India, have a, a much larger proportion of undercounting, while uh, states that actually reported higher numbers of of official uh, COVID deaths, like Kerala in the south, for example, have a lower undercounting factor. 
So uh, the new numbers point to the extent of underreporting of COVID in India, something that Indian reporters have been pointing out for over a year now. But they also point to the gaps in in Indian democracy. Uh, the pandemic has brought together, <coughs> excuse me, a community of public spirited journalists and scientists. Uh, and data enthusiasts who might have you know uh, day jobs with um, uh, with a biscuit company uh, and all of this this community together through hard work and doggedness often at great personal risk have pieced together the story of india's uh, you know true twist with covid but the prime minister and health ministers have been permitted to continue without facing virtually any questions from the media modi famously refuses to hold press conferences and his ministers rarely hold truly open uh, press conferences the government has been allowed to make virtually no data about covid um, available uh, to the public india is one of the few countries where the official covid data comes from a crowd sourced volunteer driven website called covid19india.org run entirely pro bono by a group of young um the public spirited people who work anonymously so even now we have no uh, government uh data on um, disaggregated by region and over time the government has been allowed to run with a false and dangerous narrative that india's suspiciously low death rate was the mark of successful containment rather than failed data and this has been allowed to continue for over a year and a half just to give you an example on april 29th this year india reported over 250000 new official covid cases and over 3000 deaths it was one of the worst ever days of the pandemic so far um that day the city the capital city of delhi ran out of space for cremations <coughs> but just that morning the then health minister visited a covid hospital also in delhi um he didn't take questions from the media but in the um, press release that he that his office handed out later he said that while every death was sad india had one of the lowest mortality rates in the world Since the beginning of the pandemic the Indian government has sought to argue that India handled the pandemic better than uh, almost any country uh, Modi in fact uh, um, you know said made a similar statement at the World Economic Forum in January 2021 where he said India is among those countries that have succeeded in saving the lives of the maximum number of its citizens so what the reporting on excess mortality has done is that it's exposed the hollowness of this triumphalism and in a sense this is what this is something that indian journalism and data journalism has been able to cut through but the hard work that begins uh, from where journalism ends is how to hold governments to account because all of this reporting has not yet been officially acknowledged by the government was still some of it has been pushed back against and the journalists have been um, uh, you know almost ridiculed for their reporting so uh, indian journalism has taken this far um, how much further accountability mechanisms and you know democracy really can take us will be the story from here onwards thank you very much uh, rukmini that's um, that's really interesting and uh, and as you mentioned that there are the challenges here are in contrast to for example what we've seen in brazil or, or the us with the uh, with uh, other types of government and other types of, uh, of people uh, leading the country it, maybe if uh, uh, for those watching if you could just repeat the name of that crowdsourcing website you mentioned so that's actually a very interesting story it's called covid19india.org and it essentially aggregates all official sources it's not um, it's crowdsourced to the extent that it crowdsources official data sources but data that the government will not does not put together itself and uh, it's interesting that we're talking about it now because it's been running for a year and a half and this group of young people is entirely burnt out and they have said that they are closing operations by the end of october because they simply cannot keep it going any more so what's happening right now in india is once again a push uh, from journalists and other people to find a way to keep it going because even 21 22 months in the indian government has still not stepped in to take the baton from this group of uh, volunteers to say okay we'll run it now or that we'll present this disaggregated data now so it's still being transferred from one group of volunteers uh, to the another. official figure if i remember correctly it's, it's just shy of 500000 uh 
if, if you look at these numbers that that are on this website and, and things that you you found yourself, uh, do you have an estimate of, of how how high the real number is? So, because Indian states are so different from each other in terms of aid structure, access to health, um, all of that, uh, it makes at a journalistic level, it makes national figures hard to put together. However, building on the work that journalists have done, at least three sets of academics have uh, now published papers estimating um, missed mortality for India. And the rough estimate is somewhere between 4 and 6 million um, deaths from COVID as compared to the 400,000 to 500,000 official, the official number. Exactly, with huge variations between states. So some states might be doing uh, uh, misreporting to the extent of 20 times while other to the extent of 10 and, and you compared uh, these three states that you worked with, uh, but of course I India is such a massive country and, and the, 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 the local government in each of these states can run quite differently from each other. Um, what types of, of states within India have handled this crisis better than others? So I think one of the things that we found is that um, there's a sort of, and you know, since we are a journalistic community uh, discussing this here, in some ways uh, we need to think as journalists about the incentives that we create in the way we respond to numbers. So, um, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, the, the way of responding, and I suppose even now, is that if a particular state showed particularly high numbers, the response would be to criticize that state and call, call it a failure. While w what we're beginning to see now is that it was possibly simply a function of that state doing a better job of reporting its numbers than others. So that is a sort of reckoning that Indian journalism perhaps needs to have about uh, interstate comparisons, especially when there's such a wide difference in, in the ability to both collect and uh, honestly report these numbers. So, um, the, the, you know, the differences in state capacity between Indian states are uh, to the order of, uh, you know, differences between entire continents. The, the, the two southern Indian states in particular are able to provide uh, uh, levels of uh, healthcare access that, while not of uh, developed world quality, would compare to, you know, um, sort of give, uh, lend credence to India's uh, middle income status at least, while some of the other states provide, uh, you know, are simply not able to provide the most basic healthcare. So I'd say um, uh, uh, broadly the southern and the more developed states were, were broadly able to do a better job of um, tackling the pandemic. I think the state of uh, Kerala provides a, uh, an interesting uh, sort of, you know, uh, a case study but also an exercise in thinking about how to report because uh, Kerala did a particularly good job of controlling the pandemic in the early days, which simply meant that until vaccinations spread out uh, widely enough, it had a much larger susceptible population. So it had a, more, a longer lasting second wave than, than other states, which was immediately seen as a failure, but uh, you know, possibly is, is, it's possibly a victim of its own early successes. So yes, just as you say, um, you know, uh, reporting one Indian story sometimes becomes difficult and these become multiple individual and stories. You, you talked about the government and you talked about uh, the crowdsourcing, the grassroots journalism, but what about the, the, the big uh, newspapers, the, the media companies, the, 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 the big institutions that could be doing some of this work as well? Uh, how much do you see the, your kind of work and data journalism this crowdsourcing being carried into the big media companies? So I'd say in some ways the big media companies can represent both the best and the worst of journalism. Uh, you know, some of the best reporting uh, that's come from uh, difficult to access places uh, uh, and marginalized communities have also come from uh, the big media organization. And uh, Indian television, which gets a bad rap for most things um, and often with good reason, did a particularly good job of covering the migrant crisis in the in the first half of the pandemic. Uh, some of the best, um, you know, after the first three states that I wrote about, some of the best uh, excess mortality reporting has also come from a mainstream Indian newspaper called The Hindu, which uh, has done this in uh, state after state. I think one of the problems that um, Indian journalism suffers from is uh, a separation of um, uh, 
people who cover the government and people who cover on the ground and these two don't come together enough so one of the you know consistent frustrations throughout the pandemic has been a um, at at one time weekly uh, press briefing now of course it it happens quite rarely and you know on on journalists whatsapp groups there would be like a, a explosion of outrage while the press conference was going on about all of the things that were being uh, misrepresented and hidden and not answered but you wouldn't see that outrage reflected in the newspapers the next day they, the press conference would largely be faithfully uh, reported as it was and these same reporters are capable of you know astonishing feats of journalism on the ground but sometimes these uh, these two wings are kept separate it could be intentional this way you get to keep the government happy as well as your readers feel that you are doing investigative work but it doesn't serve uh, the purpose of journalism to be uh, separating uh, what the government is saying from what's do, happening do you see that as uh, that problem of not being able to represent the true nature of what's happening at these press conferences and the true nature of the of the pandemic itself do you see that as intentional from these uh, big media companies or just a lack of uh, of understanding uh, on how to use these methods that, that you've been using I think it would be naive to consider these as unintentional because when the Indian media decides they do want to go after someone or something, uh, that person uh, gets no peace for weeks and months on end. They we they can't do it. So I think this is a way of ensuring that the government feels that it has its say while you still satisfy uh, the basic tenets of hmm. journalism. But do you see data journalism being used to a greater extent in big media in in general in in, in India? Yes, I do. So one of the things is that over the last five years, but particularly over the last year and a half, there's been a real explosion of data journalism in India, and a lot of younger people, uh, including those who don't come from journalistic backgrounds, are, are interested in bringing, in working in this field and bringing it into into the media. Um, you see uh, data teams across Indian newsrooms. You know, the big newspapers, the big uh, television channels, all have data journalists as well. but the thing in india is that uh data journalism and investigative journalism end up having to go hand in hand because there is such an uh, such a deep uh, lack of access to uh, the data that you want so when it comes to excess mortality i think in many other parts of the world the question would have been how best to represent it what graphs will tell the story best how do you add additional context well over here we literally had to create these data sets because they weren't made public so the the first step was you know finding sources who share this data with you um so you know that um, being a good data journalist with good data skills as many newsrooms have in india is is not enough um it it starts from having to get access to to the data that's not being made it must have also been a a learning experience for for you i mean going through all these data sets trying to figure out shortcuts to 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 make it a bit more manageable uh, did you did you learn something or pick up something along the way that that you found could be helpful for for other journalists who who are facing facing similar uh, challenges Yes but also I've been a data journalist in India for 10 years now and this is a consistent problem lack of lack of access and um, uh, lack of access to usable data it's you know a joke in the Indian data journalism community that everything is always in pdfs and jpegs and you know highly uh, in cds in physical form always in very difficult to use uh, formats so uh, i think one of my big learnings during uh, the pandemic has been just how uh, public spirited this community is some of the uh, data that was um, uh, extracted and made available to me on github for example was by people who are simply uh, public spirited people who work um, who have their own jobs but uh, strongly believe in open data and in using their tech skills to make this data available so um, uh, these uh, relationships that have built across um, uh, people who work in data journalists and the scientific community uh, i hope this uh, new community uh, will you know outlast the pandemic and uh, help help with all of indian data journalism it, it seems like that community is facing some some big uh, powerful forces uh, working against it if, if the government is being relu- reluctant in sharing its information and the big uh, media companies aren't too happy to to share it 
How, how do you think you can strengthen that uh, that grassroots community of, uh, of data journalists? So I think one very important thing is to always keep in mind that we we are not trying to duplicate democracy over here, but we're trying to strengthen democracy. So I actually worry about becoming uh, of all of us becoming a victim of these successes, which is. The more we try and create these uh, parallel systems, the less onus there is on the government to release this data to everyone. So, uh, you know, when I did these first few stories, one of the uh, sources of pushback from people was because they couldn't see this data themselves. I, of course, I put it out on GitHub and I made it uh, publicly available, but um, I think the, the emphasis has to be on creating democratic systems that put pressure on governments to release this data as a matter of right of, of the citizens and not to, uh, I worry in some ways that we are diverting our energy towards investigative uh, mechanisms while what we should really be focusing on is, is a matter of right. Even uh, COVID-19 India.org or you know the future form that it might take this should have been a government website. There are some things that need to come out of independent investigative data journalism. There are some things that the government is duty bound to uh, give its citizens. And disaggregated historical pandemic data, which um, many countries with much less you know, IT abilities than India have been able to do, is something that 22 months down the line, if we haven't been able to create mass sort of public demand for this as a right, then then that's a failure of um, maybe journalism or other democratic systems that we're still trying to look for alternative pathways to it rather than tell, rather than make it impossible for the government to deny this data. To I guess in government there's this uh, power struggle of, uh, of uh, holding things back in order to paint a more rosy picture of, of the situation and this need to to be transparent and give information so that you can have public trust in the government uh, in, in the long run. Do, do you see forces within uh, the Indian government who take that second side, who, who, who realize the importance of, of showing the data to build up public trust? Yes, I do think that uh, a certain uh, minimum level of um, uh, you know, so a certain minimum benchmark has to be set that this data, it does not matter if it is positive or negative, as the, like the census, for example. I, you know, the government should not feel that in the future, if they feel that census data is inconvenient, they're just not going to publish it. We have had this with, we have a national sample survey, which is sort of the next step from the census, a, a periodic sample survey that covers a range of socioeconomic issues. And we have had the very dangerous precedent set in the last couple of years, which is that inconvenient data around household consumption and unemployment was suppressed. Um, while uh, you know a lot of the problems with India's um, data architecture are not new, they are not uh, Modi government created problems. There has been a sort of withering away of India's statistical architecture for some time now. But for it to reach a point where it is acceptable to simply not release inconvenient data, that hasn't happened before. So I think that minimum benchmark has to be set, whether through a legal mechanism or just by creating more uh, mass public support for it, where you say these things you have to give us, they, they have to be uh, the citizens' right and they have to be given to us by law. Over and above that, making other data available, yes, I do see there are definitely initiatives and individuals within government who strongly believe in open data, in more accessible data. The problem always is when it goes against the uh, government narrative. That streak of independence to, to release inconvenient data and anger your masters, um, I have not Sounds seen. Sounds like a long-term problem. Rukmini, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us for, for, for this masterclass. It's been very insightful and, and interesting, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So that was Rukmini. Uh, that was Rukmini S from uh, Chennai in India, talking about the importance of uh, data journalism uh, when you have a government that's giving out different figures uh, in terms of uh, people who have been affected by by the pandemic, and then finding the real figures hidden beneath. Um, we are now moving from India to a different continent, and that is Africa, facing huge challenges during the pandemic. 
and not at least now. Uh, if we look at their target for the World Health Organization, they said that 10% out of a country's population should be vaccinated in the end of September, this September. 50 countries, or more than 50 countries, have, are left out, and most of them are in Africa. I think now around maybe 4.4% are fully vaccinated. Mm. And to hear more about how uh, the pandemic has affected the African continent, uh, we've spoken to uh, Paul Adepoju, and he is the community manager at the International Center for Journalists Global Health Crisis Forum. And uh, we spoke, uh, I've spoken to him before this, uh, this conference, uh, and you'll see the pre-recorded tape. And we started talking about Africa, but we ended up talking quite a lot about how uh, what he saw from his local pr perspective in Nigeria also was sort of a global issue and, and uh, affecting journalists worldwide. So take a look at this. So Paul Adepodri, welcome to this uh, masterclass in pandemic journalism. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we're very excited to 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 have you, uh, and uh, I understand that you you uh, will start off with a presentation where you can where you can talk about how the pandemic has uh, has affected the African continent and and how uh, how it's been possible to to conduct journalism uh, during this this past one and a half years. So uh, so uh, go ahead, please, Paul. The stage is all yours. Yes, um, thank you very much, and um, I do appreciate uh, the organizers uh, of this masterclass uh, for having me uh, to present uh, on this uh, very important uh, subject. And um, by quick introduction, uh, I'll be, I've been able to put uh, this presentation together uh, in the context of what I do, especially my background in journalism and uh, my current engagement uh, with the ICFJ, and of course uh, as an African. So um, the working title is uh, Reporting COVID in Africa and uh, Helping Journalists uh, Globally. And I'm currently the Community Manager for the Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum for the International Center uh, for Journalists. I'm also a freelance uh, journalist. And uh, so like I said, uh, these are the three light uh, contests that I'll be talking uh, on this uh, very important subject. And a uh, quick background, uh, while um, many uh, journalists started with uh, journalism, I actually have my core background uh, in science. And years before COVID became an issue, I've personally been interested about uh, res uh, respiratory, uh, respiration-linked uh, conditions with meticulous attention on tuberculosis, which was why I was um, quite conversant with the potential escalation of a disease like COVID that can easily uh, be transmissible uh, through the respiratory uh, system, even at the early stages of the pandemic before many people uh, took it uh, serious. So as a journalist, uh, even bef well before COVID made everybody a COVID journalist, I've actually been meticulous about uh, the development uh, landscape, uh, covering issues on health, tech, uh, science, and uh, other aspects of development. And uh, this is captured in the wide varieties of the stories uh, that I've published so far. But when COVID came, uh, people like me became thrown right uh, in the middle of the coverage, and uh, which is why I've written divers of top uh, of COVID-related stories and health-related stories uh, for top uh, some of the leading uh, science and uh, journalism uh, platforms. Uh, so what you are looking on the screen are some of the stories that I've personally written uh, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And we could still see that there are also other topics to, in addition to COVID, which actually uh, goes a long way to show that while COVID remains a global threat, COVID is not the only global threat and other health issues are also ongoing, which means uh, attention, focusing all the attention alone on COVID-19 could be potentially uh, counterproductive, even in the, in the journey towards uh, regaining uh, what the world has lost uh, from the pandemic. But um, looking at how 
uh, COVID-19 has been, I see it uh, in many lights, especially from the context of the African uh, continent. Uh, because uh, for journalists, uh, it's a missed feeling um, because um, there is nobody that would say uh, ease or life has not been directly impacted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, conventionally, um, these are master class, everybody would have been in the same room, uh, would all be uh, exchanging ideas, uh, shaking hands, uh, having coffee and discussing in person. But even though yeah, we are gradually moving back towards that, uh, doing that fully, uh, we are still not there yet. And uh, having these uh, virtual present is actually a, is actually goes to say that um, there is very few aspects of human life that has not been affected uh, by the global pandemic. And it has also affected how journalism uh, is being done. Because uh, normally, if you want to conduct interview before, you would have to go and see uh, the person you are trying to talk to in person, uh, use your tape recorders. But overnight, tools, new, uh, we had to change many tools of journalism. And uh, we have to actually quickly adapt to them and be very good at them so that we can be, be able to still achieve what we set out to achieve uh, as journalists. And I also consider it as unprecedented task because um, there was a time I was looking at previous pandemics. Uh, as journalists, even though our job is to tell stories, we are also playing critical roles in keeping history for generations to come. So that is an uh, unprecedented task. And we have to do it with lots of restrictions or, li of li or lots of limitations. And uh, everybody is on the edge. And so it's a really um, uh, a clear task for everybody. But COVID-19 also presented a peculiar challenge, which is uh, especially for journalists in Africa and uh, my colleagues in Africa, that we are reporting uh, for international, that we are reporting for international platforms. We also have to find a way uh, to report our local news uh, for global audience, and um, which is actually a very, very serious challenge, especially when you are dealing with, uh, we are trying to convince uh, other parts of the world, editors in other parts of the world, about oh. why an issue that looks very, very simple should actually be considered a top priority. And so that was a major challenge. And uh, like I said, uh, COVID-19 has extensively redefined how journalism uh, is being done. It's like a Pandora's box. Uh, we've, it has already been opened. And um, it has already been opened. And uh, many... Uh, it's like a Pandora's box. It has already been opened, and many things that we are already doing, uh, we can that we are already doing. We cannot go. It may, we may find it difficult to go back uh, doing them. So journalism has also been revolutionized by the pandemic, and uh, Africa is not left behind. Uh, before some of the top stories that uh, people like me would write would require we traveling to several cities or sometimes countries depending on the story. But these days we are finding ways of actually sitting down, uh, conducting interviews. And uh, that is on the bright side. But on the other side too, uh, we have uh, some sources that you will have to meet in person for you to be able to tell their stories. But because of the contagious, uh, easily transmissible, transmissible nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that has also been affected as we have sources that are now reluctant to even allow you to come closer to them because they are at high risk of dying from the pandemic. So that has also, um, that has also been a major issue. But what remains unchanged? Journal journalism is still there. And uh, stories need to be told, and uh, editors uh, will continue to ensure that the standard of journalism remains unchanged, irrespective of um, what the uh, prevailing situation is. And uh, getting the whole picture is also an issue that needs to be told. And uh, for instance, um, when you are looking, uh, when you are looking, when you are zero, when you are laser focused on an aspect of a topic, uh, we should always consider that there are other factors that are responsible for those 
issues and that is why ensuring that we are capturing the whole picture not leaving anything else has also become uh, very very crucial uh, to journalism and um, personally i think one of the things that uh, covid 19 has brought attention to is the inequity uh, I'm not just talking about a uh, vaccine uh, inequity uh, because uh, this inequality that we are that we are seeing playing out uh, on the global scene is uh, something that predates uh, the pandemic and uh, it's also an attestation uh, to the variation in the challenges and priorities of different nations, different cities. And um, so we always have to put that uh, into consideration that the inequality challenge uh, remains and uh, we always have to factor that uh, into our reporting. But um, one of the things that I'm always concerned about is the fact that a um, few weeks ago, I was reading up on available publications on the Spanish flu, uh, which happened over 100 years ago. And um, it became clearer that, um, how, uh, that as journalists, Actually, those of us in Africa, we are started with a task of ensuring that the stories from the continent are properly written, they are properly documented, and would present the true picture of how the pandemic uh, occurred in Africa. But um, without opportunities, without the right platforms, even when documentation is ongoing, um, they may disappear. Uh, throughout uh, and uh, they may not be well kept so that is why we have to be we are being meticulous and intentional about ensuring that we keep records and we write uh, these stories uh, so that it's going to be a true reflection of what really happened in africa not just leg, uh, dying on the point of africa is not having enough doses but also having stories that really showed the on the ground impact of the pandemic even at the micro level in african communities so that is one th aspect of inequity that african journalists are struggling and striving uh, to ensure and uh, so that is me as a, as a journalist but in journalism too yeah, covid-19 uh, when uh, when individuals that are not journalists uh, let's say uh, individuals that subscribe to newspapers when they open the pages of the newspapers, they just want to read the story and they expect the reporter to also to always be the bearer of the information. But COVID-19 has shown that uh, journalists are also human beings and uh, they are also living through uh, the realities and the woes and everything that COVID-19 has presented itself with. And uh, so they are not isolated. And uh, so I've been able in my capacity as a with the icfj i've been able to interact with uh journalists and um i actually joined uh the icfj in the middle of the pandemic and uh to be part of the team uh that is working on their um i say on the global health crisis reporting forum which is a network of tens of thousands of journalists uh in different parts of the world and who are facing peculiar challenges and dealing with different issues so this was when i joined um the high cfj and um that is in this name of the project the high cfj global health crisis reporting forum which actively engages uh, journalists and uh, we uh we train or uh, we improve the training you know with covid 19 restricting movement there is limitation to the uh array of training and uh, continual education that journalists could have access with so every week we host well we host webinars uh, in which we bring top experts from different parts of the world top health experts uh, to talk about health issues and the and the various aspects of the covid 19 pandemic we also bring the uh, trainers that would expand and uh, the knowledge that uh, journalists have so that they can progress uh, in their careers. We also make journalists to be aware of opportunities that they can leverage on to better uh, succeed at what they do. And uh, 
once in a while, in addition to this, I, we also interact with journalists in which uh, I hold phone calls, I chat journalists up in different parts of the world to give a better understanding of what they are dealing with. And it has, quite, it has been quite eye-opening. I remember, uh, so this uh, is me uh, at the back, back end uh, setting up uh, webinars and uh, so it's always eye-opening being able to interact with people that are behind the news, those that are responsible for bringing news to millions of people across the world, how they are dealing with this pandemic personally, and how they are, especially those that were not reporting signs prior to the pandemic, how they are fitting in and uh, their struggles and what we can uh, help them with. I remember talking to a particular journalist, uh, a female journalist in India, and uh, she, showed, uh, she told me that, uh, uh, that she, the, she, the pandemic has had long-lasting impact on her personal life, including the loss of her mom, and, uh, and uh, she's also the breadwinner uh, of her family. And because there were, there were job losses, including in journalism, she was afraid of what would happen to her family members. Peradventure, she loses uh, the job, that a journalism job. And, but the everyday news reader that reads her pieces will not be aware of this internal and personal struggle that the writer has been dealing with. And uh, so we embrace uh, generally a three-pronged approach uh, in helping journalists, which is the first key element is science. And as a journalist, uh, especially those that did not cover, did not have any major core background in science like uh, journalists like me, uh, uh, what we've been doing is uh, to improve their science reporting skills. In, uh, we've seen people that were reporting business, economy, beat, and were thrown right into uh, the COVID-19 reporting without, any, without, without major uh, training. So uh, most of them are learning on the job. So in my capacity, we are training journalists so that they can improve their science reporting skills. And since COVID-19 has been around for more than a year now, the fatigue is setting in and many journalists are getting are struggling to find new angles. So we are also working to improve COVID-19 reporting for journalists in different parts of the world by opening their eyes into peculiar angles that they can also still report on uh, so that they can still continue the conversation, they can still get more pitches up approved and uh, they can still keep the reporting going. And the third aspect uh, we, we is also career progression. For instance, uh, we are uh, in the uh, tech journalists or freelance journalists will be who desire how to improve their skills, how to better interact with editors and other aspects. Uh, journalists that also want to dive into data visualization would also have uh, the right skills uh, to be able to, to do that. So that is what, uh, that, these are part, aspects of what uh, we've been dealing with and helping journalists uh, in different parts of the world. And uh, we just last week, uh, okay, we uh, just last week we won uh, the Online News Association, uh, online, sorry, Online Journalism Award uh, for community, uh, of our community efforts. And uh, as you can see, these are the team members, uh, the face of the initiative, although there are several other individuals behind the scene that are working to, that we are, with which we are working together to ensure that journalists across the world are better trained and better positioned to do their jobs daily. So what have I learned from the COVID-19 uh, experience? I have come to realize that uh, COVID-19 has been a mirror that, has been, that is showing us who we truly are as a people and where we stand on key issues. We've seen, um, it's not uh, the reluctance of the richer countries to help poorer countries in procuring uh, COVID-19 vaccines. It's not something that is new, even though it may seem shocking to the world. But it has actually been, COVID-19 has shown uh, where our interests are, what we consider to be top priorities in different aspects of human endeavors. And that is an angle, that's something that we are seeing in journalistic uh, pieces that are being published uh, every day. And uh, I think is a reality check 
uh, not just for journalism, not just for science, but in the entire world, to see where we truly are on key issues and what we consider to be serious enough to attract our attention. It has also been able to demonstrate that journalists are not bystanders. Uh, they are also living through this reality. I remember hosting a webinar uh, that looked at how journalists in India have been directly impacted uh, by the pandemic. And it was obvious that many journalists have already died. Uh, those that are reporting the COVID, some of them have actually died of the COVID. So journalists are not uh, isolated or excluded uh, from the news. They are also part of the news. And, um, and it has also shown the reason why inclusion and diversity thoroughly matter. We have to ensure that every story is told. We have to ensure that we are not just uh, because COVID-19 is not, has not been selective uh, to a large extent in who is, in who is infected or who is uh, or who it kills. It has shown that every angle, we cannot say we, are, we can overcome this uh, pandemic by leaving a set of people out of the pan, out of the response or out of the story. So everybody needs to be affected, has to be included in how we report this. And that is why we should always endeavor in our, in our careers that we are, we are not just narrow-minded, that we are open-minded in our approach in telling the stories that truly matter. And I've also come to realize that, that the stories need to be told to ensure that current mistakes are avoided in the future. Uh, even though there are publications on the Spanish flu, I'm not sure they were as deep and as uh, thorough and as extensive as what we currently now have on the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've, we have heard that if we've had such expansive body of knowledge and information, many mistakes that were made in during the Spanish flu would likely not be made in the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that opens a lot of argument, but the more information that we are able to curate and the vast nature of the info stories that we, have, we are able to write and to write them much better, the better the chance of ensuring that the human race in the future avoids the mistakes of now have this. And um, journalists, I've also come to realize that journalists who are the storytellers also de require support and uh, so that they can be, be, they be the best at their jobs. Uh, from somebody that was reporting fashion and was thrown right into health reporting, if we don't come together to actually help that person uh, to be the best at what well, at health reporting, uh, the documentation and the reporting will be so, will not be at the right quality, and this is going to what well, this is going to affect the uh, journalism as it's being practiced, and even those can also also misinform those that are actually reading that kind of story, which means uh, helping journalists to be the best at their job uh, is a collaborative work. And I also come to realize that change is inevitable and uh, fighting is is futile. We just have to adjust to new things so that we can be better at our jobs. Uh, there were some journalists that would say that they would never type on the computer, and uh, but we, act we now have such journalists hosting interview, holding interviews uh, on Zoom and other platforms. So this is why it's important that we should always be open-minded in our careers and as individuals to embracing change because whether we like it or not, change is inevitable. So I really want to thank you uh, for this opportunity and um, yeah, whatever questions you have, I'm available to provide more insight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, that was uh... That was very interesting to, to hear your your, your unique uh, insight and experiences there, and I, I'm struck by sort of the the um, uh, something that's been sort of a, a note going through your entire presentation. That's this idea of the the global community of journalists covering this big story, uh, and it is truly a global story, one that we haven't seen before in, in the same way. The story that every journalist in covering it in every country around the world are facing some of the same challenges. Um, do, you, do you see that in, in your, your outreach work with journalists from other countries, that this is, uh, this is sort of a, a new experience for us, that we're all sharing the same, the same news story? Oh, yes. Um, it's, uh, it's something that I think is one of the few things that unites everybody. 
when you see, um, for instance, look at Delta variant, uh, it's something that quickly spread across the world and uh, journalists, as scientists were grappling to explain it, journalists were also struggling uh, to report it. And I think uh, understanding how vaccines work is actually one of the key exposures, key major things that uh, COVID-19 has shown that it's not just developing countries that struggle to understand how vaccines work. We had journalists that were initially reporting that once you've gotten the vaccine, you will never have the disease. And uh, when we started having diseases among those that got the vaccine, we actually saw science, uh, journalists that did not, that were supposed to even inform the public, uh, but did not even understand that that is not how uh, vaccines uh, work. So it's something that, but it's not just peculiar to developing countries, it's something that actually uh, we were united in the ignorance and uh, lack of adequate information about many aspects of the pandemic. Yeah, so it's a, uni it's a unifying challenge. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, you're not able to be uh, here with us and we have to do this uh, through video, but I guess it showcases that it is possible to, to have conversations like these in a way that we didn't think would be natural just a couple of years ago. Uh, have, you, have you found the same that in, in your communication with journalists around the world that the threshold for, for getting in touch, for sharing experiences might be uh, lower now, that, it, uh, that one positive side effect of, the, of this uh, pandemic might be that uh, it's become easier to communicate in a way? Oh, yes. Uh, it's, uh, that's something that I think, especially those that know how to use technology, journalists that uh, were very, very good with using uh, tech tools, would really find uh, the COVID-19 experience uh, quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. And uh, it's also be it has also become much more easier to communicate because those that were previously hostile to these channels of communication, knowing that social distance is actually in their best interest, uh, it has become much more easier to convince them. And in my interactions with journalists, uh, I think uh, journalists are also making use of these uh, channels. But in the, uh, on the other, uh, the other side of it is that uh, some fatigue is already setting in. Uh, some have already gotten so used to using these sectors and these new channels of communication that they now desire that in-person uh, physical interaction with others. So, yeah, it's a misfeeling. Mm. Yeah, you, you mentioned the fatigue earlier as well. Uh, when, you, when you come across uh, fellow journalists uh, who, who are tired of this whole thing and this, they just want to get back to normal, uh, what kind of advice do you give them? Uh, how, how do you help them out of that funk? Well, um, what I usually tell them is um, don't expect things to go back to normal. Uh, we've already opened this box. Uh, we are not putting everything back in. The best you can do for yourself uh, is to maximize the change and look at how you can make it work for you. Um, if you are bored, um, take a stroll, wear your face mask, go out and uh, come back continue your job, um, talk to more people, uh, get better at doing these things, uh, expand your skills, uh, acquire more knowledge. The time, uh, because with uh, working, uh, using this medium, you have, more, you have more time to yourself, more tools to get your work much easier. So you can get on the job training, uh, acquire new skills, uh, uh, try your hands on new things that will make, just improve what you are doing because Fighting change is the worst thing you can ever do to yourself. The best you can do to yourself is to make it work uh, for you. And, uh, and one thing that is also common is uh, sometimes a lack of communication. You should find someone to also talk to. Don't just use uh, a virtual communication for official, uh, for official purposes. You can have uh, virtual calls with friends, with colleagues, so that at least you know that you can also still have fun and relax um, via these various channels. So that is the kind of advice I've been giving to colleagues. And on that note, uh, on that positive and optimistic note, uh, Paul Adepoju, thank you so much for, for, uh, for teaching us and for, for participating in this, uh, in this masterclass. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, so good luck to everybody. Have a Ending on an optimistic note, uh, Paul Adepujo from Nigeria. 
take on your mask if you have to and just continue, even if you're tired to report on the pandemic. It's important for investigating journalists. And also, we are still in Africa. Another brave guy you have interviewed. Absolutely. Uh, and while uh, Paul was talking a bit about what unites us as journalists as some of the common obstacles we've been facing on a global level, uh, our next uh, presenter will be talking more about some specific uh, challenges and issues in the region of, of Western Africa, where the, the people are, are French speaking in Francophone Africa. And to talk about this, we, we have invited uh, Kosi Balao. He's the president of the African Science Journalists Network. And I asked him uh, specifically to talk about those issues that they have in Francophone Africa. So please uh, take a look. Kosi Balao, welcome to this uh, pandemic uh, masterclass. We're excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor. So you'll be uh, talking to us about some of the uh, challenges and, uh, and um, experiences from Francophone Africa. Uh, so please uh, go ahead. The stage is all yours. Hi, everyone. I'm Kosi Balao, and I'm a science journalist and community manager of the International Center for Journalists Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum in French. I'm also the founder of the Confidential Report online newspaper based here in Togo, and also the president of the Francophone African Science Journalist Network. I'm so very pleased to participate in the international uh, masterclass on COVID journalism and hold this presentation about how the pandemic affected Francophone Africa. So my presentation will focus on the impact of the coronavirus crisis on francophone journalism, how they struggle to cope with the virus, how their working conditions have been affected, how they overcome the challenge, and what other journalists can learn from their experience. The pandemic affected francophone journalists in various ways, and here is what to note to know. For francophone journalists, the pandemic was new and so confusion. So many things were unclear for them. So many things were news when the pandemic emerged. And there is no much information about the virus, its origin, why some people are sick and other, others not. There was so many comprehension and then so many questions from the public. And journalists found themselves in the duty to report on something they don't understand. So this was the biggest challenge for Francophone reporters, and I'm sure it was the same thing for journalists from all over the world. The second thing was that journalists were not prepared for the coronavirus pandemic. In Africa, journalists were not prepared to face the crisis, and I'm convinced, like I said, it's true for journalists uh, from all over the world, because the pandemic hit at the very moment where newsrooms are having uh, difficult issues, they need to reinvent their business model, and even their advertising revenue have been declined. The audience was going down, and also the trust in news was not well. So uh, it, the situation was dramatic for journalists, and many of them have lost their job in Africa. And I know most of friends who are, who are still actually uh, are at their at home, in at home because uh, their major house you know, shut down, they ran, they ran dead on water. And it has been very complicated for them to work under the global health crisis reporting, the global health crisis. And because they also the pandemic was unpredictable. Uh, the, the, the third issue was fake news or uh, disinfodemic. It was not sufficient Fake news appeared to be the second pandemic. There was so much fake information circulating on social media uh, about the coronavirus. Uh, they were not based on scientific evidence. So some of them are even hilarious. But they inundated social media in Francophone Africa. And a hard, a hard number of those fake news are circulating via uh, Facebook and WhatsApp from Francophone region. And journalists have to debunk them to check every information, to make sure that they are accurate in order to give information that can save lives. Because what we have learned during this COVID-19 pandemic is that good information can save life. 
So it was um, the duty of journalists to give good information for people who are in need of um, response for what is going on. And in Africa, uh, we have seen so many projects uh, launched by journalists to debunk uh, uh, the, 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 the pandemic uh, fake news. In Togo, for example, journalists have learned to go check, uh, and every day they are publishing news about uh, what is true and what is not. And uh, the, sec the, the four issues, uh, the four challenges were the unavailability of scientific themselves. But, you know, uh, journalists, they need to interview people. They need to inter interview science. They need to give uh, a voice to a uh, top health expert, not every expert, but expert that, you know, are qualified and that can give accurate information. But because they need to refer to someone who can assess or who can explain questions being asked by the public, it was difficult for them to find those experts during the coronavirus pandemic. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why uh, we launched the Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum that um, a manager up to help to connect journalists with scientists. So it is a place where journalists can get access to scientists and where they can ask them questions and where they can, you know, get response for their reporting on this virus. And uh, another issue was the lack of training. Not everyone is a science journalist, no. Mm -mm. Not everyone is a science journalist. But what we have seen during the pandemic in Africa region is that journalists who have no training in science, who have no training in health issues, Journalists who have never covered science, journalists who do not know the difference between research studies uh, published in peer review or in preprint. So all of them have become science experts. And you know, the question is, how do you report on science uh, when you don't understand science, when uh, you don't know uh, how to explain it? So that was also one of the biggest challenges for francophone journalists, because the COVID-19 is a science issue. So, and that was amount, you know, the problem that uh, journalists um, encounter. And you know, there, there's something I want to say also is that um, you, you do not, you don't write a scientific article at the same way you write an article on sport, uh, economic, or politics. You know, you can't write a good scientific article if you don't follow scientific method. So, and if you are not also uh, using the right tool. And the pandemic has shown for Africa the importance of science journalism. So, and I think journalists need to get trained on how to better cover science topics. Another issue was a linguistic barrier. Uh, especially francophone journalists face linguistic barrier during the COVID-19 pandemic. Most of the resources available, including uh, research, uh, papers, uh, what as report, most of them were available in English. And this was a hard challenge for journalists who do not speak English and who cannot read it. So they don't have access to uh, those documents because of language barrier. And they may need to translate it, or they may need to pay someone to translate the you know those documents for them, but they don't have money to do that. So it was like it was a big challenge for for journalists, you know, because working in this condition is really difficult. I'm not saying uh, that there is no French language research studies, no, but I'm saying there are fewer compared to those available in England, and this is not a good news for for for, for journalists. Also. Uh, another problem also was uh, the, the, the salary cap. So the pandemic affected uh, the French media industry uh, so severely. I, I was talking about it when I started. Some news rooms have been closed, some run underwater. I was working with um, a science magazine before the pandemic started. And when, the, when I sent my, a pitch during the pandemic, they told me that Look, Kossi, do not have money because of the pandemic, and we cannot continue this collaboration with you. So I'm one of the examples in Francophone Africa on how uh, the pandemic affect, affected journalists. And so many journalists have lost their job. Some have to stay at home. 
uh, and it's really difficult to provide food at home when you are not working anymore. And this, this situation lead to something that, that we call sweat, burnout, or mental uh, health issue, you know, because you are at home, you are not working anymore. And another situation or another problem was the uh, internet. It happened to me when I was, um, I've recorded more, uh, I've, I have host, host, hosted, uh, organized more than 60 webinar. So, and sometimes during the webinar, you may, you may see that your internet is, is gone and you have to, to, to check out, to, to find a way to be back online. So how journalists can work at home when they do not have access to internet, when they do not have a good material or good, you know, even laptop or cell phone to work. So it is, it is, it is, it is really, 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 really difficult. And uh, my last, the last challenge can be uh, mental health issues as I talk about it. It was part of what is going, what we are going to talk about. Uh, at FJ, we have designed a program to help journalists to manage stress and to encourage them to to, be, to 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 support them. You know, because working in this condition, going out to interview someone when you yourself you are not in a good condition, you are not um, you are not well in your mental. So I don't think you are going to to, to do a good job. So yeah. Uh, we can see that it is clear that the pandemic has impacted journalists from all over the world, not only in Francophone Africa. I think the situation was merely the same as for all the journalists. So yeah, that's what I can talk about, what happened to journalists. And I, I also want to say that in the Global Health Quality Reporting Forum, for example, we have launched uh, a competition for journalists to help, to help them you know, benefit for some to encourage those who are working in, in these hard conditions. And we, I think it was a success because so many journalists, you know, uh, we have seen so many candidates for this competition and we give prize for journalists who have done a, a good job. Thank you so much, Kosi. And I think you're absolutely right that, that many of these points that you've listed up are, are universal and uh, are applicable to journalists all over the world. Uh, that was a very information-packed uh, session, and uh, I'm so glad you could take the time to, to provide that for us. Uh, thank you so much, Kosi Balao in, in Togo. Thank you so much, Christopher. See you. And it has been an information-packed day. Uh, we are ending this international masterclass where it all started, in China. We're going to, uh, to Wuhan at the beginning of uh, 2020. And uh, it seems like a very long time ago now. Uh, but uh, uh, one person who managed to get inside that city, Wuhan, that was closed off and locked down for the rest of the world was Nanfu Wang. Uh, she is an American Chinese uh, journalist. She's uh, produced uh, some really, really tremendous uh, documentaries. Two of them have been nominated for Academy Awards before. And uh, this one, uh, I, I don't think I can recommend it highly enough. It's on HBO. It's called In the Same Breath, where she not only talks about how the pandemic started in, in Wuhan, China, and then developed uh, uh, into what we have known as, as a pandemic later, but she also compares how the Chinese government re responded to the pandemic, uh, and she compares that to how the, the US government responded to the pandemic when it arrived on US shores a couple of months later. And the similarities are striking, as you will see if you, if you take a look at that documentary. So uh, I spoke to Nan Fu Wang about uh, her documentary and about uh, especially how the Chinese government responded to the pandemic. And before we see that, uh, let's take a look at the trailer for, for her documentary in the same breath. Each year in January, I return to my home in China. This was the last moment I can remember when life still felt normal. Then, in an instant, everything changed. 
hospitals were overwhelmed. 最多的时候，我们记得刚刚封城那一天，一天电话量就一万一万四五的样子。那好多病人全部送到那儿了。The official news report said that everything was under control. 没有发现明显的人传人的证据，并未发现明显的人传人现象。But people were dying on the streets. The risk remains low. Remains low. There's very little threat here. The media was staging interviews with doctors and nurses. I started asking questions. How are we preparing for this? I was accused of causing hysteria and spreading rumors. I knew immediately something was wrong. We didn't know what to do. The moment you open your mouth, you conceivably could become a target. When the government is telling us where to look, they're also telling us where not to look. Hospitals are warning them not to talk to the media. It started out as a medical crisis. It has become a test of our form of government. This is the reflection of a broken system that was already in the verge of death. It's hard to picture how all of this might end. But I can clearly imagine how this could have begun differently. We have to be united to fight this. Nanfu Wang, welcome to this uh, pandemic masterclass. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. I mean, uh, this uh, documentary, In the Same Breath, it's available on HBO in Norway and I'm sure in every other country. And it's, uh, it's really something I would recommend everyone to see because it's, uh, I think you've done such a brilliant job of capturing what this pandemic looked like inside of China in a time where the Chinese government was trying its best to, to keep that under lid and to, to uh, avoid any mention of the negative consequences of, of, the, of this virus. So, so congratulations on, on a job very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so so you, you are uh, a Chinese national yourself. You've lived in the U.S. for, was it nine, nine years? Um, and you were in China when this pandemic began. Uh, how did you hear about it the first time? Um, it's really hard to remember exactly the first day and when and where, but um, I remember for sure it was social media. And um, it was uh, long before the government announced the virus was contagious or um, had, uh, had human to human transmission and or the Wuhan um, lockdown happened. So it was, I think, maybe weeks uh, before I started reading on um, social media about this, um, but I think just like everybody else, I felt this is strange. Um, there's uh, people talking about it, and then there is a government um, immediately stop the rumor. So it's really hard to know what exactly was going on, rather than something was going on. And I was in China all the way until January 23rd, which was the day the lockdown was announced. And I was visiting my, my family. My family lives about two, 300 miles, um, kilometers away from Wuhan. Um, I had left my son who was um, about three years old with my mom and I came back to the US to work um, when the lockdown happened. So that was, um, what initially I think struck me mostly because I was worried about my family's safety, my kids' safety. Um, I hadn't at the time thought about making a documentary, but mainly as, as, as a mother, as a daughter, I was trying to figure out how severe the virus was, um, how much information I could get, whether the government, what they were hiding and to what was the reality. And that was all my intention in the initial weeks, trying to find out. Because hmm. yeah. you, you, for sure you couldn't find it uh, while watching state media. And there's a, there's a, a, a nice juxtaposition in, in, the, uh, in the beginning of your movie where you're showing Xi Jinping celebrating Chinese New Year. 
and uh, then the next shot you're showing what was happening on social media. Uh, what were the images that people were sharing uh, at that time in, in sort of late January, mid to late January? Um, it, so all of those, even she, so, Xi Jinping celebrating the Chinese New Year, the Lunar Chinese New Year. Um, the footage was on January twenty third. So you have Wuhan being locked down and the entire country freaking out. But then you have thousands of people gathering in the one, in one big hall where Xi Jinping is um, giving a speech, and that was on the news. And but at the time I didn't watch the CCTV news. It was really later when I tried to examine at which point the government knew what and what they were doing, and then reviewing all the news footage, speeches, newspaper. Um, from November, December, January, and looking at, uh, you know, that's the record. In China, it's really difficult to get official documents um, from the government and what is out there, what they put out themselves, the newspaper, the TV, is the document. So in this case, it's, it was actually really useful to know what they knew and what they were doing because you can trace back to uh, all these months and realizing, okay, they, there were self-contradiction, there were um, cover-up, there were irony in there. Like, and that was one example. There was January 23rd, um, you look side by side what's happening in Wuhan and what's happening in Beijing. And there was January 1st, you look at the, you know, the punishment of the eight uh, people, uh, later all turned out to be doctors, spreading rumor. And there was also January 1st, the grandest speech Xi Jinping gave to the country. Um, so it is looking at those, compelling all the different time, um, what was happening on the state level and what was happening on, on the civil society level. And then you see the discrepancy and that was shocking to me. And I think um, that was one of the reasons that motivated me to, to make this documentary. Hmm. And obviously, you couldn't travel to Wuhan yourself to uh, to film this, so you you decided to contact some local filmmakers to to uh, to get the footage you needed. How did you work to to get a hold of them and to convince them to to do, to do that job for you? It was definitely a process. Um, the quarantine in Wuhan, I think, was one of the most restrict one, as most strict um, quarantine in the world. Um, both because it was one of the first places and also because the Chinese government was really intentional to seal the, the, the city and eventually the province, not only like in the physical, uh, literal um, sense, but also metaphorically that they don't allow information to come out or reporters are like vet it as through a very strict process to go in there. So it's not only quarantine the virus, but also quarantine the information. Um, so the world knew very limited um, what was going on and what they knew is what the Chinese government allowed the world to know. Um, so trying to find um, cinematographers, videographers, journalists inside of Wuhan was challenging at the beginning because um, I have made films about China that was political and critical. So it was hard for me to publicly announcing, hey, I can post a job, you know, um, post or anything, because I think as, as soon as I do that, um, the project would be shut down. So we really, me and um, one of our producers, Zhang Lianzhang, my um, producing partner and friend, um, who is also a Chinese citizen, we immediately reached out to people we trusted, um, whether it's inside Hubei province um, or outside, and just asking who do we know um, lives in Wuhan at the time and who can help film for us. And this is all like, you know, we communicated through Signal, Telegram, and trying to keep it low key, but at the same time, reach as many people as possible. And um, initially there were a couple of people um, we got a hold of, um, and then we started asking them to film, but um, they could, they have only ex had access on the streets of the day. In, in Wuhan, there were a different level of access. You could go out of your apartment to your house, 
that you need a certain permit to do that. And in order to go to restricted places like hospital or you know any other places that the government considers sensitive, that's another level of permit. So initially we got someone who could go out to the street. And then as we keep, kept filming, we kept reaching out and I think within days, um, we found a few people who had access to the hospital and um, the ambulance teams. Um, a, and it was a conversation. Um, those people I didn't have a relationship with before and we had to explain what, why we are doing things. We wanted to document the history. And in China, the Chinese government did a very good job convincing the public that any media from um, foreign countries um, are hostile, that they are acting out of the, um, um, I think the intention of sub subtouching the Chinese government and uh, they, were, they were seen as imperialist media. So it's extremely difficult to introduce um, if you are based in the US or anywhere outside of China, people immediately became suspicious. Why are you doing this? So I think myself always saying that um, I grew up in China and I'm a Chinese citizen and um, my goal is really to document the history as we are witnessing it. That would be my starting point to convince um, people. And then of course, uh, different people eventually were, I think, willing to do it for different reasons. Some really because what they saw and they felt a sense of outrage or sad sadness that made them wanted to do something. Um, some other people simply because they felt, um, well, sure, if, I, if you want me to help with you, I, I would charge three times uh, more of the rate, normal rate that I would film. And they just uh, simply wanted to take a risk um, because they wanted to make money. And we had those, um, and for different reasons, all of them, eventually we have a conversation and ask them, do you want to remain anonymous or do you want to be credited with your real name? And they all um, chose, like I think most of them chose anonymous and some of them did um, put their names out because they were brave enough and um, they were okay to be a part of this, yeah. Hmm. I, I think it's it's so fascinating to see the the footage that they were able to to capture. Uh, you have this there's a heartbreaking moment of a father visiting his son who's who's struggling for, for breath. You have the the healthcare workers who are exhausted and still trying to save save lives uh, and the frustration that many are, are feeling. Um, and at the same time, you have this, uh, this strange moment when state TV comes to to make a propaganda video from the hospital, and you have your uh, film crew there filming them coming in and giving instructions to the healthcare team what to say and how to behave. Um, it seems like they were trying to control this whole thing as if it was a propaganda film. Yes, I think controlling the narrative probably was more important on the agenda of the government than controlling the virus. Um, and to me, making this film from very early on, from January and February last year, it was clear to me it was not about, it's not a film about COVID or about the virus. It's really a political film about censorship and propaganda and how the government was using its power to preserve its own image and pri prioritize preserving power over people's health and safety. Um, that was always clear and then I think um, COVID was just one example of in a crisis time how the government behaved um, and this film showed that. Um, the level of censorship and the propaganda was um, the most extreme that I've ever seen, um, I mean, in, in my career of making films about China, whether it's about the one child policy or about um, female activists or human rights lawyers. And this one I felt we witnessed how the history was being written in real time. And um, um, the propaganda machine was activated from the very first minute, I think, when, when the government detected or learned that there was a, a coronavirus. Um, and it was so effective to this point that I think um, we are at the second year of the pandemic, but I think very few people in China still held on to memories of the initial outbreak. Um, 
their memories almost have been affected and rewritten because of the in extensive propaganda, whether it's news, TV shows, or、um, scripted shows and movies. It's been highly controlled that those narratives about heroism, about the efficiency of the Chinese government's response,、um, have been replacing people's true memories of how the events、uh, um, unfolded,、um, and that was very shocking to me. I grew up in China, and I feel like I look back to to see what are the historical events that I. Personal experience as a child, or I have an experience about read in historical books, and how it was exactly the same tactic, the same strategy. Whether it's the Chinese,、um, the Communist Party liberated、uh, the country, or you know the Cultural Revolution, all the things how the history was not fabricated but highly selected and.、Um, Uh, to favor the government, and that's just true in everywhere in the world.、Um, but this one is I witnessed the entire process. Yeah.、Mm. Uh, and you mentioned the, the the eight people who were arrested on, or that it was announced that they were arrested on January first.、Uh, uh, they were doctors, as you said, and one of them was Li Wenliang, who is probably the most famous of of、uh, the healthcare workers、uh, in Wuhan at this time. Now he he managed to get this story out, and he 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 was. A very brave man to tell the story as he saw it,、uh, and then he, he perished himself from from the virus. And I, I remember this period very well, covering it from from Oslo、uh, and trying to figure out what was happening in Wuhan, reading、uh, his his、uh, stories about、uh, what he had discovered or seen.、Uh, and there was an outrage when he died、uh, all over China. People were furious, and there was this. Call for more information and uh, and uh, getting rid of this propaganda system that told uh, uh, an untrue story. And I remember that that sort of around the middle of、uh, February being a, a, a time when a lot of people thought, well, maybe things are changing in China now. But that thought has completely disappeared.、Uh, so、did they? Well, there seems to have been a massive propaganda victory that even after that sort of time of crisis in the middle of February, when people were. Loudly demanding change, they still now seem to be stronger than ever. Exactly. In January and early February, Li Wenliang passed away on February sixth, if I remember correctly.、Um, in late January and early February, I thought if a lot of people were going to wake up and were going to protest and demand、uh, more freedom and transparency, that would be the time. And of course,、uh, by April,、um, it. it I knew that it's never going to happen,、um, and、um, uh, in around February sixth,、um, when people even protested, whether it's online or in person, about Lin Wenliang, and、uh, he became this individual hero, which has nothing wrong, which was completely、uh, fine with it, and whenever the Chinese government handle issues,、uh, events like this, and this is one martyr that was. Uh, elect, you know, people public scene.、Um, their strategy is always then admitting it and、uh, go along with it and celebrating and uh, uh, condoning the local offices. So then the Chinese government and the central government in Beijing would say, yes, we all、uh, felt sad and、um, we condemn what happened to Li Wen Li Wenliang. And we punished the local police officers who punished Li Wenliang, and to ignore or I think intentionally mislead or hide the fact that all of those orders were from the central government. And if you do take a look at、um, the statements on January first from all the different channels of whether it's CCTV or local TV station, the punishment it was so obvious came in, it came from the central government. But when Li Wenliang Became this idol and then this hero in everybody's mind.、Uh, that's when the central government、um, tried to、um, evade the criticism by putting the responsibility in local governments. And they could have fired、um, a few officials in Hubei Province in Wuhan, and、um, then everybody thought, "Yeah, now they are taking measures."、Mm. 
But does that mean that the anger disappeared from, from the public, or, or did the government just manage to, to shut it down and censor all of the negative comments? Both. Both. Um, when when the, um, the head of the province, Hubei province, um, uh, stepped down from the position, when several of the officials stepped down, people, of course, like had a sense of hope and thinking the government is taking measures and... Um, things are going to change for the better. And then at the same time, there is a strong, powerful propaganda activated um, and every single day, 24 hour, uh, seven days, people are being exposed to the narrative that the government is reacting as fast as it could be. And this is a natural disaster that no one could have done better. Um, no country could have done better. And of course, um, we talk about America, which um, the failure of the U.S.'s response served perfectly as one of the propaganda tools in China, uh, because uh, ever since the outbreak started in the U.S., uh, all the propaganda shifted in China. Um, it became, look at what the U.S. has been done and compelling to the U.S. We've done an excellent job. And then I think um, it... Um, it resulted in a sense of a strong sense of nationalism in people that um, we haven't seen in in years. Uh, a, a sense mm. of pr pride and nationalism. Yeah. Hmm. And we see that even in some of the, the, the grieving family members that you've interviewed in, 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 the, in the film. And we see, we, we see them going through the grieving process early in the film, and then towards the end, they're thanking the Communist Party for the way they handled the crisis. Uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable moment. Yeah, and it's not uncommon. Um, oh, I remember I first, um, I first was struck by that sentiment of um, still praising the government when I was making One Child Nation, the film about the one child policy. Um, so many parents who experienced the loss of their kids uh, in the end always said, we thank um, the government, what they did. They saved us from, you know, from hunger, from um, anything. And then, so this time um, it was a little surprising, but it was also expected because I think every one of us, if we had never left China or had never had the experience of being exposed to information other than state-controlled um, education and media, um, in the end, we always, that's like the, I think the guiding philosophy that the um, or world view, the value system that every one of us since we were born were taught that everything we own, that we have, even our lives, um, we attribute it to the, to the Communist Party. Um, and mm -hmm. therefore, you know, we should be grateful. Um, and it's heartbreaking to see that, uh, but it was not so surprising, it's understandable. Um, there was no rationale that makes sense, <laughs> yeah, to arrive at that conclusion, but that's always what people um, go to at the end. Yeah, and I guess it goes to show that state propaganda, when it's done uh, at this massive scale, it's uh, it's clearly very very effective. But it, but you say, uh, and I wrote this down because I, I liked it so much. You say in the, in the movie when when the government tells you where to look, uh, they're also telling you where not to look. Yeah. And while the government was presenting all these happy stories from Wuhan, you sent your your crew out to to talk to families who were grieving and who were angry while while the lockdown was going on. Uh, what did that look like compared to to the official uh, government portrayal? Yeah, so um, I think the montage that you were mentioning was um, so one thing. The major motivation um, for me to start making this film was um, February eighth, seventh, and eighth. Um, there was a huge uh, web forum. If people were paying attention, that people in Wuhan in China were desperate for help. Um, their, their family members themselves were dying without access to the heart, to medication, to anything. So they posted all their information on this forum and with real ID and phone number, address and photos. And it was a, it was a gesture of desperation to me. So um, 
my team, uh, it was like massive, a thousand people. And we spent months, the following weeks and the months calling them one after another. And many of them, when we called the person who posted or the subject of the post had already passed away, but we would spend hours talking to uh, the, firm and the family member, you know, and then learned the, the story of how um, there was no access to hospital. And of course, then on TV, you are seeing um, the forces, the government, how quickly they sent doctors and um, hospitals were built, which was not untrue, but still, there they, it was never reported how many people died at their home um, on the streets. Um, so I juxtaposed those two sequences. And um, I think it is always true when the government is uh, bombarding people with, uh, here are the stories. We um, as citizens should always like, what is, what is the other side of the story? What is left out, especially in a country um, like China? Um, but I think it's not always the way how people think. Um, it's not always like everyone would would question. And that was one of my hope with this film. I do hope if people get to see it, if people in China get to see it, um, if they can start asking questions, uh, even in the, I mean, subconscious level, if it's a one step further, closer for them to have the critical consciousness, with, which I think is lacking, um, in China, um, then I would feel like the film did its job in a way. Hmm. Well, I guess uh, if if you want to see it in China, then you have to go through uh, a lot of uh, a lot of hurdles uh, and use use a VPN, I guess. Yeah. But um, I, I was thinking also, um, you 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 reveal some uh, some tidbits about the, the real nature of of, uh, of the pandemic in Wuhan, uh, and you start that sequence off by by talking about the sensitivity of people going to collect the ashes of people they love who, who have died. Now, why was going to collect the ashes of uh, of deceased relatives, why was that a sensitive issue? That was a good question that I asked me for a long time because um, the first time that I sent a cinematographer to go film at the cemetery and, you know, the funeral homes, and not only, like, me did that, but a lot of citizen journalists who try to go there to see, you know, to get a sense of um, how busy they were or how many, you know, bodies were taken, how many cars were going in and out of the funeral homes. And I mean, this is something that is different in China than other countries, at least in the US, where here funeral homes are private and there are many. In China, it's all state owned. So in Wuhan, I believe there are seven or eight, um, and then they are in different districts, but they're all strictly state owned. Um, so citizen journalists reported that when they tried and uh, either they got arrested or they couldn't even get closer to because of the police, um, you know, force um, guarding those places. So the first time that I sent our cinematographer to go there, couldn't even get closer. Um, there were the most amount of po police um, officers than even sometimes at the hospitals. Um, like this is the cinematographer who could go to the hospital, but couldn't even get closer to the funeral homes. And um, we were talking as he was there. And then I asked, could you use your phone? Like, why don't you use the phone? And the moment he took out his phone, of course, like it was taken away and almost got arrested. So it, it surprised me. It's like, why, why? And it's like, what's, what's sensitive about this place? And then of course, later I, when I learned why it was sensitive, it didn't become surprising at all because if you could go into the funeral homes or the cemetery where people are retrieving the ashes. So in China, it's also different that because Wuhan is strictly in lockdown. So any family members who died in the hospital or at home were taken away and the ashes could not be sent, uh, collected by the family until uh, April when the lockdown was lifted. So all of those ashes were stored in the funeral homes and um, the family would, then there would be long lines in April when the quarantine was lifted for people to collect in the ashes. But 
um, the sensitivities, if you could get a, a look at the funeral homes or at the lines, then you would realize how many uh, deaths there were and how much more it was compelling to uh, the 3,000 deaths toll um, the government announced. Hmm. And you get an estimate from, from one worker who is anonymous at, at one of these funeral homes, and he says about ten or 20,000 only at that one funeral yes, home. And, uh, and if there are seven or eight uh, different funeral homes, then I guess uh, anyone can do, can do the math. Yeah, that was the, uh, a funeral hmm. worker, and he, I mean, we, like, we couldn't reveal the identity and had to destroy his voice, but he said um, it was a joke, the number, like everybody in Wuhan knew that was a joke. Hmm. Now, you mentioned citizen journalists, and, and there were quite a few people uh, who were already in Wuhan who came in from other cities. Uh, several of them were arrested. Some of them have been, or one of, has already been convicted. And uh, you, you show another one, uh, Chen uh, uh, Chui Shu, and he, he is still missing. I mean, the, the risk that uh, citizen journalists have been taking in China to, to, to tell the real story. I mean, that, that has obviously taken a lot of courage. Absolutely. And um, I think everybody who's trying to raise their voice um, or ask questions are like risking um, their safety and freedom. And it has become more and more stri uh, strict in the sense the crackdown and any dissent would be, um, would be silenced. So a lot of the citizen journalists, uh, some of them, um, Zhang Zhan is the one who was convicted in December last year. And I had talked to her, filmed with her, and interviewed her um, when she was in Wuhan. And she and everybody around her, everybody who knows her, knew that it was very dangerous. And I had asked her many times, are you sure you were going to do this? Do you know? And she always, she knew this was the result. She knew um, she was ready and she was willing to um, to risk her life and um, um, to, to raise her voice to speak up. And I had a lot of admiration for that. Yeah. And, and how about yourself? I mean, you still have family in China and this is not your first uh, uh, documentary that's been critical of, of the government. Uh, what, what kind of risk are you uh, exposing yourself and your, your family uh, for? Uh, is this uh, something you're afraid of yourself? Absolutely. I think I'm more afraid uh, for my family because they are the ones who are still in China. And every time I make a film, my family got harassed, interrogated. And every, every, every film, um, the inter interrogation and harassment and intimidation became um, more severe and uh, more terrifying and so it is also I think a choice and difficult choice that I make um, what I sometimes feel like I had no choice that um, I don't know if I stop making films or if I don't do it then I'm feeding into um, their aggregation their violence um, to to self-censor in a way. So it is very challenging because then I face the pressure from my own family and and the guilt that I feel for putting them in that position. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's really hmm. hard. Well, I can understand. Um, but the end product, this uh, this movie, in the same breath, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a brilliant piece of journalism. And uh, again, c congratulations. Uh, Nanfu Wang, and thank you so much for, for taking the time to join us in this, uh, in this masterclass. Thank you. It has been so inspiring this day to see our colleagues from all over the world have been able to overcome challenges in their reporting uh, on the COVID-19. Right. Absolutely, Maria. And uh, I think it, it shows when we've seen all these 13 different presentations, it's uh, shown that uh, that we have faced the same pandemic all over the world and we've yeah. uh, had to deal with it in a lot of similar ways. And there, even though there have been challenges, uh, the, the journalism that's been produced 
has been remarkable and at great cost to some of the people we've uh, we've met. So that's been uh, at least I think it's been very very inspirational. The freedom of speech has not been locked in, <laughs> not isolated during this uh, one and a half year. That's true. So on that note, uh, uh, we'd just like to say thank you to all the people who've, uh, who've participated in this, who've been, uh, in uh, who made it possible to, to create. Thank you to the 13 people who held presentations, to the people who've helped produce it. Thank you to, Ru to you, Maria. And to you, Christopher. And on behalf of the Norwegian uh, Association for Investigative Journalists, SCOOP, I think we'll um, end this day. Uh, and uh, we have learned a lot, all of us. See you next time. <laughs>